Time Warner Audiobooks presents A Darkness More Than Night by Michael Connolly Narrated by Richard M. Davidson Chapter 22 Nats was a railroad car-sized bar that was like a lot of Hollywood haunts, favored during daylight hours by hardcore drinkers, during early evening hours by casual hookers and their clientele, and late at night by the black leather and tattoo crowd. It was the kind of place where a person would stand out as a target if he tried to pay for drinks with a gold credit card. McCaleb had stopped at Musso's for dinner, his body clock demanding nourishment before a complete shutdown occurred, and didn't get to Nats until after ten. While eating his chicken pot pie, he'd wondered whether going to the bar to ask questions about gun was even worth the time. The tip had come from the suspect. Would the suspect knowingly point the investigator in a true direction? It seemed not. But McCaleb factored in Bosch's drinking, and his being unaware of McCaleb's true mission during the visit to the house on the hill. The tip might very well be valid, and he decided he should leave no part of the investigation unexamined. As he walked in, it took him a few seconds to adjust to the dim reddish lighting. When the room became clear, he saw it was half empty. It was the time between the early evening crowd and the late night group. Two women, one black, one white, sitting at one end of the bar that ran along the left side of the room, sized him up, and McCaleb could see cop register in their eyes at the same moment hookers registered in his. It secretly pleased him that he still had the look. He walked by them and further into the lounge. The booths lining the right side of the room were mostly full. No one in these bothered to give him a glance. He stepped up to the bar between two empty stools and signaled one of the bartenders. An old Bob Seeger song, Night Moves, was blaring from a jukebox in the back. The bartender leaned over the bar so she could get McCaleb's order. She was wearing a buttoned black vest with no shirt underneath. She had long straight black hair and a thin gold hoop pierced her left eyebrow. What can I get you? Some information. McCaleb slid a driver's license picture of Edward Gunn across the counter. It was a three-by-five blow-up that had been in the files Winston had given him. The bartender looked at it for a moment and then back up at McCaleb. What about him? He's dead. How do you know that? She shrugged her shoulders. I don't know. Word just got around, I guess. You a cop? McCaleb nodded, lowered his voice so the music would cover it, and said, Something like that. The bartender leaned further over the bar top so she could hear him. This position opened the top of her vest, exposing most of her small but round breasts. There was a tattoo of a heart wrapped in barbed wire on the left side. It looked like a bruise on a pear, not very appetizing. McCaleb looked away. Edward Gunn, he said. He was a regular, right? He came in a lot. McCaleb nodded. Her acknowledgement confirmed Bosch's tip. You work New Year's Eve? She nodded. You know if he came in that night? She shook her head. I can't remember. A lot of people were in here New Year's Eve. We had a party. I don't know if he was here or not. It wouldn't surprise me, though. People came and went. The Caleb nodded toward the other bartender, a Latino who also wore a black vest with no shirt beneath. What about him? Think he'd remember? No. "'Cause he only started last week. I'm breaking him in.' A thin smile played on her face. McCaleb ignored it. Twisting the Night Away began playing, the Rod Stewart version. "'How well did you know Gunn?' She let out a short burst of laughter. "'Honey, this is the kind of place where people don't exactly like to let on who they are or what they are. How well did I know him?' I knew him, okay? Like I said, he came in. But I didn't even know his name until he was dead and people started talking about him. 
Somebody said Eddie Gunn got himself killed, and I said, who the fuck is Eddie Gunn? They had to describe him. The whiskey rocks who always had the paint in his hair. Then I knew who Eddie Gunn was. McCaleb nodded. He reached inside his coat pocket and brought out a folded piece of newspaper. He slid it across the bar top. She leaned down to look, showing another view of her breasts. McCaleb thought it was intentional. That's the cop, the one from the trial, right? McCaleb didn't answer the question. The newspaper had been folded to a photo of Harry Bosch that had run that morning in the Los Angeles Times as an advance on the testimony expected to begin in the story trial. It was a candid shot of Bosch standing outside the courtroom door. He probably didn't even know it had been taken. You seen him in here? Yeah, he comes in. Why are you asking about him? But Caleb felt a charge go up the back of his neck. When does he come in? I don't know. From time to time. I wouldn't call him a regular, but he'd come in, and he wouldn't stay long. A one-timer. One drink and out. He's... She pointed a finger up and cocked her head to the side as she rifled through her interior files. She then slashed her finger down as if making a notch. Got it. Bottled beer. Ask for Anchor Steam every time because he always forgets we don't carry it. Too expensive. We'd never sell it. He then settles for the old 33. McCaleb was about to ask what that was when she answered his unspoken question. Rolling Rock. He nodded. Was he in here New Year's Eve? She shook her head. Same answer. I don't remember. Too many people, too many drinks, too many days since then. McCaleb nodded and pulled the newspaper back across the bar and put it in his pocket. He in some kind of trouble, that cop? McCaleb shook his head. One of the women at the end of the bar tapped the corner of her empty glass on the bar top and called to the bartender. Hey, Miranda, you got paying customers over here. The bartender looked around for her partner. He was gone, apparently in the back room or the bathroom. Gotta go to work, she said. McCaleb watched her go to the end of the bar and make two fresh vodka rocks for the hookers. During a lull in the music, he overheard one of them tell her to stop talking to the cops so he would leave. As Miranda headed back toward McCaleb's position, one of the hookers called after her. And stop giving him the freebie or he'll never leave. McCaleb acted like he didn't hear it. Miranda exhaled like she was tired when she got to him. I don't know where Javier went. I can't be standing here talking to you all night. Let me ask you one thing, he said. You ever remember the cop being in here with Eddie Gunn at the same time, either together or apart? She thought a moment and leaned forward. Maybe it could have happened, but I don't remember. McCaleb nodded. He was pretty sure that was the best he could get out of her. He wondered if he should leave some money on the bar. He'd never been good at that sort of thing when he was an agent. He never knew when it would be appropriate and when it would be insulting. Can I ask you something now? Miranda asked. What? You like what you see? He felt his face immediately begin to color with embarrassment. I mean, you were looking enough. I just thought I'd ask. She glanced over at the hookers and shared a smile. They were all enjoying McCaleb's embarrassment. They're real nice, he said, as he stepped away from the bar, leaving a twenty-dollar bill for her. I'm sure they keep people coming back. Probably kept Eddie Gunn coming in. He headed toward the door, and she called after him, her words hitting him in the back all the way to the door. Then maybe you ought to come back and try him out sometime. Officer! As he went through the door, he heard the hookers whoop and slap hands in a high five. But Caleb sat in the Cherokee in front of Nats and tried to shake off the embarrassment. He concentrated on the information he'd gotten from the bartender. 
Gunn was a regular and may or may not have been in there on the last night of his life. Secondly, she was familiar with Bosch as a customer. He, too, may or may not have been in there on the last night of Gunn's life. The fact that this information indirectly came from Bosch was puzzling. Again, he wondered why Bosch, if he was Gunn's killer, had given him a valid clue to follow. Was it arrogance, a belief that he would never be considered a suspect and therefore not be brought up during the questioning at the bar? Or could there be a deeper psychological motivation? McCaleb knew that many criminals make mistakes that assure their apprehension because subconsciously they do not want to get away with their crimes. The big wheel theory, McCaleb thought. Maybe Bosch was subconsciously making sure the wheel turned for him as well. He opened his cell phone and checked the signal. It was good. He called Jay Winston's home number. He checked his watch while the phone was ringing and thought that it wasn't too late to call. After five rings, she finally picked up. It's me. I've got some stuff. So do I. But I'm still on the phone. Can I call you when I'm done? Yeah. I'll be here. He clicked off and sat in the car waiting and thinking about things. He watched through the windshield as the white hooker from the bar stepped through the door with a man in a baseball cap in tow. They both lit cigarettes and headed down the sidewalk toward a motel called the Skylark. His phone chirped. It was Winston. It's coming together, Terry. I'm a believer. What'd you get? You first. You said you got some stuff. Now you. What I got is minor. Sounds like you hooked something big. Okay. Listen to this. Harry Bosch's mother was a prostitute in Hollywood. She got murdered when he was a little kid, and whoever did it got away with it. How's that for psychological underpinnings, Mr. Profiler? McCaleb didn't answer. The new information was stunning and provided many of the missing pieces in the working theory. He watched the hooker and her customer at the window of the motel office. The man passed cash through and received a key. They went in through a glass door. Gunn kills a prostitute and walks away, Winston said when he didn't respond. Just like what happened with his mother. How'd you find this out? McCaleb finally asked. I made that call we talked about to my friend Kiz. I acted like I was interested in Bosch and asked her if she knew if he was... You know, over his divorce yet? She told me what she knew about him. The stuff about his mother apparently came out a few years ago in a civil trial when Bosch got sued for a wrongful death. The Dollmaker, you remember that one? Yeah, the LAPD refused to call us in on that one. That was also a guy who killed prostitutes. Bosch killed him. He was unarmed. There's a psychology going on here. A goddamn pattern. What happened to Bosch after his mother was killed? Kiz didn't really know. She called him an institutional man. It happened when he was ten or eleven. After that, he grew up in youth halls and foster homes. He went into the service and then the department. The point is, this is the thing we were missing. The thing that turned a no-count case into something Bosch wouldn't let go. McCaleb nodded to himself. And there's more, Winston said. I went through all the accumulated files, extraneous things I didn't put in the murder book. I looked at the autopsy on the woman Gunn killed six years ago. Her name was Frances Weldon, by the way. There was one thing in there that now seems significant in light of what we now know about Bosch. Examination of the uterus and hips showed that at some point she'd had a child. McCaleb shook his head. Bosch wouldn't have known that. He pushed his lieutenant through a window and was on suspension by the time there was an autopsy. True. But he could and probably did look at the case files after he came back. He would have known that Gunn did to some other kid what was done to him. You see, it's all fitting. Eight hours ago, I thought you were grasping at straws. Now it looks to me like you're dead on. It didn't feel all that good to be dead on but he understood Winston's excitement. 
When cases fall together, the excitement can sometimes obscure the reality of the crime. What happened to her kid? he asked. No idea. She probably gave the child up after the birth. That doesn't matter. What matters is what it meant to Bosch. She was right. But McCaleb didn't like the loose end. Going back to your call to Bosch's old partner, is she going to call him and tell him you asked about him? She already did. This is tonight? Yeah. This all just went down. That was that call. Her getting back to me. He passed. He told her he was still holding out hope for his wife coming back. Did she tell him it was you who was interested? She wasn't supposed to, but she probably did. This might mean he knows we're looking at him. That's impossible. How? I was just up there tonight. I was in his house. Then the same night, he gets this call about you. A guy like Harry Bosch, she doesn't believe in coincidences, Jay. Well... When you were up there, how did you handle it? Winston finally asked. Like we said, I wanted more info on Gunn, but sidetracked into talking about him. That's why I was calling you. I got some interesting stuff. Nothing that compares to what you got, but stuff that also fits. But if he got this call about you right after I was there, I don't know. Tell me about your stuff. All little stuff. He's got the photo of the estranged wife prominently displayed in the living room. I was there less than an hour, and the guy downed three beers. So there's the alcohol syndrome, symptomatic of interior pressures. He also spoke of something he called the big wheel. It's part of his belief system. He doesn't see the hand of God in things. He sees the big wheel. What goes around comes around. He said guys like Gunn don't really get away. Something always catches up to them. The wheel. I used some specific phrases to see if I could draw a reaction or disagreement. I called the world outside his door the plague. He didn't disagree. He said he could deal with the plague as long as he got his shots at the carriers. It's all very subtle, Jay, but it's all there. He's got a Bosch print on the wall in the house's hallway. The Garden of Earthly Delights. It's got our owl on it. So, he's named after the guy. If my name was Picasso, I'd have a Picasso print on the wall. I acted like I'd never seen it before and asked him what it meant. All he said was that it was the big wheel turning. That's what it meant to him. Little pieces that fit. There's still work to be done. Well, are you still on it? Or are you going back? For the time being, I'm on it. I'll be staying over tonight, but I have a charter Saturday. I have to go back for that. She didn't say anything. You got anything else? He finally asked. Yeah, I almost forgot. What? The owl from Bird Barrier. It was paid for with a money order from the Postal Service. I got the number from Cameron Riddell and ran a trace on it. It was bought December 22nd at the post office on Wilcox in Hollywood. It's about four blocks from the police station where Bosch worked. He shook his head. The law of physics. What do you mean? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. When you look into the abyss, the abyss looks into you. You know, all the clichés. They're clichés because they're true. You don't go into the darkness without it going into you and taking its peace. Bosch may have gone in too many times. He's lost his way. They were silent for a little while after that and then made plans to meet the following day. As he hung up, he saw the hooker leaving the Skylark by herself and heading back up toward Nat's. She was wearing a denim jacket, which she pulled tight around her against the cool night air. She adjusted her wig as she walked toward the bar where she would seek another customer. Watching her and thinking about Bosch, McCaleb was reminded of all he had and how lucky in life he'd been. He was reminded that luck could be a fleeting thing. It had to be earned and then guarded with everything you had. He knew he wasn't doing that now. He was leaving things unguarded while he went into the dark. Chapter 23 
Trial resumed 25 minutes after the scheduled 9 o'clock start because of the prosecution's unsuccessful bid to seek both sanctions against the defense for witness intimidation and a delay while the statements of Annabelle Crow were fully investigated. Sitting behind his cherrywood desk in chambers, Judge Houghton encouraged the investigation, but said the trial wouldn't be delayed to accommodate it and no sanctions or other penalties would be issued unless evidence corroborating the witness's statements could be found. He warned the prosecutors and Bosch, who had taken part in the closed-door meeting, by recounting his interview with Crow, not to leak word of the witness accusations to the media. Five minutes later, they were convened in the courtroom, and the jurors were brought to their two rows of seats. Bosch returned to the witness stand and was reminded by the judge that he was still under oath. Janice Langweiser went back to the lectern with her legal pad. Now, Detective Bosch, we left off yesterday with your conclusion in regard to the death of Jody Kremens being determined to be a homicide. Is that correct? Yes. And that conclusion was based not only on your investigation, but the investigation and autopsy conducted by the coroner's office as well, correct? Correct. Could you please tell the jurors how the investigation proceeded once you had established the death as a homicide? Bosch turned in his seat so that he was looking directly at the jury box as he spoke. The movement was jarring. He had a pounding headache on the left side of his head that was so intense he wondered if people could actually see his temple throbbing. Well, my two partners, Jerry Edgar and Kisman Ryder, and I began to sit through, I mean, sift through the physical evidence we'd accumulated. We also began conducting extensive interviews with those who knew the victim and were known to have been with her in the last 24 hours of her life. You mentioned physical evidence. Please explain to the jury what physical evidence you had accumulated. Actually, there wasn't a whole lot gathered. There were fingerprints throughout the house that we needed to run down, and there also was a quantity of fiber and hair evidence gathered from on and about the victim's body. Jay Rees and Folks quickly objected before Bosch could continue his answer. Objection to the phrase on or about, as being vague and misleading. Your Honor, Langwasser countered, I think if Mr. Folks gave Detective Bosch a chance to finish the answer to the question, there would be nothing vague or misleading. But interrupting a witness in mid-answer to say the answer is vague or misleading is not appropriate. Overruled, Judge Howden said, before Folks could get in a rejoinder. Let the witness complete his answer, and then we'll see how vague it is. Go ahead, Detective Bosch. Bosch cleared his throat. I was going to say that several samples of pubic hair not... What is several, Your Honor? Folks said. My ongoing objection is to the lack of preciseness this witness is offering the jury. Bosch looked at Langweiser and saw how mad she was getting. Judge, she said, could we please have direction from the court as to when objections can be raised? Defense counsel is seeking to constantly interrupt the witness because he knows we are moving into an area that is particularly devastating to his... Ms. Langweiser, this isn't the time for closing arguments, the judge said, cutting her off. Mr. Folks, unless you are seeing a dire miscarriage of justice, I want objections stated either before a witness speaks or after he has completed at least a sentence. Your Honor, the consequences are dire here. The state is trying to take away my client's life, simply because his moral views are... Mr. Folks, the judge boomed. That goes for you, too, on the closing arguments. Let's continue the testimony, shall we? He turned to Bosch. Detective, continue and try to be a little more precise in your answers. Bosch looked at Langweiser and saw her close her eyes momentarily. The judge's off-handed direction to Bosch had been what folks was going for. A hint to the jurors that there might be vagueness 
maybe even obfuscation in the prosecution's case. Folks had successfully goaded the judge into appearing to agree with his objections. Bosch glanced over at Folks and saw him sitting with arms folded and a satisfied, if not smug, look on his face. Bosch looked back down at the murder book in front of him. Can I refer to my notes? he asked. He was told he could. He opened the binder and turned to the evidence reports. Looking at the medical examiner's evidence collection report, he began again. Prior to autopsy, an evidence collecting brush was passed through the victim's pubic hair. The comb collected eight samples of pubic hair that subsequent laboratory testing showed to have come from someone other than the victim. He looked up at Langweiser. Were those pubic hairs from eight different people? No. The lab tests identified them as coming from the same unknown person. And what did this indicate to you? That the victim likely had sexual relations with someone between the time of her last bathing and her death. Langweiser looked down at her notes. Was there any other hair evidence collected on the victim or at the scene of the crime, detective? Bosch turned a page in the murder book. Yes, a single strand of hair measuring two and one-half inches long was found entangled on the clasp of a gold necklace the victim wore around her neck. The clasp was located at the back of the victim's neck. This, too, was identified during lab analysis as coming from someone other than the victim. Going back for a moment to the pubic hair, were there any other indications or evidence collected from the body or the crime scene indicating the victim had engaged in sexual relations in the time between bathing and her death? No, there wasn't. No semen was collected from the vagina. Is there a conflict between that and the finding of the pubic hair? No conflict. It was simply an indication that a condom could have been used during the sex act. Okay, moving on, detective. Fingerprints. You mentioned fingerprints were found in the house. Please tell us about that area of the investigation. Bosch turned to the fingerprint report in the binder. There were a total of 68 exemplars of fingerprints gathered inside the house where the victim was found. The victim and her roommate accounted for 52 of these. It was determined that the remaining 16 were left by a total of seven people. And who were these people? Bosch read the list of names from the binder. Through questioning from Langweiser, he explained who each person was and how the detectives traced down when and why they had been in the house. They were friends of the roommates as well as family members, a former boyfriend, and a prior date. The prosecution team knew that the defense would attempt to go to town on the prints, using them as red herrings to bait the jury away from the facts of the case. So the testimony moved slowly as Bosch tediously explained the location and origin of each fingerprint found and identified in the house. He ended with testimony about a full set of fingerprints found on the headboard of the bed in which the victim was found. He and Langweiser knew that these were the prints that folks would get the most yardage out of, so Langweiser attempted to minimize the potential damage by having it revealed during her examination of the witness. How far from the victim's body were these prints located? Bosch looked at the report in the binder. 2.3 feet. Exactly where on the headboard? On the outside facing, between the headboard and the wall. Was there a lot of space there? About two inches. How would someone get their fingerprints there? Folks objected, saying it was outside Bosch's realm of expertise to determine how a set of fingerprints got anywhere, but the judge allowed the question. Only two ways I can think of, Bosch answered. 
They got there when the bed was not pushed up to the wall, or the man who left the prince had reached his fingers through the opening in the slats of the headboard and left them while holding on to that particular crossboard. Langweiser introduced a photo taken by a fingerprint technician as an exhibit, and it was shown to the jury. To accomplish the latter explanation you offered, the person would have to be lying in the bed, would he not? It would seem that way. Face down? Yes. Folks stood to object, but the judge sustained it before the lawyer uttered a word. You're going too far afield with suppositions, Miss Langweiser. Move on. Yes, Your Honor. She referred to her pad for a moment. This print on the victim's bed, didn't that make you think the person who left it should be considered a prime suspect? Not initially. It's impossible to tell how long a print has been at a specific location. Plus, we had the additional factor that we knew the victim had not been killed in her bed, but rather taken to the bed after being killed elsewhere. It appeared to us that the location of the print was not a place that would have been touched by the killer when he put the body in the bed. Who did these prints belong to? A man named Alan Weiss who had dated Ms. Cremens on three prior occasions, the most recent date being three weeks before her death. Did you interview Alan Weiss? Yes, I did, along with Detective Edgar. Did he acknowledge ever being in the victim's bed? Yes, he did. He said he slept with her on that last occasion that he saw her, three weeks prior to her death. Did he say he touched the bedboard in the location you have shown us where the fingerprints were located? He said he could have done it, but he did not specifically remember doing it. Did you investigate Alan Weiss's activities on the night of Jody Cremens's death? Yes, we did. He had a solid alibi. And what was that? He told us he was in Hawaii at a real estate seminar. We checked airline and hotel records, as well as with the seminar's producers. We confirmed he was there. Langweiser looked at Judge Houghton and said that it would be a good time to take the morning break. The judge said it was a little early, but granted the request and ordered the jurors back in 15 minutes. Bosch knew she wanted the break now because she was about to move into questions about David's story and wanted them clearly separated from all the other testimony. As he stepped off the witness stand and went back to the prosecution table, Langweiser was flipping through some files. She spoke to him without looking up. What's wrong, Harry? What do you mean? You're not crisp, not like yesterday. Are you nervous about something? No, are you? Yeah, the whole thing. We've got a lot riding on this. I'll be crisper. I'm serious, Harry. So am I, Janice. He then walked away from the prosecution table and out through the courtroom. He decided he would get a cup of coffee at the second-floor cafeteria. But first he stepped into the restroom next to the elevators and went to one of the sinks to splash cold water on his face. He bent fully over the sink, careful not to get water on his suit. He heard a toilet flush, and when he straightened up and looked in the mirror, he saw Rudy Tefero pass behind him and go to the sink furthest away. Bosch bent down again and brought more water up and held it. Its chill felt good against his eyes and eased his headache. What's it like, Rudy? He asked without looking at the other man. What's what like, Harry? You know, doing the devil's bidding. You get any sleep at night? Bosch walked over to the paper towel dispenser and tore off several sheets to dry his hands and face. Tefero came over and tore off a towel and began drying his hands. It's funny, Tefero said. The only time in my life I had trouble sleeping was when I was a cop. I wonder why that was. He balled the towel in his hands and threw it into the wastebasket. He smiled at Bosch and then walked out. Bosch watched him go, still rubbing his hands on the towels.
Chapter 24 Bosch could feel the coffee working in his blood. The second wind was coming. The headache was easing. He was ready. This would be how they planned it, how they had choreographed it. He leaned forward to the microphone and waited for the questions. Detective Bosch, Langweiser said from the lectern, did there come a time when the name David Story came up in your investigation? Yes, almost immediately. We received information from Jane Gilly, who was Jody Cremens' roommate, that on the last night of Jody's life, she had a date with David Story. Did there come a time when you questioned Mr. Story about that last night? Yes, briefly. Why briefly, Detective Bosch? This was a homicide. That was Mr. Story's choosing. We attempted several times to interview him on that Friday that the body was discovered, and the next day as well. He was difficult to locate. Finally, through his attorney, he agreed to be interviewed the next day, which was Sunday. On the condition that we come to him and conduct the interview in his office at Archway Studios. We reluctantly agreed to do it that way, but did so in the spirit of cooperation and because we needed to talk to this man. At that point, we were two days into the case and hadn't been able to talk to the last person known to have seen the victim alive. When we arrived at the office, Mr. Story's personal attorney, Jason Fleer, was there. We began interviewing Mr. Story, but in less than five minutes... His attorney terminated the interview. Was this conversation tape-recorded? Yes, it was. Langweiser made the motion to play the recording, and it was approved by Judge Houghton over Folk's objection. Folk's had asked the judge to simply allow jurors to read his already prepared transcripts of the short interview. But Langweiser objected to that, saying that she hadn't had time to check the transcripts for accuracy and that it was important for the jurors to hear David Story's tone and demeanor. With the wisdom of Solomon, the judge ruled that the tape would be heard and that the transcripts would be handed out anyway as an aid to the jurors. He encouraged Bosch and the prosecution team to read along as well so they could check the transcript for accuracy. Bosch my name is Detective Hieronymus Bosch of the Los Angeles Police Department. I am accompanied by my partners, Detectives Jerry Edgar and Kisman Ryder. We are interviewing David Story in his offices at Archway Studios in regard to case number 00897. Mr. Story is accompanied by his attorney, Jason Fleer. Mr. Story? Mr. Fleer? Any questions before we begin? Fleer. No questions. Bosch. Oh, and obviously we are recording this statement. Mr. Story. Did you know a woman named Jody Kremens, also known as Donatella Spears? Story. You know the answer to that. Fleer. David. Story. Yes, I knew her. I was with her last Thursday night. It does not mean I killed her. Fleer. David, please answer only the questions they ask you. Story. Whatever. Bosch. Can I continue? Fleer. By all means, please. Story. Yes, by all means, please. Bosch. You mentioned that you were with her on Thursday evening. This was a date. Story. Why ask things you already know the answer to? Yes, it was a date, if you want to call it that. Bosch. What do you want to call it? Story. Doesn't matter. Pause. Bosch. Could you give us a framework of time that you were with her? Story. Picked her up at 7.30, dropped her off about midnight. Bosch. Did you enter her home when you came to pick her up? Story. Matter of fact, I didn't. I was running very late and called on my cell phone to tell her to come outside because I didn't have time to come in. I think she wanted me to meet her roommate, another actress, no doubt. But I didn't have the time. Bosch. 
so when you pulled up, she was waiting outside. Story. That's what I said. Bosh. 7.30 until midnight. That's four and a half hours. Story. You're good at math. I like that in a detective. Fleer. David, let's try to get this done. Story. I am. Bosh. Could you tell us what you did during the time period you were with Jody Kremitz? Story. We covered the three Fs. Film, food, and a fuck. Bosh. Excuse me. Story. We went to the premiere of my movie. Then we went to the reception and had something to eat. Then I took her to my place and we had sex. Consensual sex, detective. Believe it or not, people do it on dates all the time. And not just Hollywood people. It happens across this great country of ours. It's what makes it great. Bosh. I understand. Did you take her home when you were finished? Story. Always the gentleman. I did. Bosh. Did you enter her house at this time? Story. No, I was in my fucking bathrobe. I just drove up. She got out and went inside. I then drove back home. Whatever happened after that, I don't know. I am not involved in this in any way, shape, or form. You people are... Fleer. David, please. Story. Completely full of shit. If for one fucking moment you think, Fleer, David, stop. Pause. Fleer. Detective Bosch, I think we need to stop this. Bosch. We're in the middle of an interview here, and Fleer. David, where are you going? Story. Fuck these people. I'm going out for a smoke. Bosch. Mr. Story has just left the office. Fleer. I think at this point he is exercising his rights under the First Amendment. This interview is over. The tape went blank, and Langweiser turned it off. Bosch looked at the jury. Several of them were looking at Story. His arrogance had come through loud and clear on the tape. This was important because they would soon be asking the jury to believe that Story had privately boasted to Bosch about the murder and how he would get away with it. Only an arrogant man would do that. The prosecution needed to prove Story was not only a murderer, but an arrogant one at that. Okay, then. Langweiser said. Did Mr. Story return to continue the interview? No, he did not, Bosch answered, and we were asked to leave. Did Mr. Story's denial of any involvement in the murder of Jody Kremens end your interest in him? No, it did not. We had an obligation to investigate the case fully, and that included either ruling him in or ruling him out as a suspect. Was his behavior during the short interview cause for suspicion? You mean his arrogance? No, he... Folks jumped up with an objection. Your Honor, one man's arrogance is another man's confidence in his innocence. There is no... You are right, Mr. Folks, Houghton said. He sustained the objection, struck Bosch's answer, and turned to the jurors and told them to ignore the remark but everybody knew you can't unring a bell. His behavior during the interview was not cause for suspicion. Bosch began again. His being the last known person to be with the victim was cause for our immediate attention and focus. His lack of cooperation was suspicious, but at this point we were keeping an open mind about everything. My partners and I have a combined total of more than 25 years' experience investigating homicides. We know that things are not always what they seem. Where did the investigation go next? We continued all avenues of investigation. One of those avenues was obviously Mr. Story. Based on his statement that he and the victim had gone to his home on their date, my partners filed a search warrant application in municipal court and received approval to search David Story's home. 
Langweiser brought the search warrant forward to the judge, and it was received into evidence. She took it back with her to the lectern. Bosch then testified that the search of the home on Mulholland Drive was conducted at 6 a.m., two days after the initial interview with Story. The search warrant authorized you to seize any evidence of Jody Cremence's murder, any evidence of her belongings, and any evidence of her presence having been in that location. Is that correct? Correct. Who conducted the search? Myself, my partners, and a two-man forensics team. We also had a photographer for video and stills, a total of six. How long did the search last? Approximately seven hours. Was the defendant present during the search? For most of it. He had to leave at one point for a meeting with a movie actor he said he couldn't postpone. He was gone approximately two hours. During that time, his personal attorney, Mr. Fleer, remained in the house and monitored the search. We were never left alone in the house, if that is what you're asking. Langweiser flipped through the pages of the search warrant, coming to the end of it. Now, Detective, when you seize any items during a court-approved search, you are required by law to keep an inventory on the search warrant receipt, correct? Yes. This receipt is then filed with the court, correct? Yes. Can you tell us, then, why is this receipt blank? We didn't take any items from the house during the search. You found nothing that indicated that Jody Cremens had been inside Mr. Story's house, as he had told you she had been? Nothing. This search took place how many days after the evening Mr. Story told you he had taken Ms. Cremens to his house and engaged in sexual relations with her? Five days from the night of the murder. Two days from our interview with Mr. Story. You found nothing in support of Mr. Story's statement? Nothing. The place was clean. Bosch knew she was trying to turn a negative into a positive, somehow trying to imply that the unsuccessful search was an indication of Story's guilt. Would you call this an unsuccessful search? No. Success doesn't enter into it. We were looking for evidence that would corroborate his statement as well as any evidence of possible foul play relating to Ms. Cremens. We found nothing in the house indicative of this. But sometimes it's not what you find, it's what you don't. Can you explain that to the jury? Well, it's true we didn't take any evidence from the house, but we found something missing that would later become important to us. And what was that? A book. A missing book. How did you know it was missing if it wasn't there? In the living room of the house, there was a large, built-in bookcase. Each shelf was full of books. On one shelf, there was a space, a slot, where a book had been but was now gone. We couldn't find what book that might be. There were no books sitting out loose in the house. At the time, it was just a small thing. Someone had obviously taken a book from the shelf and not replaced it. It was just kind of curious to us that we couldn't figure out where or what it was. Langweiser offered two still photographs of the bookcase taken during the search as exhibits. Houghton accepted them over a routine objection from folks. The photo showed the bookcase in its entirety, and a close-up of the second shelf with the open space between a book called The Fifth Horizon and a biography of the film director John Ford called Print the Legend. Now, Detective, Langweiser said, you said that at the time you didn't know if this missing book had any importance or bearing on the case, correct? That is right. Did you eventually determine what book had been taken from the shelf? Yes, we did. Langweiser paused. Bosch knew what she was going to do. The dance had been choreographed. He thought of her as a good storyteller. She knew how to string it along, keep people hooked in, take them to the edge of the cliff, and then pull them back. Well, let's take things in order, she said. We'll come back to the book. 
Now, did you have occasion to talk to Mr. Story on the day of the search? He mostly kept to himself and was on the phone most of the time. But we spoke when we first knocked on the door and announced the search. And then, at the end of the day, when I told him we were leaving and that we weren't taking anything with us. Did you wake him up when you came at six in the morning? Yes, we did. Was he alone in the house? Yes. Did he invite you in? Not at first. He objected to the search. I told him, Excuse me, detective. We might make this easier if we show it. You said there was a videographer with you. Was he running the camera when you knocked at six in the morning? Yes, he was. Langweiser then made the appropriate motions to introduce the search video. It was accepted under objection from the defense. A large television was rolled into the courtroom and placed at center in front of a jury box. Bosch was used to identify the tape. The lights in the courtroom were dimmed, and it was played. The tape began with a focus on Bosch outside the red front door of a house. He identified himself and the address and the case number. He spoke quietly. He then turned and knocked sharply on the door. He announced it was the police had knocked sharply again. They waited. Bosch knocked on the door every 15 seconds until it was finally opened about two minutes after the first pounding. David Story looked out through the opening, his hair disheveled, his eyes showing exhaustion. What? he asked. We have a search warrant here, Mr. Story. Bosch said, it allows us to conduct a search of these premises. You have to be fucking kidding. No, we're not, sir. Could you step back and let us in? The sooner we're in, the sooner we're out. I'm calling my lawyer. Story closed and locked the door. Bosch immediately stepped up and put his face close to the jam. He called out loudly. Mr. Story, you have ten minutes. If this door is not open by 6.15, then we're going to take it down. We have a court-ordered search warrant, and we will execute it. He turned back to the camera and made the cut signal across his throat. The video jumped to another focus on the door. The time readout on the bottom corner now showed it was 6.13 a.m. The door opened, and Story stepped back and signaled the search team in. His hair looked as though it had been combed with his hands. He was wearing black jeans and a black T-shirt. He was in bare feet. Do what you have to do and get out. My lawyer's coming, and he's going to watch you people. You break one fucking thing in this house, and I'm going to sue the shit out of you. This is a David Surrier house. You so much as put a scratch on one of the walls, and it'll be your jobs. All of you. Well, be careful, Mr. Story. Bosch said as he walked in. The cameraman was the last to enter the house. Story looked into the lens as if seeing it for the first time. And get that shit off of me! He made a motion, and the camera angle shot upward to the ceiling. It remained there while the voices of the videographer and Story continued off-camera. Hey, don't touch the camera! Then get it out of my face! Okay, fine. Just don't touch the camera. The screen went blank, and the lights of the courtroom came back up. Langweiser continued the questioning. Detective Bosch, did you or members of the search team have further conversation with Mr. Story after that? Not during the search. Once his lawyer got there, Mr. Story stayed in his office. When we searched his office, he moved into the bedroom. When he was leaving for his appointment, I questioned him briefly about that, and he left. That was about it, as far as it went during the search— and while we were inside the house. What about at the end of the day, seven hours later, when the search was completed? Did you speak to the defendant again? Yes, I spoke to him briefly at the front door. We were packed up and ready to leave. The lawyer had left. I was in my car with my partners. We were backing out when I realized I had forgotten about giving Mr. Story a copy of the search warrant. It's required by law. So I went back to his door and knocked on it. Did Mr. Story answer the door himself? Yes, he answered after about four hard knocks. I gave him the receipt and told him it was required. Did he say anything to you? Folks stood up and objected for the record, but the issue had already been disposed of in pretrial motions and rulings. The judge noted the objection for the record and overruled it for the record. Langweiser asked the question again. Can I refer to my notes? Please. 
Bosch turned to the notes he had taken in the car right after the conversation. First, he said, you didn't find a goddamn thing, did you? And I told him he was right, that we weren't taking anything with us. He then said, because there was nothing to take. I nodded and was turning to leave when he spoke again. He said, hey, Bosch. I turned back and he leaned toward me and said, you'll never find what you're looking for. I said, oh, really? What is it that I am looking for? He didn't respond. He just looked at me and smiled. After a pause, Langweiser asked, Was that the end of it? No. I sensed at that point that I might be able to bait him into saying more. I said to him, You did it, didn't you? He continued to smile, and then he slowly nodded. And he said, And I'll get away with it. He said, I'm a bullshit! You're a fucking liar! It was story. He had stood up and was pointing at Bosch. Folks had his hand on him and was trying to pull him back into his place. A deputy sheriff, who'd been positioned at a desk to the rear of the defense table, was up and moving towards Story from behind. The defendant will sit down! The judge boomed from the bench. At the same moment, he brought the gavel down. He's fucking lying! Deputy, sit him down! The deputy moved in put both hands on Story's shoulders from behind and roughly pulled him back down into his seat. The judge pointed another deputy toward the jury. Remove the jury. While the jurors were quickly hustled into the deliberation room, Story continued to struggle with the deputy and folks. As soon as the jurors were gone, he seemed to relax his efforts and then calmed. Bosch looked over at the reporters, trying to see if any of them had noted how Story's demonstration ended as soon as the jurors were out of sight. Mr. Story, the judge yelled from a standing position, that behavior and language is not acceptable in this courtroom. Mr. Folks, if you can't control your client, my people will. One more outburst and I will have him gagged and chained to that chair. Am I clear on this? Absolutely, Your Honor. I apologize. That is a zero-tolerance rule. Any outburst from here on out, and he'll be shackled. I don't care who he is or who his friends are. Yes, Your Honor, we understand. I am taking five minutes, and then we'll start again. The judge abruptly left the bench, his feet resounding loudly as he quickly took the three steps down. He disappeared through a door to the rear hallway that led to his chambers. Bosch looked over at Langweiser, and her eyes betrayed her delight at what had just happened. To Bosch, it was a trade-off. On one hand, the jurors saw the defendant acting angrily and out of control, possibly exhibiting the same rage that had led to murder. But on the other hand, he was registering his objection to what was happening to him in the courtroom. And that could register an empathic response from the jurors. Story only had to reach one of them in order to walk. Before the trial, Langweiser had predicted that they would draw Story into an outburst. Bosch had thought she was wrong. He thought Story was too cool in calculating. Unless, of course, the outburst was a calculated move. Story was a man who directed dramatic scenes and characters for a living. Bosch knew he should have seen that a time might come when he would be unwittingly used as a supporting actor in one of those scenes. Chapter 25 The judge returned to the bench two minutes after leaving and Bosch wondered if he'd retreated to his chambers to put a holster on under the robes. As soon as he sat down, Houghton looked at the defense table. Story was sitting with his face somberly pointed down at the sketch pad in front of him. Are we ready? the judge asked. All parties murmured they were ready. The judge called for the jury, and they were brought in, most of them looking directly at Story as they entered. Okay, folks, we're going to try this again, Houghton said. The exclamations you heard a few minutes ago from the defendant are to be ignored. They are not evidence. They are not anything. If Mr. Story wants to personally deny the charges or anything else said about him in testimony, he'll get that chance. Bosch watched Langweiser's eyes dance. The judge's comments were his way of slapping back at the defense. He was setting up the expectation that Story would testify during the defense phase. If he didn't, then it could be a letdown for the jurors. The judge turned it back over to Langweiser, who continued her questioning of Bosch. Before we were interrupted, 
You were testifying about your conversation with the defendant at the door to his house. Yes. You quoted the defendant as saying, and I'll get away with it. Is that correct? Correct. And you took this comment to be referring to the death of Judy Kremens, correct? That's what we were talking about, yes. Did he say anything else after that? Yes. Bosch paused, wondering if Story would make another outburst. He didn't. He said, I am a god in this town, Detective Bosch. You don't fuck with the gods. Nearly ten seconds of silence went by before Langweiser was prompted by the judge to move on. What did you do after the defendant made this statement to you? Well, I was kind of taken aback. I was surprised that he would say this to me. You were not recording the conversation, is that correct? That is correct. It was just a conversation at the door after I knocked. So what happened next? I went to the car and immediately wrote out these notes of the conversation so I would have it verbatim from when it was freshest in my mind. I told my partners what had just transpired, and we decided to call the district attorney's office for advice as to whether this admission to me would give us probable cause to arrest Mr. Story. Um, what happened was that none of us could get a signal on our cell phones because we were up there in the hills. We left the house and drove to the fire station on Mulholland, just east of Laurel Canyon Boulevard. We asked to use a phone there, and I made the call to the DA. And who did you speak with? You. I recounted the case, what had transpired during the search, and what Mr. Story said at the door. It was decided to continue the investigation at that point and not make the arrest. Did you agree with that decision? Not at the time. I wanted to arrest him. Did Mr. Story's admission change the investigation? It pretty much closed the focus. The man had admitted the crime to me. We began looking only at him. Did you ever consider that perhaps the admission was an empty boast? That at the same time you were in essence baiting the defendant, he was baiting you? Yes, I considered it. But ultimately, I believed he made the statements because they were true, and because he believed he was in an invincible position at that point. There was a sharp ripping sound as Story tore the top page off his sketch pad. He crumbled the paper and bounced it across the table. It hit a computer screen and bounced off the table to the floor. Thank you, Detective, Langweiser said. Now, you said the decision was to continue the investigation. Can you tell the jury what that entailed? Bosch described how he and his partners interviewed dozens of witnesses who had seen the defendant and the victim at the film premiere or at the reception that followed in a circus tent erected in a nearby parking lot. They also interviewed dozens more people who knew Story or had worked with him. Bosch acknowledged that none of these interviews produced information important to the investigation. You mentioned earlier that during the search of the defendant's home, you became curious about a missing book, correct? Yes. Folks objected. There has been no evidence whatsoever about a missing book. There was a space on the shelf. It doesn't mean there was ever a book in that place. Langweiser promised she would tie it all up promptly, and the judge overruled. Did there come a time when you determined what book had been in that space on the shelf in the defendant's home? Yes. In the course of our gathering of background information on Mr. Story, my partner, Kisman Ryder, who was aware of his work and professional reputation, remembered that she had read a story about him in a magazine called Architectural Digest. She was able to do an Internet search and determine that the issue she remembered was from February of last year. She then ordered a copy of the magazine from the publisher. What she had remembered was that there were photos in the article of Mr. Story in his house. She remembered his bookshelves because she's an avid reader and was curious about what books this movie director would have on his shelves. Langweiser made a motion to introduce the magazine as her next exhibit. It was received by the judge, and Langweiser gave it to Bosch on the witness stand. Is that the magazine your partner received? Yes. Could you turn to the story on the defendant and describe the photograph on the opening page of the story? Bosch flipped to a marker in the magazine. It's a photograph of David's story sitting on the couch in the living room of his house. To his left are the bookshelves. 
Can you read the titles of the books on the spines of the books? Some of them. They are not all clear. When you received this magazine from the publisher, what did you do with it? We saw that not all of the books were clear. We contacted the publisher again and attempted to borrow the negative of this photo. We dealt with the editor-in-chief, who wouldn't allow the negatives out of the office. He cited media law and free press restraints. So what happened next? The editor said he would even fight a court order. An attorney from the city attorney's office was called in and began negotiating with the magazine's lawyer. The result was that I flew to New York City and was allowed access to the negative in the photo lab in the Architectural Digest offices. For the record, what date were you there? I took a red eye on October 29th. I was at the magazine's office the following morning. It was a Monday, October 13th. And what did you do there? I had the magazine's photo lab manager make blow-ups of the shot containing the bookshelves. Langweiser introduced two large blow-up photographs on hard backing as her next exhibits. After they were approved over unsustained objection, she put them on easels set in front of the jury. One showed the bookcase in full, while the other was a blow-up of one shelf. The image was grainy, but the titles on the spines of the books could be read. Detective, did you compare these photos with those taken during the search of the defendant's house? Yes, we did. Langweiser asked permission to set up a third and fourth easel and to put blow-up photos taken during the search of the full bookcase and the shelf with the space for a missing book. The judge approved. She then asked Bosch to step down from the witness stand and use a pointer to explain what he found during his comparison study. It was obvious to anyone looking at the photos what he found, but Langweiser was painstakingly going through the motions so that no juror could be confused. Bosch put the pointer on the photo showing the open space in the shelved books. He then brought it over and put the tip on a book that was in the same spot. When we searched the house on October 14th, there was no book here between the Fifth Horizon and Print the Legend. Here in this photo, taken ten months before, there is a book between the Fifth Horizon and Print the Legend. And what is the title of that book? Victims of the Night. Okay. And did you look at photos you had from the search of the full bookcase in order to see if this book, Victims of the Night, had been shelved elsewhere? Bosch pointed to the October 14th blow-up of the entire bookcase. We did. It's not there. Did you find this book anywhere in the house? No, we did not. Thank you, Detective. You can return to the witness stand now. Langweiser introduced a copy of Victims of the Night as an exhibit and handed it to Bosch. Can you tell the jury what that is, Detective? It is a copy of Victims of the Night. Is that the book that was on the defendant's shelf when his photograph was taken for Architectural Digest in January of last year? No, it's not. It's a copy of the same book. I bought it. Where? A place called the Mysterious Bookshop on Beverly Boulevard in Los Angeles. Why did you buy it there? I called around. It was the only place I could find that had it in stock. Why was it so hard to find? The man at Mysterious Bookshop told me it was a small printing by a small publisher. Did you read this book? Parts of it. It's mostly photographs of unusual crime scenes and accident scenes, that sort of thing. Is there anything in there that struck you as unusual or perhaps relating to the killing of Jody Kremitz? Yes. There's a photograph of a death scene on page 73 that immediately drew my attention. Describe it, please. Bosch opened the book to a marker. He spoke as he looked at the full-page photograph on the right side of the book. It shows a woman in a bed. She's dead. A scarf is tied around her neck and looped over one of the bars of the headboard. She's nude from the waist down. Her left hand is between her legs, and two of her fingers have penetrated the vagina. Can you read the caption beneath the photo, please? It says... Auto-erotic death. This woman was found in her bed in New Orleans, a victim of auto-erotic asphyxia. It's estimated that around the world more than 500 people die from this accidental misadventure each year. 
Langweiser asked and received permission to place two more blow-up photos on the easels as exhibits. She placed them right over two of the bookshelf photos. Side by side, the photos were of Jody Cremens's body in her bed and the photo from Victims of the Night. Detective, did you make a comparison between the photo of the victim in this case, Jody Cremens, and the photo from the book? Yes, I did. I found them to be very similar. Did it appear to you that the body of Ms. Cremens could have been staged, using the photo from the book as a model or baseline? Yes, it did. Did you ever have occasion to ask the defendant what happened to his copy of the book, Victims of the Night? No. Since the day of the search of his home, Mr. Storey and his attorneys have refused repeated requests for an interview. Langweiser nodded and looked at the judge. Your Honor, may I take these exhibits down and offer them to the court clerk? Please do, the judge responded. Langweiser made a show of taking the photos of the two dead women down first by folding them in toward each other like two sides of a mirror closing. It was a little thing, but Bosch saw the jurors watching. Okay, Detective Bosch, Langweiser said when the easels were cleared. Did you make any inquiries or do any further investigation into autoerotic deaths? Yes. I knew that if this case ever moved to a trial that the classification of the death as a homicide staged to look like this sort of accident might be challenged. I was also curious about what that caption in the book said. Frankly, I was surprised by the figure of 500 deaths a year. I did some checking with the FBI and found that the figure was actually accurate, if not low. And did that cause you to do any further research? Yes, on a more local level. With Langweiser prompting, Bosch testified that he had checked through records at the medical examiner's office for death due to autoerotic asphyxia. His search went back five years. And what did you find? In those five years, 16 deaths in Los Angeles County classified as accidental death by misadventure had been attributed specifically to autoerotic asphyxia. And how many of these cases involved female victims? Only one case involved a female. Did you examine this case? Folks was up with an objection and this time asked for a sidebar conference. The judge allowed it and the attorneys gathered at the side of the bench. Bosch couldn't hear the whispered conversation, but knew that Folks was most likely trying to stop the direction of the testimony. Langweiser and Kretzler had anticipated he would move once more to block any mention of Alicia Lopez in front of the jurors. It would likely be the pivotal decision in the trial, for both sides. After five minutes of whispered argument, the judge sent the lawyers back to their places and told the jurors that the issue before the court would take longer than anticipated. He adjourned for another fifteen-minute break. Bosch returned to the prosecution table. Something new? Bosch asked Leinweiser. No, the same old argument. For some reason, the judge wants to hear it again. Wish us luck. The lawyers and the judge retreated to chambers to argue the point. Bosch was left at the table. He used his cell phone to check messages at his home and office. There was one message at work. It was from Terry McCaleb. He thanked Bosch for the tip from the night before. He said he got some good information at Nats and that he'd be in touch. Bosch erased it and closed the phone, wondering what it was that McCaleb had picked up. When the lawyers returned through the rear door of the courtroom, Bosch read the judge's decision in their faces. Folks looked dour with his eyes downcast. Kretzler and Langweiser came back smiling. After the jurors were brought back and the trial resumed, Langweiser went directly in for the hit. She asked the court reporter to read back the last question before the objection. Did you examine this case? The reporter read. Let's strike that. Langweiser said. Let's not confuse the issue. Detective, the one female case of the 16 you found in the medical examiner's records, what was the name of the deceased in that case? Alicia Lopez. Can you tell us a little bit about her? She was 24 and lived in Culver City. She worked as an administrative assistant to the vice president of production at Sony Pictures, also in Culver City. 
She was found dead in her bed on the 20th of May, 1998. She lived alone? Yes. What were the circumstances of her death? She was found in her bed by a co-worker who became concerned when she'd missed two days of work following the weekend without calling in. The coroner estimated she'd been dead three to four days by the time she was found. Decomposition of the body was extensive. Where's Langweiser? Judge Houghton interrupted. It was agreed that you would lay foundation connecting the cases quickly. I'm right there, Your Honor. Thank you. Detective, did anything about this case alert you or draw your attention in any way? Several things. I looked at photos taken at the death scene, and though decomposition was extensive, I was able to note that the victim in this case was in a posture closely paralleling that of the victim in the present case. I also noted that the ligature in the Lopez case was also used without a buffering, which was the same with the present case. I also knew from our backgrounding investigation of Mr. Story that at the time of Ms. Lopez's death, he was making a film for a company called Cold House Films, a company which was being financed in part by Sony Pictures. In the moment following his answer, Bosch noticed that the courtroom had become unusually still and silent. No one was whispering in the gallery or clearing their throat. It was as if everyone, jurors, lawyers, spectators, and media, all decided to hold their breath at once. Bosch glanced at the jurors and saw that almost all of them were looking at the defense table. Bosch looked there as well and saw Story, his face still aimed downward, silently seething. Langweiser finally broke the silence. Detective, did you make further inquiries about the Lopez case? Yes. I spoke to the detective who handled it for the Culver City Police Department. I also made inquiries about Ms. Lopez's job at Sony. And what did you learn about her that would have bearing on the present case? I learned that at the time of her death she was acting as a liaison between the studio and the field production of the film David's story was directing. Do you recall the name of that film? The Fifth Horizon. Where was it being filmed? In Los Angeles, mostly in Venice. And as a liaison, would Ms. Lopez have had any direct contact with Mr. Story? Yes. She spoke with him by phone, or in person, every day of the shoot. Again, the silence seemed to be roaring. Langweiser milked it for as long as she could and then started driving home the nails. Let me see if I have all of this straight, Detective. Your testimony is that in the past five years there has been only one death of a female in Los Angeles County attributed to autoerotic asphyxia and that the present case involving the death of Jody Cremens was staged to appear as an autoerotic asphyxia? Objection! Folks interjected. Asked and answered. Overruled, Houghton said without argument from Langweiser. The witness may answer. Yes, Bosch said. Correct. And that both of these women knew the defendant, David Story? Correct. And that both of these deaths show similarities to a photograph of an autoerotic death contained in a book known at one time to be in the defendant's collection at home? Correct. Bosch looked over at Story as he said it hoping he would look up so that they could lock eyes one more time. What did the Culver City Police Department have to say about this, Detective Bosch? Based upon my inquiries, they've reopened the case, but they're hampered. Why is that? The case is old, because it was originally ruled an accidental death. Not all the records were kept in archives. Because decomposition was advanced at the time of the body's discovery, it's hard to make definitive observations and conclusions, and the body cannot be exhumed because it was cremated. It was? By who? Folks stood and objected, but the judge said the argument had already been heard and overruled. Langweiser prompted Bosch before Folks had even sat back down. By who, Detective Bosch? By her family but it was paid for. The cremation, the service, everything was paid for by David Story as a gift in Alicia Lopez's memory. Langweiser loudly flipped up a page on her legal tablet. She was on a roll and everybody knew it. 
It was what cops and prosecutors called being in the tube. It was a surfing reference. It meant they'd ridden the case into the water tunnel where everything was going smoothly and perfectly and was surrounding them in glorious balance. Detective, subsequent to this part of the investigation, did there come a time when a woman named Annabel Crow came to see you? Yes. A story had broken in the Los Angeles Times about the investigation and how David's story was the focus. She read the story and came forward. And who is she? She's an actress. She lives in West Hollywood. And what bearing did she have on this case? She told me that she had dated David Story at one time last year, and he choked her while they were having sex. Folks made another objection, this one without the force of his other protestations. But again, he was overruled as the testimony had been cleared by the judge in earlier motions. Where did Ms. Crow say this incident took place? in Mr. Story's home on Mulholland Drive. I asked her to describe the place, and she was able to do so accurately. She'd been there. Couldn't she have seen the issue of Architectural Digest that showed photos of the defendant's home? She was able to describe in accurate detail areas of the master bedroom and bath that were not shown in the magazine. What happened to her when the defendant choked her? She told me she passed out. When she awoke, Mr. Story was not in the room. He was taking a shower. She grabbed her clothing and fled from the home. Langweiser underlined that with a long silence. She then flipped the pages of her pad down, glanced over at the defense table, and then looked up at Judge Houghton. Your Honor, that is all I have for Detective Bosch at this time. Chapter 26 McCaleb got to El Cochinito at quarter to twelve. He hadn't been inside the storefront restaurant in Silver Lake in five years, but he remembered the place had only a dozen or so tables, and they were usually taken quickly at lunchtime, and often those tables were taken by cops. Not because the name of the restaurant was a draw, the little pig, but because the food was of high quality and low cost. It had been McCaleb's experience that cops were highly skilled in finding such establishments among the many restaurants in any city. When he'd traveled on assignment for the Bureau, he would always ask the local street cops for recommendations on food. He'd rarely been disappointed. While he waited for Winston, he carefully studied the menu and planned his meal. In the past year, his palate had finally returned with a vengeance. For the first 18 months of his life after surgery, his sense of taste had deserted him. He'd not cared what he ate because it all tasted the same, bland. Even a heavy dousing of habanera sauce on everything from sandwiches to pasta only registered a minor blip on his tongue. But then, slowly, his taste started coming back, and it became a second rebirth for him following the transplant itself. He now loved everything Graciela made. He even loved everything he made and this despite his general ineptitude with anything other than the barbecue grill. He ate everything with a gusto he'd never had before, even before the transplant. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the middle of the night was something he privately savored, as much as a trip with Graciela Overland to dine in style at Hozu on Melrose. Consequently, he'd started filling out, gaining back the 25 pounds he'd lost while his own heart had withered, and he'd waited for a new one. He was now back to his pre-illness weight of 180, and food intake, for the first time in four years, was something he had to watch. On his last cardio checkup, his doctor had taken notice and raised a warning. She told him that he had to slow down the intake of calories and fat. But not at this lunch. He'd been waiting a long time for a chance to come to this place. Years earlier, he'd spent a good bit of time in Florida on a cereal case, and the only good that had come out of it was his love of Cuban food. When he later transferred to the Los Angeles field office, it was hard to find a Cuban restaurant that compared with the places where he'd eaten in Ybor City outside of Tampa. Once, on an L.A. case, he came across a patrol cop, who he learned was of Cuban descent. McCaleb asked him where he went to eat when he wanted real home cooking. The cop's answer was El Cochinito, and McCaleb quickly became a regular. McCaleb decided that studying the menu was a waste of time, 
because he'd known all along what he wanted. Lecho Nasada with black beans and rice, fried bananas and yucca on the side, and don't bother telling the doctor. He just wished Winston would hurry up and get there so he could place his order. He put the menu aside and thought about Harry Bosch. McCaleb had spent most of the morning on the boat watching the trial on television. He thought Bosch's performance on the witness stand had been outstanding. The revelation that Story had been linked to another death was shocking to McCaleb and apparently to the media horde as well. During the breaks, the talking heads in the studio were beside themselves with excitement over the prospect of this new fodder. They cut at one point to the hallway outside the courtroom where Jay Reason Folks was being peppered with questions about these new developments. Folks, for probably the only time in his life, was not commenting. The talking heads were left to speculate about this new information, and to comment on the methodical yet thoroughly gripping procession of the prosecution's case. Still, watching the trial only caused uneasiness within McCaleb. He had a difficult time coming to terms with the idea that the man he watched so capably describe the aspects and moves of a difficult investigation was also the man he was investigating. The man his gut instincts told him had committed the same kind of crime he was now involved in prosecuting. At noon, their agreed-upon meeting time, McCaleb looked up from his thoughts to see Jay Winston come through the restaurant's front door. She was followed by two men. One was black and one was white, and that was the best way to differentiate between them because they wore almost identical gray suits and maroon ties. Before they even got to his table, McCaleb knew they were bureau men. Winston had a look of washed-out resignation on her face. Terry! She said before sitting down, I want you to meet a couple guys. She indicated the black agent first. This is Don Twilley, and this is Marcus Friedman. They're with the Bureau. All three of them pulled out chairs and sat down. Friedman sat next to McCaleb, Twilley directly across from him. Nobody shook hands. I've never had Cuban food before, Twilley said as he pulled a menu from the napkin stand. Is it good here? McCaleb looked at him. No, that's why I like to eat here. Twilly's eyes came up from the menu and he smiled. I know, stupid question. He looked down at the menu and then back up at McCaleb. You know I know about you, Terry. You're a fucking legend in the F.O. Not because of the heart, because of the cases. I'm glad to finally meet you. McCaleb looked over at Winston with a look that said, What the hell is going on? Terry. Mark and Don are from the Civil Rights Section. Yeah? That's great. Did you guys come all the way from the field office to meet the legend and try Cuban food, or is there something else? Ah, uh, Twilly began. Terry, the shit's hit the fan, Winston said. A reporter called my captain this morning to ask if we were investigating Harry Bosch as a suspect in the gun case. McCaleb leaned back in his seat, shocked by the news. He was about to respond when the waiter came to the table. Give us a couple minutes, Twilly said gruffly to the man, waving him off with a dismissive gesture which annoyed McCaleb. Winston continued, Terry, before we go further with this, I have to know something. Did you leak this? McCaleb shook his head in disgust. Are you kidding me? You're asking me that? Look. All I know is that it didn't come from me, and I didn't tell anyone, not Captain Hitchens and not even my own partner, let alone a reporter. Well, it wasn't me. Thanks for asking. He glanced at Twilly and then back at Winston. He hated having this dispute with Jay in front of them. What are these guys doing here? He asked. Then looking at Twilly again, he added, What do you want? They're taking over the case, Terry. Winston answered. And you're out. But Caleb looked back at Winston. His mouth opened a little before he realized how he looked and closed it. What are you talking about? I'm out? I'm the only one in. I've been working this as... I know, Terry, but things are different now. After the reporter called Hitchens, I had to tell him what was happening, what we'd been doing. He threw a fit, and after he was done throwing a fit, he decided the best way to handle this was to go to the Bureau with it. The Civil Rights Section, Terry. Twilly said. Investigating cops is our bread and butter. We'll be able to... Fuck you, Twilly, 
Don't try that bureau rap with me. I used to be in the club, remember? I know how it goes. You guys will come in, piggyback my trail, and then waltz Bosch past the cameras on the way to the lockup. Is that what this is about? Friedman said. Getting the credit? You don't have to worry about that, Terry, Twilly said. We could put you in front of the cameras if that's what you want. It's not what I want. And don't call me Terry. You don't even fucking know me. He looked down at the table, shaking his head. Fuck! I've been waiting to come back to this place for a long time, and now I don't even feel like eating. Terry, Winston said, not offering anything else. What? You're going to tell me this is right? No. It's not right or wrong. It's just the way it is. The investigation is official now. You're not official. You knew this could happen from the start. He reluctantly nodded. He brought his elbows up onto the table and put his face into his hands. Who is the reporter? When Winston didn't answer, he dropped his hands and looked pointedly at her. Who? A guy named Jack McAvoy. He works for the New Times, an alternative weekly that likes to stir up shit. I know what it is. You know McAvoy? Twilly asked. McCaleb's cell phone began to chirp. It was in the pocket of his jacket draped over his chair. It got caught in the pocket as he tried to get it out. He anxiously struggled with it because he assumed it would be Graciella. Other than Winston and Buddy Lockridge, he'd only given the number to Brass Doran in Quantico, and he'd finished his business with her. He finally answered after the fifth chirp. Hey, Agent McCaleb, it's Jack McAvoy from the New Times. You got a couple minutes to talk? McCaleb looked across the table at Twilly, wondering if he could hear the voice on the phone. Actually, I don't. I'm in the middle of something here. How'd you get this number? Information on Catalina. I called the number and your wife answered. She gave me her cell. That a problem? No, no problem. But I can't talk now. When can we talk? It's important. Something's come up that I really want to talk. Just call me later, in an hour. McCaleb closed the phone and put it down on the table. He looked at it, half expecting McAvoy to call back right away. Reporters were like that. Terry, everything all right? He looked up at Winston. Yeah, fine. My charter tomorrow. He wanted to know about the weather. He looked at Twilly. What was your question again? Do you know Jack McAvoy, the reporter who called Captain Hitchens? McCaleb paused, looking at Winston and then back at Twilly. Yeah. I know him. You know I know him. That's right. The poet case. You had a piece of that. A small piece. When was the last time you talked to McAvoy? Well, that would have been, let's see, that would have been a couple of days ago. Winston visibly stiffened. McCaleb looked over at her. Relax, would you, Jay? I ran into McAvoy at the story trial. I went up there to talk to Bosch. McAvoy's covering it for New Times, and he said hello. I hadn't talked to him in five years. And I did not tell him what I was doing or what I was working on. In fact, at the time I saw him, Bosch wasn't even a suspect. Well, did he see you with Bosch? I'm sure he did. Everybody did. There's as much media up there as there was for OJ. Did he specifically mention me to your captain? If he did, Hitchens didn't tell me. All right, then. If it wasn't you and it wasn't me, where else did the leak come from? That's what we are asking you, Twilly said. Before we come into this case, we want to know the lay of the land and who's talking to who. McCaleb didn't reply. He was getting claustrophobic. Between the conversation and Twilly being in his face and the people standing around in the small restaurant waiting for tables, he was beginning to feel like he couldn't breathe. What about this bar you went to last night? Friedman asked. McCaleb leaned back and looked over at him. What about it? Jay told us what you told her. You specifically asked about Bosch and Gunn there, right? Yeah, right. And what? You think the bartender then jumped on the phone and called the New Times and asked for Jack McAvoy? All because I showed her a picture of Bosch? Give me a fucking break. Hey, it's a media-conscious town. People are plugged in. People sell stories, info, data all the time. But Caleb shook his head refusing to buy into the possibility that the bartender in the vest had enough intelligence to put together what he was doing and to then make a call to a reporter. Suddenly, he realized who did have the intelligence and information to do it. 
Buddy Lockridge. And if it had been him, it might as well have been McCaleb who leaked the story. He felt sweat start to warm his scalp as he thought about Lockridge hiding down on the lower deck while he'd made his case against Bosch to Winston. Did you have anything to drink while you were in the bar? I hear you take a mess of pills every day, mixing that with alcohol. You know, loose lips sink ships. Twilly had asked the question, but McCaleb looked sharply at Winston. He was stung by a sense of betrayal by the whole scene and at how quickly things had shifted. But before he could say anything, he saw the apology in her eyes, and he knew she wished things had been handled differently. He finally looked back at Twilly. You think maybe I mixed a few too many drinks and pills, Twilly, that it? You think I started shooting my mouth off in the bar? I don't think that. I'm just asking, okay? No reason to get defensive here. I'm just trying to figure out how this reporter knows what he thinks he knows. Well, figure it out without me. McCaleb pushed his chair to get up. Try the lechon asada, he said. It's the best in the city. As he began to get up, Twilly reached across the table and grabbed his forearm. Come on, Terry, let's talk about this, Twilly said. Terry, please, Winston said. McCaleb pulled his arm loose from Twilly's grip and stood up. He looked over at Winston. Good luck with these guys, Jay. You'll probably need it. Then he looked down at Friedman and then Twilly. And fuck you guys very much. He made his way through the crowd of people waiting and out the front door. Nobody followed him. He sat in the Cherokee, parked on Sunset, and watched the restaurant while letting the anger slowly leach out of his body. On one level, McCaleb knew the moves Winston and her captain were making were the right moves. But on another, he didn't like being moved out of his own case. A case was like a car. You could be driving it or riding in the front or back. Or you could be left on the side of the road as the car goes by. McCaleb had just gone from having his hands on the wheel to thumbing it from the side of the road. And it hurt. He began to think about Buddy Lockridge and how he would handle him. If he determined that it had been Buddy who had talked to McAvoy after eavesdropping on McCaleb's briefing of Winston on the boat, then he would cleanly sever all ties to him. Partner or not, he wouldn't be able to work with Buddy again. He realized that Buddy had the number to his cell phone and could have been the one who gave it to McAvoy. He got the phone out and called his home. Graciela answered, Fridays being one of her half days at the school. Graciela, did you give my cell number to anybody lately? Yes, a reporter who said he knew you and needed to speak with you right away. Uh, Jack something. Why, is something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. I was just checking. Are you sure? McCaleb got a call-waiting beep. He looked at his watch. It was ten to one. McAvoy wasn't supposed to call back until after one. Yes, I'm sure, he told Graciela. Look, I've got another call. I'll be home by dark tonight. I'll see you then. He switched to the other call. It was McAvoy, who explained that he was at the courthouse and had to get back into the trial at one or he'd lose his precious seat. He couldn't wait the full hour to call back. Can you talk now? He asked. What do you want? I need to talk to you. You keep saying that. About what? Harry Bosch. I'm working on a story about... I don't know anything about the story case. Only what's on TV. It's not that. It's about the Edward Gunn case. McCaleb didn't answer. He knew this was not good. Dancing with a reporter over something like this could only lead to trouble. McAvoy spoke into the silence. Is that what you wanted to see Harry Bosch about the other day when I saw you here? Are you working on the gun case? Listen to me. I can honestly tell you that I am not working on the Edward Gunn case, okay? Good, McCaleb thought. So far, he hadn't lied. Were you working on the case for the sheriff's department? Can I ask you something? Who told you this? Who said I was working this case? I can't answer that. I have to protect my sources. If you want to give me information, I will protect your identity as well. 
But if I give up a source, I'm fucked in this business. Well, I'll tell you what, Jack. I'm not talking to you unless you are talking to me. Know what I mean? It's a two-way street. You want to tell me who's saying this shit about me, and I'll talk to you. Otherwise, we've got nothing to say to each other. He waited. McAvoy said nothing. I thought so. Take it easy, Jack. He closed the phone. Whether McAvoy had mentioned his name or not to Captain Hitchens, it was clear that McAvoy was tapped into a credible pipeline of information. And again, McCaleb narrowed it down to one person besides himself and Jay Winston. God damn it, he said out loud in the car. A few minutes after one, he watched Jay Winston come out of El Cochinito. McCaleb was hoping for the chance to corner her and talk to her alone, maybe tell her about Lockridge. But Twilly and Friedman followed her out, and all three got into the same car, a bureau car. McCaleb watched them pull out into traffic and drive off in the direction of downtown. He got out of the Cherokee and went back into the restaurant. He was starved. There were no tables available, so he made an order to go. He'd eat in the Cherokee. The old woman who took his order looked up at him with sad brown eyes. She said it has been a busy week, and the kitchen had just run out of lechon asada. Chapter 27 John Reason surprised the spectators, the jurors, and probably most of the media when he reserved his cross-examination of Bosch until the defense's case began, but it was anticipated by the prosecution team. If the defense strategy was to shoot the messenger, that messenger was Bosch, and the best place from which to take the shot was during the presentation of the defense's side. That way, Folk's attack on Bosch could be part of an orchestrated attack on the entire case against David's story. Following a lunch break during which Bosch and the prosecutors were relentlessly pursued by the media with questions about Bosch's testimony, the prosecution began to move quickly with the momentum gained in the morning session. Kretzler and Langweiser took turns examining a series of witnesses with short stays on the stand. The first of these was Claudia Corazon, chief of the medical examiner's office. Under Kretzler's questioning, she testified to her findings during the autopsy and put Jody Kremens's time of death at some point between midnight and 2 a.m. on Friday, October 13th. She also gave corroborating testimony on the rarity of autoerotic deaths involving female victims. Once more, folks reserved the right to question the witness during the defense phase of the trial. Corazon was dismissed after less than half an hour on the stand. Now that his own testimony was completed, as far as the prosecution's case went, it was not vital for Bosch to be in the courtroom every moment of the trial. While Langweiser called the next witness, a lab tech who would identify the hair samples gathered from the victim's body as belonging to Story. Bosch walked Corazon to her car. They'd been lovers many years before in what current culture would term a casual relationship. But while there may not have been any love involved, there had been nothing casual about it to Bosch. In his view, it had been two people who looked at death every day, pushing it away with the ultimate life-affirming act. Corazon had broken it off after she was named to the top slot in the coroner's office. Their relationship since that point had been strictly professional, though Corazon's new position reduced her time in the autopsy suites, and Bosch didn't see her often. The Jody Kremens case was different. Corazon instinctively knew it might become a case that drew the bead of the media horde and took the autopsy herself. It had paid off. Her testimony would be seen across the nation, and probably around the globe. She was attractive, smart, skilled, and thorough. That half hour on the stand would be like a half hour commercial for lucrative jobs as an independent examiner or commentator. Bosch knew one thing about her from his time with her. Claudia Corazon always had her eye on the next step. 
She was parked in the garage next to the state parole office on the back side of the justice complex. They spoke of banalities, the weather, Harry's attempts to stop smoking, until Corazon brought the case up. It seems to be going well, so far. It'd be nice if we won one of these big ones for a change. It would. I watched you testify this morning. In my office, I had the TV on. You did very well, Harry. He knew her tone. She was leading to something. But? But you look tired. And you know they're going to come after you. This kind of case? If they destroy the cop, they destroy the case. OJ 101. Right. So are you ready for them? I think so. Good. Just rest up. Easier said than done. As they approached the garage, Bosch looked over at the parole office and saw a gathering of the staff out front for some kind of presentation. The group was standing below a banner hanging from the roof line that said, Welcome back, Thelma. A man in a suit was presenting a plaque to a heavy-set black woman who was leaning on a cane. Oh, that's that parole agent. Corazon said, the one who got shot last year by that hitman from Vegas. Right, right, Bosch said, remembering the story. She came back. He noticed that there were no television cameras recording the presentation. A woman got shot in the line of duty and then fought her way back to the job. It apparently wasn't worth wasting a videotape over. Welcome back he said. Corazon's car was on the second floor. It was a two-seat, shining black Mercedes. I see the outside work must be going pretty well, Bosch said. Corazon nodded. In my last contract, I got four weeks of professional leave. I'm making the most of it. Trials, TV, that sort of thing. I did a case on that autopsy show on HBO, too. It airs next month. Claudia. You're going to be world famous before we know it. She smiled and stepped close to him and straightened his tie. I know what you think about it, Harry. That's okay. Doesn't matter what I think about it. Are you happy? She nodded. Very. Then I'm happy for you. I better get back in there. I'll see you, Claudia. She suddenly rose on her toes and kissed him on the cheek. It had been a long time since he'd gotten one of those. I hope you make it through, Harry. Yeah, me too. Bosch stepped out of the elevator into the hallway and headed toward the Department N courtroom. He saw a line of people cordoned off by the courtroom door, people waiting for a spectator seat to possibly open. A couple of reporters were milling about the open door of the press room, but everybody else was at stations watching the trial. Detective Bosch? Bosch turned. Standing in a payphone alcove was Jack McAvoy, the reporter he had met the day before. He stopped. I saw you walk out, and I hoped I'd catch you. I have to get back in there. I know. I just wanted to tell you that it's very important that I talk to you about something. The sooner the better. What are you talking about? What's so important? Well, it's about you. McAvoy stepped out of the alcove so that he was closer to Bosch and didn't have to speak as loud. What about me? Do you know you are under investigation by the sheriff's department? Bosch looked up the hall toward the courtroom door and then back at McAvoy. The reporter was slowly bringing a pad of paper and pen up in his hands. He was ready to take notes. Wait a minute. Bosch put his hand on the notebook. What are you talking about? What investigation? Edward Gunn, you remember him? He's dead and you're their suspect. Bosch just stared at him, his mouth coming slightly open. I wondered if you want to comment on this. You know, defend yourself. I'll be writing a story for next week's edition and wanted you to have the chance to tell your... No. No comment. I have to get back. 
Bosch turned and walked a few paces toward the courtroom door, but then stopped. He walked back to McAvoy, who was writing in the notebook. What are you writing? I didn't say anything. I know. That's what I'm writing. McAvoy looked up from the notebook to him. You said next week, Bosch said. When does it come out? New Times is published every Thursday morning. So until when do I have if I decide to talk to you? About Wednesday lunch, but that won't be pressing it. I won't be able to do much then but drop in some quotes. The time to talk is now. Who told you this? Who's your source? McAvoy shook his head. I can't discuss sources with you. What I want to talk about is this allegation. Did you kill Edward Gunn? Are you some kind of avenging angel? That's what they think. Bosch studied the reporter for a long moment before finally speaking. Don't quote me on this, but fuck you. You know what I mean? I don't know if this is a bullshit bluff or not, but let me give you some advice. You better make damn sure you've got it right before you put anything in that paper of yours. A good investigator always knows the motivation of his sources. It's called having a bullshit meter. Yours better be working real well. He turned and walked quickly to the courtroom door. Langweiser had just finished with the hair specialist when Bosch came back into the courtroom. Once again, folks stood up and reserved the right to recall the witness during the defense case. While the witness came through the gate behind the attorney's lectern, Bosch slipped past him and went to his seat at the prosecution table. He didn't look at or say anything to Langweiser or Kretzler. He folded his arms and looked down at the notepad he'd left on the table. He realized he'd adopted the same position and posture he'd seen David Story take at the defense table the posture of a guilty man. Bosch quickly dropped his arms to his lap and looked up at the seal of the state of California which hung on the wall above the judge's bench. Langweiser got up and called the next witness, a fingerprint technician. His testimony was quick and more corroboration of Bosch's testimony. It went unchallenged by folks. The technician was followed to the stand by the patrol officer who answered the first call from Kremens's roommate and his sergeant, who was the next to arrive. Bosch barely listened to the testimony. There was nothing new in it, and his mind was racing in another direction. He was thinking about McAvoy and the story he was working on. He knew he should inform Langweiser and Kretzler, but wanted time to think about things. He decided to hold off until after the weekend. The victim's roommate, Jane Gilly, was the first witness to appear who was not part of the law enforcement community. She was tearful and sincere in her testimony, confirming details of the investigation already revealed by Bosch, but also adding more personal bits of information. She testified about how excited Jody Kremens had been at the prospect of dating a major Hollywood player and how the both of them had spent the day before her date getting manicures, pedicures, and hairstylings. She paid for me, Gilly testified. That was so sweet. Her testimony put a very human face on what so far had been an almost antiseptic analysis by law enforcement professionals of a murder. When Gilly's examination by Langweiser was concluded, folks finally broke with his pattern, and announced he had a few questions for the witness. He stepped to the lectern without any notes. He clasped his hands behind his back and leaned slightly forward to the microphone. Now, Miss Gilly, your roommate was an attractive young woman, wasn't she? Yes, she was beautiful. And she was popular. In other words, did she date a lot of fellows? Gilly nodded hesitantly. She went out? A lot, a little. How often? It would be hard to say. I wasn't her social secretary, and I have my own boyfriend. I see. Then let's take, say, the ten weeks prior to her death. 
How many of those ten weeks would you say went by without Jody going out on a date? Langweiser stood up and objected. Your Honor, this is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with the night of October 12th going into the morning of the 13th. Ah, but Your Honor, I think it does, folks responded. And I think Ms. Langweiser knows it does. If you allow me a little bit of string here, I will be able to quickly tie it up. Houghton overruled the objection and told folks to ask the question again. In the ten weeks prior to her death, how many weeks went by without Jody Kremens having a date with a man? I don't know. Maybe one, maybe none. Maybe none, folks repeated. And Miss Gilly, how many of those weeks would you say your roommate had at least two dates? Langweiser objected again, but was overruled again. I don't know the answer, Gilly said. A lot of them. A lot of them, folks repeated. Langweiser rose and asked the judge to direct folks not to repeat the witness's answer unless it was in the form of a question. The judge complied, and folks went on as if he'd not been corrected at all. Were these dates all with the same fella? No, different guys, mostly. A few repeats. So she liked to play the field, is that correct? I guess so. Is that a yes or no, Miss Gilly? It's a yes. Thank you. In the ten weeks prior to her death, weeks in which you said she most often had at least two dates, how many different men did she see? Gilly shook her head in exasperation. I have no idea. I didn't count them. Besides, what does this have to do? Thank you, Miss Gilly. I would appreciate it if you would just answer the questions I posed to you. He waited. She said nothing. Now, did Jody ever encounter difficulties when she stopped dating a man, when she moved on to the next? I don't know what you mean. I mean, were all the men happy not to have a return engagement? Sometimes they'd get mad if she didn't want to go out again. Nothing serious. No threats of violence? She wasn't afraid of anyone? Not that she told me about. Did she tell you about every man she dated? No. Now, on these dates, did she often bring the men back to the home you two shared? Sometimes. Did they stay over? Sometimes, I don't know. You often weren't there, is that correct? Yes. I often stayed at my boyfriend's. Why is that? She made a short laugh. Because I love him. Well, did you ever stay together overnight at your home? I don't remember him ever staying over. Why is that? I guess because he lives alone. It was more private. Isn't it true, Miss Gilly, that you stayed overnight several times a week at your boyfriend's home? Sometimes. So what? And that this was because you were unhappy with your roommate's constant procession of overnight guests? Langweiser stood up. Your Honor, that's not even a question. I object to its form and content. Jody Kremen's lifestyle is not on trial here. David's story is on trial for her murder, and it's not fair for the defense to be allowed to go after someone who... Okay, Miss Langweiser, that's enough, Judge Houghton said. He looked over at Folks. Mr. Folks, that's about all the string I'm going to allow you to run with in that direction. Ms. Langweiser makes her point. I want you to move on with this witness. Folks nodded. Barr studied him. He was a perfect actor. In his demeanor, he was able to convey the frustration of a man being pulled back from a hidden truth. He wondered if the jury would see it as an act. Very well, Your Honor he said, putting the frustration into the inflection of his voice. I have no further questions for this witness at this time. The judge adjourned for the afternoon break of fifteen minutes. Bosch ushered Gilly through the reporters, down the elevator and out to her car. He told her she'd done very well and handled folks' cross-examination perfectly. He then joined Kretzler and Langweiser in the second-floor DA's office where the prosecution team had a temporary office during the trial. There was a small coffee maker in the room, and it was half-filled with coffee brewed during the morning break. 
There wasn't enough time for a fresh brew, so they all drank the stale coffee while Kretzler and Langweiser considered the progress of the day. I think the she's a whore defense is going to backfire on them big time, Langweiser said. They have to have more than that. He's just trying to show there were a lot of men, Kretzler said. And it could have been any of them. The shotgun defense. You shoot a lot of pellets, and one's bound to hit the target. It's still not going to work. I'll tell you one thing. With John Reason reserving on all of these wits, we're moving really quickly. He keeps this up. We're going to finish our case Tuesday or Wednesday. Good. I can't wait to see what they've got. I can. Bosch interjected. Langweiser looked at him. Oh, Harry, you've weathered these storms before. Yeah, but I've got a bad feeling about this one. Don't worry about it, Kretzler said. We're going to kick their ass across the courtroom. We're in the tube, man, and we ain't coming out. They put their three styrofoam cups together in a toast. Bosch's current partner, Jerry Edgar, and former partner, Kisman Ryder, testified during the afternoon session. Both were asked by the prosecutors to recall the moments after the search of David Story's home when Bosch got into the car and reported to them that Story had just bragged of committing the crime. Their testimony was solidly in tandem with Bosch's own testimony and would act to buttress the case against defense assaults on Bosch's character. Bosch also knew that the prosecutors hoped to gain additional credence with the jury because both Edgar and Ryder were black. Five members of the jury and two alternates were black. In a time when the veracity of any white police officer in Los Angeles would fall under suspicion by black jurors, having Edgar and Ryder join a line of solidarity with Bosch was a plus. Ryder testified first, and folks passed on cross-examination. Edgar's testimony mirrored hers, but he was asked additional questions because he delivered the second search warrant issued in the case. This one was a court order seeking hair and blood samples from David's story. It was approved and signed by a judge while Bosch was in New York, following the Architectural Digest lead, and Ryder was on a Hawaiian vacation planned before the murder. With a patrol officer in tow, Edgar once again appeared at Story's house at 6 a.m. with the warrant. He testified that Story kept them waiting outside while he contacted his lawyer, who by now was the criminal defense attorney, J. Reason Folks. Once Folks was apprised of the situation, he told Story to cooperate and the suspect was taken to Parker Center in downtown, where samples of his pubic hair, scalp hair, and blood were collected by a lab nurse. Did you at any point during this traveling time and collection process question the defendant about the crime? Kretzler asked. No, I did not, Edgar responded. Before we left his residence, he gave me his phone, and I spoke to Mr. Folks. He told me his client did not wish to be questioned or harassed, as he put it, in any way. So we basically drove in silence, at least on my part. And we didn't talk at Parker Center either. When we were finished, Mr. Folks was there, and he drove Mr. Story home. Did Mr. Story make any unsolicited comments to you during the time he was with you? Just one. And where was that? in the car while we were driving to Parker Center. And what did he say? He was looking out the window and just said, you people are fucked if you think I'm going down for this. And was this piece of conversation tape recorded? Yes, it was. Why is that? Because of his earlier admission to Detective Bosch, we thought there was a chance he might go ahead and make another statement like that. On the day I served the hair and blood warrant, I used a car borrowed from the narcotics unit. It's a car they use for making street buys. It's wired for sound. Did you bring the tape from that day with you, detective? Yes. Kretzler introduced the tape as evidence. Folks objected, 
saying that Edgar had already testified as to what was said and the audio wasn't necessary. Again, the judge overruled, and the tape was played. Kretzler started the tape well before the statement made by Story, so that the jurors would hear the hum of the car engine and traffic noise and know that Edgar did not violate the defendant's rights by questioning him in order to elicit the statement. When the tape came to Story's comment, the tone of arrogance and even hate for his investigators came through loud and clear. Wanting that tone to be what carried the jurors into the weekend, Kretzler ended his questioning of Edgar. Folks, perhaps understanding the ploy, said he would have a brief cross-examination. He proceeded to ask Edgar a series of innocuous questions that added little to the record in favor of the defense or disfavor of the prosecution. At precisely 4.30 p.m., he ended the cross-examination, and Judge Houghton promptly recessed for the weekend. As the courtroom emptied into the hallway, Bosch looked around for McAvoy but didn't see him. Edgar and Ryder, who had hung around after her testimony, came up to him. Harry, how about we go get a drink? Ryder said. How about we go get drunk? Bosch replied. Chapter 28 they waited until 10.30 Saturday morning for their charter clients to arrive, but no one showed. McCaleb was sitting silently on the gunwale in the stern, doing a slow burn over everything. The missing charter, his dismissal from the case, the most recent phone call from J. Winston, everything. Before he'd left the house, Winston had called to apologize for how things had gone the day before. He feigned indifference and told her to forget about it. And he still didn't tell her about Buddy Lockridge overhearing them on the boat two days earlier. When Jay said Twilly and Friedman decided it would be best if he returned the copies of all the documents relating to the case, he told her to tell them they could come get them if they wanted them. He said he had a charter and had to go. They abruptly said goodbyes and hung up. Raymond was bent over the stern fishing with a little spinner reel McCaleb had gotten him after they moved to the island. He was looking through the clear water at the moving shapes of the orange Garibaldi fish twenty feet below. Buddy Lockridge was sitting in the fighting chair reading the metro section of the Los Angeles Times. He seemed as relaxed as a summer wave. McCaleb hadn't yet confronted him with his suspicions that he was the leak. He'd been waiting for the right moment. Hey, Terror, you see this story, Lockridge said, about Bosch giving his testimony yesterday in Van Nuys Court? Nope. Man, what they're hinting at here is that this director's a serial killer. Sounds like one of your old cases. And here the guy on the witness stand putting the finger on him as a... Buddy, I told you, don't talk about that. Or did you forget what I said? Okay, sorry. I was just saying, if this ain't irony, I don't know what is, that's all. Fine, leave it at that. McCaleb checked his watch again. The client should have been there at ten. He straightened up and went to the salon door. I'll make some calls, he said. I don't want to be waiting around all day for these people. At the little chart table in the boat salon, he opened a drawer and took out the clipboard where they attached the charter reservations. There were only two pages on it the current day's charter and a reservation for the following Saturday. The winter months were slow. He looked at the information on the top sheet. He was unfamiliar with it because Buddy had taken the reservation. The charter was for four men from Long Beach. They were supposed to come over Friday night and stay at the Zane Gray. A four-hour charter, ten to two on Saturday, and then they'd take a late ferry back to Overland. Buddy had taken the organizer's home number and the name of the hotel as well as a deposit of half the charter fee. He looked on the list of hotels and phone numbers taped to the chart table and called the Zane Gray first. He quickly learned that no one with the charter organizer's name, the only one of the four names McCaleb had, was staying at the hotel. He then called the man's home number and got his wife. She said her husband wasn't home. Well, we're kind of waiting for him on a boat over here on Catalina. Do you know if he and his friends are on their way? 
There was a long silence. Ma'am, you there? Uh, yes, yes. It's just that they're not going fishing today. They told me they canceled that trip. They're out golfing right now. I can give you my husband's cell phone if you'd like. You could talk. That's not necessary, ma'am. Have a nice day. But Caleb closed his phone. He knew exactly what had happened. Neither he nor Buddy had checked the answering service that handled calls to the phone number they'd placed on their charter ads in various phone books and fishing publications. He called the number now, punched in the code, and sure enough, there had been a message waiting since Wednesday. The party canceled the charter. They'd reschedule later. Yeah, sure, McCaleb said. He erased the message and closed the phone. He felt like throwing it through the glass slider at Buddy's head, but he tried to calm himself. He walked into the little galley and got a quart carton of orange juice out of the cooler. He took it out with him to the stern. No charter today, he said before taking a long drink from the carton. Why not? Raymond asked, his disappointment obvious. McCaleb wiped his mouth on the sleeve of his long sleeve t shirt. They canceled. Lockridge looked up from the newspaper, and McCaleb hit him with a laser stare. Well, we keep the deposit, right? Buddy asked. I took a two hundred dollar deposit on Visa. No, we don't keep the deposit, because they canceled on Wednesday. We've both been too busy, I guess, to check the charter line like we're supposed to. Ah, fuck! That's my fault! Buddy, not in front of the boy. How many times do I have to tell you that? Sorry, sorry! McCaleb continued to stare at him. He hadn't wanted to talk about the leak to McAvoy until after the charter, because he needed Buddy's help running a four-man fishing party. Now it didn't matter. Now was the time. Raymond, he said while still staring at Lockridge, do you still want to earn your money? Yeah. You mean yes, don't you? Yeah, I mean yes, yes. Okay, then reel in, hook your line, and start taking these rods in and put them in the rack. Can you do that? Sure. The boy quickly reeled in his line, took off his bait, and threw it into the water. He attached the hook to one of the rod's eyelets and then leaned it in the corner of the stern so he could take it home with him. He liked to practice his casting technique on the rear deck of the house, dropping a rubber practice weight onto the roofs and backyards below. Raymond started taking the deep-sea rods out of the holders, where Buddy had placed them in preparation for the charter. Two by two, he took them into the salon and put them in the overhead racks. He had to stand on the couch to do it, but it was an old couch in dire need of a new slipcover, and McCaleb didn't care about it. Something wrong, Tara? Buddy tried. It's just a charter, man. We knew it was going to be slow this month. It's not the charter, bud. Then what? The case? McCaleb took a smaller gulp of juice and put the carton down on the gunnel. You mean the case I'm not on anymore? I guess. I don't know. You're not on it anymore. When did that... No, buddy. I'm not on it. And there's something I want to talk to you about. He waited for Raymond to move another set of rods into the salon. You ever read the New Times, buddy? You mean that free weekly? Yeah, that free weekly. The New Times, buddy. Comes out every Thursday. There's always a stack in the laundry building at the marina. In fact, why am I asking this? I know you read the New Times. Lockridge's eyes suddenly fell to the deck. He looked crestfallen with guilt. He brought one hand up and rubbed his face. He kept it over his eyes when he spoke. Terry, I'm sorry. I never thought it would get back to you. What happened? What's the matter, Uncle Buddy? It was Raymond in the door of the salon. Raymond, would you go inside and close that door for a few minutes? McCaleb said. You can put on the TV. I need to talk to Buddy by myself. The boy hesitated, staring the whole time at Buddy covering his face. Raymond, please, and take this back to the cooler. The boy finally stepped out and took the orange juice carton. He went back in and slid the door closed. McCaleb looked back at Lockridge. 
How could you not think it would get back to me? I don't know. I just thought nobody would know. Well, you were wrong. And it's caused me a lot of trouble. But most of all, it's a fucking betrayal, buddy. I just can't believe you would do something like this. McCaleb glanced at the glass door to make sure the boy wasn't in earshot. There was no sign of Raymond. He must have gone down to one of the staterooms. McCaleb realized his breathing was way up. He was so angry he was hyperventilating. He had to end this and calm down. Does Graciella have to know about it? Buddy asked in a pleading voice. I don't know. It doesn't matter what she knows. What matters is that we had this relationship and then you do something like this behind my back. Lockridge still hid his eyes behind his hand. I just didn't think it would mean that much to you, even if you found out. It was no big deal. I'm... Don't try to mitigate it or tell me what kind of deal it is, okay? Don't even talk to me in that pleading, whiny voice. Just shut up. McCaleb walked to the stern, pressing his thighs against the padded combing. His back to Lockridge, he looked up the hillside above the commercial part of the little town. He could see his house. Graciella was on the deck holding the baby. She waved and then held Cielo's hand up in a baby wave. McCaleb waved back. What do you want me to do? Buddy said from behind him. His voice was more controlled now. What do you want me to say? I won't do it again. Fine, I won't do it again. But Caleb didn't turn around. He continued looking up at his wife and his daughter. It doesn't matter what you won't do again. The damage is done. I have to think about this. We're partners as well as friends. Or we were, at least. All I want now is for you to just go. I'm going inside with Raymond. Take the skiff and go back to the pier. Take a ferry back tonight. I just don't want you around here, buddy. Not now. How will you guys get back to the pier? It was a desperate question with an obvious answer. I'll call the water taxi. But we've got a charter next Saturday. It's five people, and I'll worry about Saturday when I come to it. I can cancel it if I have to, or turn it over to Jim Hall's charter. Terry... Are you sure about this? All I did was, I'm sure. Go on, buddy. I don't want to talk anymore. McCaleb turned from the view and walked past Lockridge and out to the salon door. He opened it and stepped in, then slid the door closed behind him. He didn't look back at Buddy. He went to the chart table and got an envelope out of the drawer. He slipped a five-dollar bill from his pocket into it, sealed it, and wrote Raymond's name on it. Hey, Raymond, where are you? He called out. For dinner, they had grilled cheese sandwiches and chili. The chili was from the Busy Bee. McCaleb had picked it up on his way up from the boat with Raymond. McCaleb sat across the table from his wife with Raymond to his left and the baby to his right in a jumper seat perched on the table. They were eating inside as an evening fog had enshrouded the island in a chilly grip. McCaleb remained morosely quiet through the meal, as he'd been through much of the day. When they'd come back early, Graciella decided to keep her distance. She took Raymond for a hike in the Wrigley Botanical Garden in Avalon Canyon. McCaleb was left with the baby who fussed most of the day. He didn't mind, though. It took his mind off of things. Finally, at dinner, there was no avoiding each other. McCaleb had made the sandwiches, so he was the last to sit down. He'd barely begun eating when Graciella asked him what his trouble was. Nothing, he said. I'm fine. Raymond said you and Buddy had an argument. Maybe Raymond should mind his own business. He looked at the boy as he said this, and Raymond looked down at his food. That's not fair, Terry, Graciella said. She was right. McCaleb knew it. He reached over and tousled the boy's hair. It was so soft. He liked doing it. He hoped the gesture conveyed his apology. I'm off the case because Buddy leaked it to a reporter. What? We came up, I came up, with a suspect, a cop. Buddy overheard me telling Jay Winston about my findings. He turned around and told a reporter. The reporter turned around and started making calls. Jay and her captain think I was the leak. That doesn't make sense. Why would Buddy do that? I don't know. 
He didn't say. Actually, he did say. He said he didn't think I'd care or that it mattered. Words to that effect. That was today on the boat. He gestured toward Raymond, meaning this was the tense conversation he had caught part of and told Graciela about. Well, did you call Jay and tell her it was him? No, it doesn't matter. It came through me. I was dumb enough to let him on the boat. Can we talk about something else? I'm tired of thinking and talking about this. Fine, Terry. What else do you want to talk about? He was silent. She was silent. After a long moment, he started to laugh. I can't think of anything right now. Graciela finished eating a bite of her sandwich. McCaleb looked over at Cielo, who was looking at a blue and white ball that was suspended over her on a wire attached to the side of her bouncer seat. She was trying to reach for it with her tiny hands, but couldn't quite make it. McCaleb could see her getting frustrated, and he understood the feeling. Raymond, tell your father what you saw today in the gardens, Graciela said. She had recently begun referring to McCaleb as Raymond's father. They had adopted him, but McCaleb didn't want to put any pressure on the boy to think of or refer to him as his father. Raymond usually called him Terry. We saw a Channel Islands fox, he said now. It was hunting in the canyon. I thought foxes hunted at night and slept during the day. Well, somebody woke him up then, because we saw him. He was big. Graciela nodded, confirming the sighting. Pretty cool, McCaleb said. Too bad you didn't get a picture. They ate in silence for a few minutes. Graciela used her napkin to clean spittle off the baby's chin. Anyway, McCaleb said, I'm sure you're happy that I'm off it and things will be normal around here again. Graciela looked at him. I want you to be safe. I want the whole family to be together and safe. That's what makes me happy, Terry. He nodded and finished his sandwich. She continued. I want you to be happy. But if that means working these cases, then that's a conflict with your personal well-being as far as your health is concerned and the well-being of this family. Well, you don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't think anybody will come calling on me again after this. He got up to clear the table, but before picking up plates, he leaned over his daughter's chair and bent the wire so that the blue and white ball would be within her reach. It's not supposed to be like that, Graciela said. McCaleb looked at her. Yes, it is. Chapter 29 McCaleb stayed up into the early morning hours with the baby. He and Graciela alternated nights on duty so that at least one of them got a decent night of sleep. Cielo seemed to have an almost hourly feed clock. Each time she awoke, he would feed her and walk her through the dark house. He would gently pat her back until he heard her burp, and then he would put her down again. In an hour, the process would begin again. After each cycle, McCaleb would walk through the house and check the doors. It was a nervous habit, his routine. The house, by virtue of being up on the hillside, was fogged in tight. Looking through the rear windows, he couldn't even see the lights of the pier down below. He wondered if the fog stretched across the bay to overland. Harry Bosch's house was up high. He wondered if he was standing at his window, looking into the misty nothingness as well. In the morning... Graciela took the baby, and McCaleb, exhausted from the night and everything else, slept until eleven. When he came to, he found the house to be quiet. In his T-shirt and boxer shorts, he wandered down the hall and found the kitchen and family room empty. Graciela had left a note on the kitchen table saying she'd taken the children to St. Catherine's for the ten o'clock service, and then to the market afterward. The note said they'd be back by noon. McCaleb went to the refrigerator and got out the gallon jug of orange juice. He poured a full glass and then took his keys off the counter and went back into the hallway to the locking cabinet. He opened it up and got out a plastic Ziploc bag containing a morning dose of the drug therapy that kept him alive. The first of every month, he and Graciela carefully put together the doses and put them in plastic bags marked with dates and whether they were the AM or PM dosage. It made it easier than having to open dozens of pill bottles twice a day. 
He took the bag back to the kitchen and began taking the pills two and three at a time with gulps of juice. As he followed this routine, he looked through the kitchen window and down to the harbor below. The fog had moved out. It was still misty, but clear enough for him to see the following sea and a skiff tied at its fantail. He went to one of the kitchen drawers and pulled out the set of binoculars Graciela liked to use when she was watching him on the boat heading in or out of the harbor with a charter party. He went out onto the deck and to the railing. He focused the binoculars. There was no one in the cockpit or up on the bridge of the boat. His view couldn't penetrate the mirrored sliding door of the salon. He moved his focus to the skiff. It was weathered green with a one-and-a-half horse outboard. He recognized it as being one of the rentals from the concession on the pier. McCaleb went back inside and left the binoculars on the counter while he swiped the remaining pills into his hand. He took them and the orange juice back to the bedroom. He quickly ingested the pills while he got dressed. He knew Buddy Lockridge would not have rented a boat to get to the following sea. Buddy knew which Zodiac was McCaleb's and would have simply borrowed that. Somebody else was on his boat. It took him twenty minutes to walk down to the pier because Graciela had the golf cart. He went to the boat rental booth first to ask who'd rented the boat, but the window was closed and there was a sign with a clock face that said the operator would not be back until twelve-thirty. McCaleb checked his watch. It was ten after twelve. He couldn't wait. He went down the ramp to the skiff dock and stepped onto his Zodiac and started the engine. As McCaleb moved down the fairway toward the following sea, he studied the side windows of the salon but still couldn't see any movement or indication that someone was on the boat. He cut the engine on the Zodiac when he was twenty-five yards away, and the inflatable skiff glided the rest of the way silently. He unzipped the pocket of his windbreaker and removed the Glock 17, his service weapon, from his time with the Bureau. The Zodiac bumped lightly into the fantail next to the rental skiff. McCaleb first looked into the skiff, but saw nothing other than a life vest and a flotation cushion. Nothing that indicated who'd rented the boat. He stepped onto the fantail and, while crouched behind the stern, wrapped the Zodiac's line around one of the rear cleats. He looked over the transom and only saw himself in the mirrored sliding door. He knew he would have to approach the door not knowing if there would be someone on the other side watching him come in. He crouched down again and looked around. He wondered if he should retreat and come back with the harbor patrol boat. After a moment he decided against it. He glanced up the hill at his house and then raised himself and swung his body over the transom. With the gun carried low and hidden behind his hip, he walked to the door and looked down at the lock. There was no damage or indication it had been tampered with. He pulled the handle and the door slid open. McCaleb was sure he'd locked it the day before when leaving with Raymond. He stepped inside. The salon was empty, no sign of intruder or burglary. He slid the door closed behind him and listened. The boat was silent. There was the sound of water lapping against the outside surfaces, and that was it. His eyes moved toward the steps leading to the lower deck staterooms and the head. He moved that way, raising the gun in front of him now. On the second of the four steps down, McCaleb hit a cracked board that sighed with his weight. He froze and listened for a response. There was only silence and the relentless sound of water against the sides of the boat. At the bottom of the stairs was a short hallway with three doors. Directly ahead was the forward stateroom, which had been converted into an office and file storage room. To the right was the master stateroom. To the left was the head. The door to the master stateroom was closed, and McCaleb couldn't remember if it had been that way when he'd left the boat twenty-four hours earlier. The door to the head was wide open and hooked on the inside wall so it wouldn't swing and slam when the boat was moving. The office door was partially open and swaying slightly with the movement of the boat. 
There was a light on inside the room, and McCaleb could tell it was the light over the desk, which was built into the lower berth of a set of bunk beds to the left of the door. McCaleb decided he would check the head first, followed by the office, and then the master last. As he approached the head, he realized that he smelled cigarette smoke. The head was empty, and too small to be used as a hiding place anyway. As he turned toward the office door and raised his weapon, a voice called out from within. Come on in, Terry. He recognized the voice. He cautiously stepped forward and used his free hand to push open the door. He kept the gun raised. The door swung open, and there was Harry Bosch sitting at the desk, his body in a relaxed posture, leaning back and looking toward the door. Both his hands were in sight. Both were empty except for the unlit cigarette between two fingers of his right hand. McCaleb slowly moved into the small room, still holding the gun up, and aimed at Bosch. You're going to shoot me? You want to be my accuser and my executioner? This is breaking and entering. Then I guess that makes us even. What are you talking about? That little dance at my place the other night, what do you call that? Harry, I got a couple more questions about the case. Only you never asked any real questions, did you? Instead, you take a look at my wife's picture and ask about that. And you ask about the picture in the hallway. And you drink my beer. And oh yeah, you tell me all about finding God in your baby daughter's blue eyes. So what do you call all of that, Terry? Bosch casually turned the chair and glanced over his shoulder at the desk. McCaleb looked past him and saw his own laptop computer was open and turned on. On the screen, he could see that Bosch had called up the file containing the notes for the profile he was going to compose until everything changed the day before. It feels like breaking and entering to me, Bosch said, his eyes on the screen. Maybe worse. In Bosch's new posture, the leather bomber jacket he was wearing fell open, and McCaleb could see the pistol holstered on his hip. He continued to hold his own weapon up and ready. Bosch looked back at him. I didn't get a chance to look at all of this yet. Looks like a lot of notes and analysis. Probably all first-rate stuff, knowing you. Or somehow, some way, you got it wrong, McCaleb. I'm not the guy. McCaleb slowly slid back into the lower berth of the opposite set of bunks. He held the gun with a little less precision now. He sensed there was no immediate danger from Bosch. If he'd wanted to, he could have ambushed him as he'd come in. You shouldn't be here, Harry. You shouldn't be talking to me. I know. Anything I say can and will be used against me in a court of law. But who am I going to talk to? You put the bead on me. I want it off. Well, you're too late. I'm off the case. And you don't want to know who's on it. Bosch just stared at him and waited. The Bureau's Civil Rights Division. You think internal affairs has been a pain in your ass? These people live and breathe for one thing, taking scalps. And an LAPD scalp is worth more than Boardwalk and Park Place put together. How'd that happen? The reporter? But Caleb nodded. I guess that means he talked to you, too. Bosch nodded. Tried to. Yesterday. Bosch looked around himself, noticed the cigarette in his hand, and put it in his mouth. You mind if I smoke? You already have been. Bosch pulled a lighter out of his jacket pocket and lit the cigarette. He pulled the trash can out from beneath the desk and next to his seat to be used as an ashtray. Can't seem to quit these. Addictive personality. A good and bad attribute in a detective. Yeah, whatever. He took a hit off the cigarette. We've known each other for, what is it, ten, twelve years? More or less. We work cases, and you don't work a case with somebody without taking some kind of measure. Know what I mean? McCaleb didn't answer. Bosch flicked the cigarette on the side of the trash can. And you know what bothers me? Even more than the accusation itself? 
It's that it came from you. It's how and why you could think this. You know, what was the measure you took of me that allowed you to make this jump? McCaleb gestured with both hands as if to say the answer was obvious. People change. If there was anything I learned about people from my job, it's that any one of us are capable of anything given the right circumstances, the right pressures, the right motives, the right moment. That's all psycho bullshit. It doesn't. Bosch's sentence trailed off and he didn't finish. He looked back at the computer and the paper spread across the desk. He pointed the cigarette at the laptop screen. You talk about darkness. A darkness more than night. What about it? When I was overseas. He dragged deeply on the cigarette and exhaled, tilting his head back and shooting the smoke toward the ceiling. I was put into the tunnels. And let me tell you, you want darkness? That was darkness. Down in there. Sometimes you couldn't see your fucking hand three inches in front of your face. It was so dark it hurt your eyes from straining to see just anything. Anything at all. He took another long hit off the cigarette. McCaleb studied Bosch's eyes. They were staring blankly at the memory. Then suddenly he was back. He reached down and ground the half-finished cigarette into the inside edge of the can and dropped it in. This is my way of trying to quit. I smoke these shitty menthol things and never more than half at a time. I'm down to about a pack a week. It's not going to work. I know. He looked up at McCaleb and smiled crookedly, in sort of an apologetic way. Quickly, his eyes changed, and he moved back to his story. And then sometimes it wasn't that dark down there in the tunnels. Somehow there was just enough light to make your way. And the thing is, I never knew where it came from. It was like it was trapped down there with the rest of us. My buddies and me, we called it Lost Light. It was lost, but we found it. McCaleb waited, but that was all Bosch said. What are you telling me, Harry? That you missed something. I don't know what it is, but you missed something. He held McCaleb with his dark eyes. He reached back to the desk and picked up the stack of copied documents from Jay Winston. He tossed them across the small room onto McCaleb's lap. McCaleb made no move to catch them and they spilled to the floor in a jumble. Look again. You missed something, and what you did see added up to me. Go back in and find the missing piece. It will change the addition. I told you, man, I'm off it. I'm putting you back on it. It was said with a tone of permanence, as if there was no choice for McCaleb. You've got till Wednesday. That's writer's deadline. You have to stop his story with the truth. You don't, and you know what Jay Reason folks will do with it. They sat in silence for a long moment looking at each other. McCaleb had met and talked with dozens of killers in his time as a profiler. Few of them readily admitted their crimes. So in that, Bosch was no different. But the intensity with which he stared unblinkingly at him was something McCaleb had never seen before in any man, guilty or innocent. Stories killed two women, and those are just the two we know about. He's the monster you spent your life chasing, McCaleb. And now, and now you're giving him the key that unlocks the door to the cage. He gets out, he'll do it again. You know his kind. You know he will. McCaleb could not compete with Bosch's eyes. He looked down at the gun in his hands. What made you think I would listen? That I would do this? He asked. Like I said, you take somebody's measure. I got yours, McCaleb. You'll do this. Or the monster you set free will haunt you the rest of your life. 
If God is really in your daughter's eyes, how will you be able to look at her again? McCaleb unconsciously nodded and immediately wondered what he was doing. I remember. You once told me something, Bosch said. You said, if God is in the details, so is the devil. Meaning, the person you're looking for is usually right there in front of us, hiding in the details all the time. I always remember that. It still helps me. McCaleb nodded again. He looked down at the documents on the floor. Listen, Harry, you should know. I was convinced about this when I took it to Jay. I'm not sure I can be turned the other way. If you want help, I'm probably the wrong one to go to. Bosch shook his head and smiled. That's exactly why you're the right one. If you can be convinced, the world can be convinced. Yeah? Where were you on New Year's Eve? Why don't we start with that? Bosch shook his shoulders. Home. Alone? Bosch shook his shoulders again and didn't answer. He stood up to go. He put his hands in the pockets of his jacket. He went through the narrow door first and up the steps to the salon. McCaleb followed, now holding the gun at his side. Bosch slid the door open with his shoulder. As he stepped out onto the cockpit, he looked up at the cathedral of the hillside. Then he looked at McCaleb. So all that talk at my place about finding God's hand, was that bullshit? Interview technique or something? A statement designed to get a response that could fit into a profile? McCaleb shook his head. No, no bullshit. Good. I was hoping it wasn't. Bosch climbed over the transom to the fantail. He untied his rental boat and got in and sat down on the rear bench. Before starting the engine, he looked once more at McCaleb and pointed to the back of the boat. The following sea. What's that mean? My father named the boat. It was his originally. The following sea is the wave that comes up behind you, that hits you before you see it coming. I guess he named the boat as a sort of warning. You know, always watch your back. Bosch nodded. Overseas. We used to tell each other, watch six. Now McCaleb nodded. Same thing. They were silent a moment. Bosch put his hand on the boat motor's pull handle, but didn't start the engine. You know the history of this place, Terry? I'm talking about back before the missionaries came. No, do you? A little. I used to read a lot of history books. When I was a kid, Whatever they had in the library, I liked local history. L.A. mostly and California. I just like reading it. We took a field trip here from the youth hall once, so I read up on it. McCaleb nodded. The Indians that lived out here, the Gabrielinos, were sun worshippers, Bosch said. The missionaries came and changed all of that. In fact, they were the ones who called them. Gabrielinos. They called themselves something else, but I don't remember what it was. But before all that happened, they'd been here, and they worshipped the sun. It was so important to life on the island, I guess they figured it had to be a god. Michaela watched Bosch's dark eyes scan across the harbor. And the mainland Indians thought of the ones out here as these fierce wizards who could control weather and waves through worship and sacrifices to their god. I mean, they had to be fierce and strong to be able to cross the bay so they could trade their pottery and seal skins on the mainland. McCaleb studied Bosch, trying to get a bead on the message he was sure the detective was trying to convey. What are you saying, Harry? Bosch shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. I guess I'm saying that people find God where they need him to be. In the sun, in a new baby's eyes, in a new heart. He looked at McCaleb, 
his eyes as dark and as unreadable as the painted owls. And some people, McCaleb began, find their salvation in truth, in justice, in that which is righteous. Now Bosch nodded and offered his crooked smile again. That sounds good. He turned and started the engine with one pull. He then mock-saluted McCaleb and pulled away, angling the rental boat back toward the pier. Not knowing the etiquette of the harbor, he cut across the fairway and between unused mooring buoys. He didn't look back. McCaleb watched him all the way. A man all alone on the water in an old wooden boat. And in that thought came a question. Was he thinking about Bosch or himself? Chapter 30 On the ferry ride back, Bosch bought a Coke at the concession stand and hoped it would settle his stomach and prevent seasickness. He asked one of the stewards where the steadiest ride on the boat was, and he was directed to one of the middle seats on the inside. He sat down and drank some of the Coke, then pulled the folded pages he'd printed in McCaleb's office out of his jacket pocket. He'd printed two files before he'd seen McCaleb approaching in the Zodiac. One was titled Scene Profile, and the other was called Subject Profile. He'd folded them into his jacket and disconnected the portable printer from the laptop before McCaleb entered the boat. He'd only had time to glance at them on the computer and now began a thorough reading. He took the scene profile first. There was only one page. It was incomplete and appeared to be simply a listing of McCaleb's rough notes and impressions from the crime scene video. Still, it gave an insight into how McCaleb worked. It showed how his observations of a scene turned into observations about a suspect. Scene. One. Ligature. Two. Nude. Three. Head wound. Four. Tape slash gag. Cave. Five. Bucket. Six. Owl. Watching over. Highly organized. Detail-oriented. Statement. The scene is his statement. He was there. He watched the owl. Exposure equals... Victim humiliation equals victim hatred, contempt. Bucket, remorse. Killer, prior knowledge of victim. Personal knowledge, previous interaction. Personal hatred. Killer inside the wire. What is the statement? Bosch reread the page and then thought about it. Though he didn't have full knowledge of the crime scene from which McCaleb's notes were drawn, he was impressed by the leaps in logic McCaleb had made. He'd carefully gone down the ladder to the point that he concluded that Gunn's killer was someone he knew, that it was someone who would be found inside the perimeter wire that circled Gunn's existence. It was an important distinction to make in any case. Investigative priorities were usually set upon the determination of whether the suspect being sought had intersected with the victim only at the point of the killing or before. McCaleb's read on the nuances of the scene were that the killer was someone known to Gunn, that there was a prelude to this final and fatal crossing of killer and victim. The second page continued the listing of shorthand notes that Bosch assumed McCaleb planned to turn into a fleshed-out profile. As he read, he realized that some of the word groupings were phrases McCaleb had taken from him. Suspect Bosch Institutional, Youth Hall, Vietnam, LAPD Outsider, Alienation Obsessive, Compulsive Eyes, lost, loss. Mission man, avenging angel. The big wheel always turning, nobody walks away. What goes around comes around. Alcohol, 
divorce, wife, why? Alienation slash obsession. Mother. Cases. Justice system, bullshit. Carriers of the plague. Guilt. Harry equals Hieronymus. Owl equals evil. Evil equals gun. Death of evil equals release stressors. Paintings, demons, devils, evil. Darkness and light, the edge. Punishment. Mother, justice, gun. God's hand, police, Bosch. Punishment equals God's work. A darkness more than night, Bosch. Bosch wasn't sure how to interpret the notes. His eyes were drawn to the last line, and he repeatedly read it, unsure what it was that McCaleb was saying about him. After a while, he carefully folded the page closed and sat still for a long moment. It felt somehow surrealistic to be sitting there on the boat, having just tried to interpret someone else's notes and reasons as to why he should be considered a murder suspect. He felt himself getting queasy and realized he might be getting seasick. He gulped down the rest of the coke and got up. He put the pages back into his jacket pocket. Bosch headed toward the front of the boat and pushed through the heavy door to the bow. The cool air blasted him immediately. He could see the dim outline of the mainland in the distance. He kept his eyes on the horizon and breathed in deeply. In a few minutes, he started feeling better. Chapter 31 McCaleb sat on the old couch in the salon thinking about his encounter with Bosch for a long time. It was the first time in all his experiences as an investigator that a murder suspect had come to him to enlist his aid. He had to decide if it had been the act of a desperate or sincere man, or possibly something else. What if McCaleb hadn't noticed the rental skiff and come to the boat? Would Bosch have waited for him? He went down to the front stateroom and looked at the documents spread on the floor. He wondered if Bosch had intentionally tossed them so that they would fall to the floor and become mixed up. Had Bosch taken something? He went to the desk and studied his laptop. It was not attached to the printer, but he knew that didn't mean anything. He closed the file that was on the screen and opened the print manager window. He clicked the jobs file and saw that two files had been printed that day, the scene and suspect profiles. Bosch had taken them. McCaleb imagined Bosch riding on the express back across, sitting by himself, and reading what McCaleb had written about him. It made him feel uncomfortable. He didn't think any suspect he'd ever profiled had read the report McCaleb had put together on him. He shook it off and decided to occupy his mind with something else. He slid off the chair to his knees and began picking up the murder book reports putting them into a neat pile first before worrying about putting them back in order. Once he had the mess cleaned up, he sat down at the desk, the reports in a squared-off pile in front of him. McCaleb took a blank page of typing paper out of a drawer and wrote on it with the thick black marker he used for labeling cardboard boxes containing his files. You missed something. He took a piece of tape off a dispenser on the desk, and taped the page to the wall behind the desk. He looked at it for a long time. Everything Bosch had said to him came down to that one line. He now had to decide if it was true, if it was possible, or if it was the last manipulation of a desperate man. He heard his cell phone begin to chirp. It was in his jacket pocket, which he'd left on the couch in the salon, he hustled up the stairs and grabbed the jacket. When he reached into the pocket, his hand closed around his gun. He then tried the other pocket and got the phone. It was Graciella. We're home, she said. I thought you'd be here. I thought maybe we could all go down to lunch at El Encanto. Um, 
McCaleb didn't want to leave the office or his thoughts about Bosch. But the last week had strained things with Graciella. He needed to talk to her about that, about how he saw things changing. Tell you what, he finally said. I'm just finishing some stuff here. Why don't you take the kids down, and I'll meet you there? He looked at his watch. It was quarter of one. Is one thirty too late? Fine, she said abruptly. What stuff? Oh, just, I'm sort of wrapping up this thing for Jay. I thought you told me you were off it. I am, but I have all the reports, and I wanted to write up my final, you know. Just wrap it up. Don't be late, Terry. She said it with a tone that implied he would miss more than his lunch if he was. I won't. I'll see you there. He closed the phone and went back down to the office. He looked at his watch again. He had about a half hour before he'd have to get on the skiff and go back to the pier. The El Encanto was about a five-minute walk from there. It was one of the few restaurants that remained open on the island during the winter months. He sat down and started putting the stack of investigative documents in order. It was not a difficult task. Each page had a date stamp on the upper right-hand corner. But McCaleb stopped almost as soon as he started. He looked up at the message he had taped on the wall. He decided that if he was going to look for something he had not noticed before, that he had missed, he should come at the information from another angle. He decided not to put the documents in their correct order. Instead, he would read them in the random order they were now in. Doing it this way, he would avoid thinking about the flow of the investigation and how one step followed the other. He would simply have each report to consider as a single piece of the puzzle. It was a simple mind trick, but he'd done it before on cases with the Bureau. Sometimes it shook something new out, something he had previously missed. He checked his watch again and began with the first document on the pile. It was the autopsy protocol. Chapter 32 McCaleb walked briskly to the front steps of the El Encanto. He saw his golf cart parked at the curb. Mostly the carts on the island looked the same but he could identify his because of the baby seat with the pink and white cushioning. His family was still here. He went up the steps, and the hostess, recognizing him as a local, pointed to the table where his family was seated. He hurried over and pulled out a chair next to Graciela. They were close to being finished. He noticed that the waitress had already left the check on the table. Sorry I'm late. He took a chip out of the basket at the center of the table and dragged it through the salsa and guacamole bowls before shoving it into his mouth. Graciela looked at her watch and then pierced him with her deep brown eyes. He weathered it and got ready for the next one, which he surely knew was coming. I can't stay. She loudly put her fork down on her plate. She was finished. Terry, I know, I know. But something's come up. I have to go across tonight. What could have possibly come up? You're off the case. It's Sunday. People are watching football, not running around trying to solve murders that they're not even asked to. She pointed to a television mounted in the upper corner of the room. Three talking heads with thick necks sat at a counter with a football field behind them. McCaleb knew that the day's game would determine the Super Bowl contenders. He couldn't care less, though he did suddenly remember he'd promised Raymond that they would watch at least one of the games together. I've been asked, Graciela. What are you talking about? You said they asked you off the case. He told her about discovering Bosch on the boat that morning and what he'd asked McCaleb to do. And this is the guy you told Jay probably did it? McCaleb nodded. How do you know where you lived? He didn't. He knew about the boat, not where we live. You don't have to worry about that. I think I do. Terry, you're going too far with this, and you're going completely blind to the dangers to yourself and your family. I think... Really? I think... He stopped and reached into his pocket and pulled out two quarters. He turned to Raymond. Raymond, are you finished eating? 
Yeah. You mean yes? Yes. Okay, take these. Go play the video machine over there by the bar. The boy took the quarters. You're excused. Raymond hesitantly hopped down and then trotted into the next room where there were tabletop video games that they'd played before. He chose a game McCaleb knew was Pac-Man and sat down. He was not out of McCaleb's sight. McCaleb looked back at Graciela, who had her purse up on her lap and was taking money out and putting it down on the check. Graciela, forget about that. Look at me. She finished with the money and pushed her wallet back into the purse. She looked at him. We have to go. Cece has to take her nap. The baby was in her bouncing chair on the table, one hand grasping the blue and white ball on the wire. She's fine. She can sleep right there. Just listen to me for a minute. He waited, and she put a conceding look on her face. All right. Say what you have to say, and then I have to leave. McCaleb turned and leaned close to Graciela so that his words would be heard only by her. He noticed the edge of one of her ears poking through her hair. We're heading toward a big problem here, aren't we? Graciela nodded, and immediately the tears came down her cheeks. It was as if his saying the words out loud had knocked down the thin defensive mechanism she'd constructed inside to protect herself and her marriage. McCaleb pulled the unused napkin out from beneath his silverware setting and handed it to her. He then put his hand on the back of her neck and pulled her toward him and kissed her on the cheek. Over the top of her head he saw Raymond watching them with a scared look on his face. We've talked about this, Gracie, he began. You have it in your head that we can't have our home and our family and everything else if this is what I do. The problem is in that word, if. That's the mistake here because there is no if here. It's not if this is what I do. It is what I do. And I've gone too long thinking otherwise, trying to convince myself of something else. More tears came, and she held the napkin to her face. She cried silently, but Michaela was sure people in the restaurant had noticed, and were watching them instead of the television above them. He checked on Raymond and saw the boy was back to playing the video game. I know, Graciela managed to say. He was surprised by her acknowledgement. He took it as a good sign. So then what do we do? I'm not talking about just now and this case. I mean, for now and forever. What do we do? Gracie, I'm tired of trying to be what I'm not and of ignoring the thing inside that I know is what I'm truly all about. It took this case to finally make me realize it and admit it to myself. She didn't say anything. He wasn't expecting her to. You know how I love you and the kids. That's not the issue. I think I can have both, and you think I can't. You've adopted this one or the other attitude, and I don't think it's right or fair. He knew his words were hurting her. He was drawing a line. One of them had to capitulate. He was saying it wasn't going to be him. Look, let's think about this. This isn't a good place to talk. What I'm going to do is finish my work on this thing, and then we'll sit down and talk about our future. Is that okay? She slowly nodded, but didn't look at him. You do what you have to do. She said in a tone McCaleb knew would make him feel guilty forever. I just hope you'll be careful. He pulled himself over and kissed her again. I've got too much here with you not to be. He got up and came around the table to the baby. He kissed her on the top of the head and then unhitched the chair's safety belt and lifted her out. I'll take her down to the cart, he said. Why don't you get Raymond? He carried the baby down to the cart and secured her in the safety seat. He put her bouncing chair in the rear storage compartment. Graciela came down with Raymond a few minutes later. Her eyes were swollen from the crying. Michaela put his hand on Raymond's shoulder and walked him to the front passenger seat. Raymond, 
You're going to have to watch the second game without me. I have some work I have to do. I can go with you. I can help you. No, it's not a charter. I know, but I can still help you. But Caleb knew Graciela was looking at him, and he felt the guilt like the sun on his back. Thanks, but maybe next time, Raymond. Put on your seatbelt. Once the boy was safely in, McCaleb stepped back from the cart. He looked at Graciela, who was no longer looking at him. Okay, he said. I'll be back as soon as I can, and I'll have the phone with me if you want to call. Graciela didn't acknowledge him. She pulled the cart away from the curb and headed up Marilla Avenue. He watched them until they were out of sight. Chapter 33 On the walk back to the pier, his cell phone chirped. It was Jay Winston returning his call. She was talking very quietly and said she was calling from her mother's house. McCaleb had difficulty hearing, so he sat down on one of the benches along the casino walk. He leaned forward with his elbows on his knees, one hand holding the phone tightly to one ear, his other hand clasped over the other. We missed something he said. I missed something. Terry, what are you talking about? In the murder book, in Gunn's arrest record, he was... Terry, what are you doing? You're off the case. Says who? The FBI? I don't work for them anymore, Jay. Then says me. I don't want you getting any further... I don't work for you either, Jay. Remember? There was a long silence on the phone. Terry, I don't know what you're doing, but it's got to stop. You have no authority, no standing in this case anymore. If those guys, Twilly and Friedman, find out you're still snooping around on this, they can arrest you for interference, and you know they're just the type that will. You want standing? I have standing. What? I withdrew my authorization to you yesterday. You can't use me on this. McCaleb hesitated and then decided to tell her. I have standing. I guess you could say I'm working for the accused. Now Winston's silence was even longer. Finally she spoke, her words delivered very slowly. Are you telling me that you went to Bosch with this? No, he came to me. He showed up on my boat this morning. I was right about the other night, the coincidence. Me showing up at his place, then the call from his partner about you. He put it together. The reporter from the New Times called him, too. He knew what was going on without me having to tell him a thing. The point is, Jay, none of that matters. What matters is that I think I jumped on Bosch too soon. I missed something, and now I'm not so sure. There's a chance all of this could be a setup. He's convinced you. No, I convinced myself. There were voices in the background, and Winston told McCaleb to hold on. He then heard voices muffled by a hand over the phone. It sounded like arguing. McCaleb stood up and continued walking toward the pier. Winston came back on in a few seconds. Sorry, she said. This isn't a good time. I'm in the middle of something right now. Can we meet tomorrow morning? What are you talking about? Winston said, her voice almost shrill. You just told me you're working for the target of an investigation. I'm not going to meet with you. How the fuck would that look? Hold on. He heard her muffled voice apologizing for her language to someone. Then she came back on the line. I really have to go. Look, I don't care how it would look. I'm interested in the truth, and I thought you would be too. You don't want to meet me. Fine, don't meet me. I've got to go myself. Terry, wait. He listened. She said nothing. He sensed that she was distracted by something there. What, Jay? What is this thing you said we missed? It was in the arrest package from Gunn's last deuce. I guess after Bosch told you he'd spoken to him in lockup, you pulled all the records. I just scanned through it the first time I looked at the book. I pulled the records, she said in a defensive tone. He spent the night of December 30th in the Hollywood tank. That's where Bosch saw him. And he bonded out in the morning. 7.30. Yeah. Okay. I don't get it. Look who bailed him out. Terry, 
I'm at my parents. I don't have... Right. Sorry. He was bailed out by Rudy Tafero. Silence. Michaela was at the pier. He walked out toward the gangway that led down to the skiff dock and leaned on the railing. He cupped his free hand over his ear again. Okay. He was bailed out by Rudy Tafero, Winston said. I assume he's a licensed bail bondsman. What does that mean? You haven't been watching your TV. You're right. Tafero is a licensed bail bondsman. At least he put a license number on the bail sheet. But he's also a PI and security consultant. And, ready for this? He works for David Story. Winston didn't say anything, but McCaleb could hear her breathing into the phone. Terry, I think you better slow down. You're reading too much into this. No coincidences, Jay. What coincidence? The man's a bail bondsman. It's what he does. He gets people out of jail. I'll bet you a box of donuts his office is right across the street from Hollywood Station with all the others. He probably bails every third drunk and fourth prostitute out of the tank there. You don't believe it's that simple and you know it. Don't tell me what I believe. This was when he was in the middle of preparing for Story's trial. Why would Tafero come over and write a deuce ticket himself? Because maybe he's a one-man show and maybe, like I said, all he had to do was cross the street. I don't buy it. And there's something else. On his booking slip, it says Gunn got his one phone call at 3 a.m. The number's on the slip. He called his sister in Long Beach. Okay, what about it? We knew that. I called her today and asked if she'd called a bondsman for him. She said no. She said she was tired of getting calls in the middle of the night and literally bailing him out all the time. She told him he was on his own this time. So he went with Tafero. What about it? How'd he get him? He already used his call. Winston had no answer for that. They were both silent for a while. Michaela looked out across the harbor. The yellow taxi boat was moving slowly down one of the fairways, empty except for the man at the wheel. Men alone in their boats, Michaela thought. What are you going to do? Winston finally asked. Where are you going with this? I'm coming back across tonight. Can you meet me in the morning? Where? When? The tone of her voice revealed that she was put out by the prospect of a meeting. 7.30, out front at the Hollywood station. There was a pause, and then Winston said, Wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't do this. If Hitchens gets wind of it, that will be the end. He'll ship me out to Palmdale. I'll spend the rest of my career pulling bones out of the desert sand. McCaleb was ready for that protest. You said the Bureau guys want the murder book back, right? You meet me. I'll have it with me. What's Hitchens going to say about that? There was silence as Winston considered this. Okay, that'll work. I'll be there. Chapter 34 when Bosch got home that evening, he found the message light on his phone machine was blinking. He pushed the button and listened to two messages, one from each of the prosecutors on the story case. He decided to call Langweiser back first. As he punched her number into the phone, he wondered what urgency had caused both members of the prosecution team to call him. He thought maybe they'd been contacted by the FBI agents McCaleb had mentioned, or possibly by the reporter. What's up? he asked when Langweiser answered. With both of you guys calling me, I know it must be big and bad. Harry, how are you? Hanging in. What do you two have cooking? It's funny you should mention that. Roger's on his way over, and I'm going to cook tonight. We're going to go over Annabelle Crow's grand jury testimony one more time. You want to come by? He knew she lived up in Aqua Dulce, an hour's drive north. Uh, you know what? I've been driving all day, down to Long Beach and back. You think you really need me there? Totally optional. Just didn't want you to feel left out. But that's not why we were calling. What was the reason? He was in the kitchen, sliding a six-pack of anchor steam onto a shelf in the refrigerator. 
He pulled one bottle out of its sleeve and closed the door. Roger and I have been conferencing all weekend about this. We also talked to Alice Short about it. Alice Short was a chief deputy who was in charge of major trials, their boss. It sounded as though they'd been contacted about the gun case. What's the it you're talking about? Bosch asked. He slid the bottle into the opener and yanked down, popping the cap. Well, we think the case has really gone by the numbers, really fallen together. In fact, it's bulletproof, Harry, and we think we should pull the trigger tomorrow. Bosch was quiet a moment while he tried to decipher all the weaponry coding. You're saying you're going to rest tomorrow? We think so. We'll probably talk about it again tonight, but we have Alice's blessing, and Roger really thinks it's the right move. What we do is put on a bunch of clean-up wits in the morning, and then bring Annabelle Crow out after lunch. We'd end with her, a human story. She'll be our closer. Bosch was speechless. It might be the right move from a prosecutorial point of view. But that would put J. Reason folks in control of things as early as Tuesday. Harry, what do you think? He took a long pull on the bottle. The beer wasn't that cold. It had been in the car for a while. I think you only get one shot, he said, continuing the weaponry imagery. You two better think long and hard about it tonight while you're making the pasta. You don't get a second chance to put on a case. We know, Harry. And how'd you know I was making pasta? He could hear the smile in her voice. Lucky guess. Well, don't worry. We'll think long and hard. We have been. She paused, allowing him a chance to respond, but he was silent. In case we go this way, what's the status on Crow? She's waiting in the wings. Good to go. Can you reach her tonight? No problem. I'll tell her to be there by noon tomorrow. Thanks, Harry. See you in the morning. They hung up. Bosch thought about things. He wondered if he should call McCaleb and tell him what was happening. He decided to wait. He walked out into the living room and turned on the stereo. The Art Pepper CD was still in the play slot. The music soon filled the room. Chapter 35 McCaleb was leaning against the Cherokee parked in front of the LAPD's Hollywood station when Winston pulled up in a BMW Z3 and parked. When she got out, she saw McCaleb studying her car. I was running late. I didn't have time to pick up a company car. I like your wheels. You know what they say about L.A. You are what you drive. Don't start profiling me, Terry. It's too fucking early. Where's the book and the tape? He noted her profanity, but kept his thoughts on that to himself. He pushed off the car and went around to the passenger side. He opened the door and took out the murder book and the crime scene tape. He handed them to her and she took them back to her car. McCaleb closed and locked the Cherokee, looking down through the window to the floor of the back seat where he'd covered the Kinko's box with the morning newspaper. Before coming to the rendezvous, he had gone to the 24-hour shop on Sunset and photocopied the entire murder book. The tape was a problem. He didn't know where to get it dubbed on short notice, so he simply bought a video cassette at the Rite Aid near the marina, and slipped the blank tape into the case Winston had given him. It was his guess that she wouldn't check to make sure he'd returned the correct tape. When she came back from her car, he pointed with his chin across the street. I guess I owe you a box of donuts. She looked. Across Wilcox from the station was a shabby two-story building with a handful of storefront bail bond operations, with phone numbers advertised in each window in cheap neon maybe to help prospective clients memorize them from the back seat of passing patrol cars. The middle business had a painted sign above the window. Valentino Bonds. Which one? Winston asked. Valentino, as in Rudy Valentino Taffero. That's what they used to call him when he worked this side of the street. Michaela appraised the small business again and shook his head. 
I still don't see how a neon bondsman and David Story ever hooked up. Hollywood is just street trash with money. So what are we doing here? I don't have a lot of time. You bring your badge? She gave him a don't fuck with me look, and he explained what he wanted to do. They went up the steps and into the station. At the front desk, Winston flashed her badge and asked for the AM watch sergeant. A man with Zucker on his nameplate and sergeant stripes on the sleeve of his uniform came out from the small office. Winston showed her badge again, introduced herself, and then introduced McCaleb as her associate. Zucker knitted his healthy set of eyebrows together, but didn't ask what associate meant. We're working a homicide case from New Year's Eve. The victim spent the night before in your tank. We... Edward Gunn. Right. You knew him? He'd been in a few times. And of course I heard he won't be coming back. We need to talk to whoever runs the tank on AM Watch. Well, that would be me, I guess. We don't have a specific duty. It sort of catches catch can around here. What do you want to know? McCaleb took a set of photocopies from the murder book out of his jacket pocket and spread them on the counter. He noticed Winston's look, but ignored it. We're interested in how he made bail, he said. Zucker turned the pages around so he could read them. He put his finger on Rudy Taffero's signature. Says it right here, Rudy Taffero. He's got a place across the street. He came over and bailed him out. Did someone call him? Yeah, the guy did. Gun. McCaleb tapped his finger on the copy of the booking slip. It says here that when he got his call, he called this number. It's his sister. Then she must have called Rudy for him. So nobody gets two calls. Nope. Round here, we're usually so busy, they're lucky if they get the one. McCaleb nodded. He folded the photocopies and was about to put them back in his pocket when Winston took them from his hand. I'll hang on to those, she said. She slipped the folded copies into the back pocket of her black jeans. Sergeant Zucker, she said. You wouldn't be the kind of nice guy who would call Taffero, being that he's former LAPD and tip him that he had a potential fish over here in the tank, would you? Zucker stared at her for a moment, his face a stone. It's very important, Sergeant. If you don't tell us, it could come back on you. The stone cracked into a humorless smile. Now, I'm not that kind of nice guy, Zucker said, and I don't... Have any nice guys like that on AM watch. And speaking of which, I just got off shift, which means I don't have to be talking to you anymore. Have a nice day. He started to step away from the counter. One last thing, Winston said quickly. Zucker turned back to her. Were you the one who called Harry Bosch and told him Gunn was in the tank? Zucker nodded. I had a standing request from him. Any and every time Gunn was brought in here, Bosch wanted to know about it. He'd come in and talk to the guy, try to get him to say something about that old case. Bosch wouldn't give up on it. It says Gunn wasn't booked until 2.30, McCaleb said. You called Bosch in the middle of the night? That was part of the deal. Bosch didn't care what time it was, and actually the procedure was that I would page him and then he'd call in. And that's what happened that last night? Yeah. I paged, and Bosch called in. I told him we had gun again, and he came down to try to talk to him. I tried to tell him to wait until morning, because the guy was on his ass drunk. Gun, I mean. But Harry came down anyway. Why are you asking so much about Harry Bosch? Winston didn't answer, so McCaleb jumped in. We're not. We're asking about gun. Well? That's all I know. Can I go home now? It's been a long one. Aren't they all? Winston said. Thank you, Sergeant. They stepped away from the counter and walked out to the front steps. What do you think? Winston asked. He sounded legit to me. But you know what? Let's watch the employee lot for a few minutes. Why? Humor me. Let's see what the sergeant drives home. You're wasting my time, Terry.
They got into McCaleb's Cherokee anyway and drove around the block until they came to the entrance exit of the Hollywood Station employee parking lot. McCaleb drove fifty yards past it and parked in front of a fire hydrant. He adjusted the side-view mirror so he could see any car that left the lot. They sat and waited in silence for a couple minutes until Winston spoke. So if we are what we drive, what's this make you? McCaleb smiled. Never thought about it. A Cherokee. I guess that makes me the last of a breed or something. He glanced at her, then looked back at the mirror. Yeah, and what about this coating of dust on everything? What does that... Here we go. Think it's him. McCaleb watched a car leave the exit and turn left in their direction. Coming this way. Neither of them moved. The car drove up and stopped right next to them. McCaleb looked over casually, and his eyes met Zucker's. The cop lowered his passenger side window. McCaleb had no choice. He lowered his. You're parked in front of a plug there, detective. Don't get a ticket. McCaleb nodded. Zucker saluted with two fingers and drove off. McCaleb noted that he was driving a Crown Victoria with commercial bumpers and wheels. It was a second-hand patrol car. The kind you pick up at auction for four hundred bucks and slap on an eighty-nine ninety-five paint job. Don't we look like a couple of assholes? Winston said. Yeah. So what's your theory about that car? He's either an honest man, or he drives the beater to work because he doesn't want people to see the Porsche. He paused. Or the Z3. He turned to her and smiled. Funny, Terry. Now what? Eventually, I have to get some real work done today, and I'm supposed to meet with your bureau buddies this morning as well. Stick with me. And they aren't my buddies. He started the Cherokee and pulled away from the curb. You really think this car's dirty? He asked. Chapter 36 the post office on Wilcox was a large World War II-era building with twenty-five-foot-high ceilings and murals depicting bucolic scenes of brotherhood and good deeds covering the upper walls. As they walked in, McCaleb's eyes scanned the murals, but not for their artistic or philosophic merit. He counted three small cameras mounted above the public areas of the office. He pointed them out to Winston. They had a chance. They waited in line, and when it was their turn, Winston flashed her badge and asked for the on-site security officer. They were directed to a door next to a row of vending machines, and they waited nearly five minutes before it was opened and a small black man with gray hair looked out. Mr. Lucas? Winston asked. That's right, he said with a smile. Winston showed the badge once more and introduced McCaleb simply by name. McCaleb had told her on the way over from Hollywood Station that calling him an associate wasn't working. We're working a homicide investigation, Mr. Lucas, and an important piece of evidence is a money order that was purchased here and probably mailed here on December 22nd. The 22nd? That's right in the Christmas rush. That's right, sir. Winston looked at McCaleb. We noticed your cameras out there on the walls, Mr. Lucas, she said. We'd be interested in knowing if you have a videotape from the 22nd. Videotape, Lucas said, as if the word was foreign to him. You are the security officer here, right? Winston said impatiently. Yes, I'm the security man. I run the cameras. Can you take us back and show us your surveillance system, Mr. Lucas? McCaleb said in a gentler tone. Yep, sure can. Just as soon as you get authorization, I'll take you on back. And how and where do we get authorization? Winston asked. From L.A. Regional, downtown. Is there a specific person we talk to? We're on a homicide investigation, Mr. Lucas. Time is of the essence. That would be Mr. Preachner. He's a postal inspector you would talk to, yes. Do you mind if we come back to your office and we call Mr. Preachner together? McCaleb asked, 
It would save us a lot of time, and then Mr. Preachner could just talk directly to you. Lucas thought about this for a moment and decided it was a good idea. He nodded. Let's see what we can do. Lucas opened the door and led them through a warren of huge mail baskets to a cubbyhole office with two desks squeezed together. On one of the desks was a video monitor with its screen cut into four camera views of the public area of the post office. McCaleb realized he had missed one of the cameras when he'd searched the walls earlier. Lucas ran his finger down a list of phone numbers taped to the top of the desk and made the call. Once he got a hold of his supervisor, he explained the situation and then turned the phone over to Winston. She went through their explanation again and then turned the phone back over to Lucas. She nodded to McCaleb. They got the approval. Okay, then, Lucas said after hanging up. Let's see what we've got here. He reached to his hip and pulled up a ring of keys on a retractable wire attached to his belt. He went to the other side of the office and unlocked a closet door. He opened it to reveal the closet to be stuffed with a rack of video recorders and four upper shelves of video tapes marked with the numbers 1 through 31 on each shelf. On the floor were two cartons containing fresh videotapes. McCaleb saw all of this and suddenly realized it was January 22nd, exactly one month from the day the money order was purchased. Mr. Lucas, stop the machines, he said. Can't do that. The machines always got a roll. If we're open for business, then the tapes are rolling. You don't understand. December 22nd is the day we want. We're taping over the day we want to look at. Hold your horses, Detective McCallan. I have to explain the setup. McCaleb didn't bother correcting him on the name. There wasn't time. Then hurry, please. McCaleb looked at his watch. It was 8.48. The post office had been open for 48 minutes. That was 48 minutes of the December 22nd tape erased with 48 minutes of the current day's taping. Lucas started explaining the taping procedure. One VCR for each of the four cameras. One tape in each machine at the start of each day. The cameras were set at 30 frames a minute, allowing one tape to cover the entire day. The tape for an individual day was held for a month and used again if not reserved because of an investigation by the Postal Inspector's service. We've got a lot of scam artists and whatnot. You know how it is in Hollywood. We end up with a lot of tapes on reserve. The inspectors come in and get them. Or we send them on down in dispatch. We understand, Mr. Lucas, said Winston, an urgent tone in her voice as she apparently came to the same realization as McCaleb. Can you please turn off the machines or replace the tapes in them? We are taping over what could be valuable evidence. Right away, Lucas said. But he proceeded to reach into the carton of new tapes and take out four cassettes. He then peeled labels off a dispenser roll and put them on the tapes. He took a pen from behind his ear and wrote the date and some sort of coding on the labels. Then finally he started popping tapes out of the VCRs and replacing them with the new cassettes. Now, how do you want to do this? These tapes are post office property. They're not leaving the premises. I can set you up over here at the desk. I've got a portable TV with built-in VCR if you want to use it. Are you sure we just can't borrow them for the day? Winston said. I could have them back by... Not without a court order. That's what Mr. Preachner told me. That's what I'm going to do. Then I guess we don't have a choice, Winston said, looking at McCaleb and shaking her head in frustration. While Lucas went to get the TV, McCaleb and Winston decided that McCaleb would stay and watch the videotape while Winston went to her office for an 11 a.m. meeting with the bureau men, Twilly and Friedman. She said she wouldn't be mentioning McCaleb's new investigation or the possibility that his earlier focus on Bosch may have been an error. She would return the copied murder book and crime scene tape. I know you don't believe in coincidence. But that's all you have at the moment, Terry. You come up with something on the tape, and I'll bring it to the captain, and we'll blow Twilly and Friedman out of the water. But until you have it, 
I'm still in the doghouse and need something more than a coincidence to look anywhere other than at Bosch. What about the call to Teferro? What call? Somehow he knew Gunn was in the tank and he came and bailed him out, so they could kill him that night and pin it on Bosch. I don't know about that call. If it wasn't Zucker... It was probably somebody else in the station he's got a sweetheart deal with. And the rest of what you just said is pure speculation without a single fact backing it up. I think it's... Stop, Terry. I don't want to hear it until you have something backing it up. I'm going to work. As if on cue, Lucas came back pushing a cart with a small television on top of it. I'll set you up with this, he said. Mr. Lucas, I need to go to an appointment. Winston said. My colleague is going to look at the tapes. Thank you for your cooperation. Happy to be of service, ma'am. Winston looked at McCaleb. Call me. You want me to drive you back to your car? It's just a few blocks. I'll walk it. He nodded. Happy hunting, she said. McCaleb nodded. She had said that to him once before on a case that had not turned out so happily for him. Chapter 37 Langweiser and Kretzler told Bosch they were going ahead with the plan to rest their case by the close of the day. We got him, Kretzler said, smiling and enjoying the adrenaline ride that came with making the decision to pull the trigger. By the time we're done, he'll be tied down nine ways till Sunday. We've got Hendricks and Crow today. We've got everything we need. Except motive. Bosch said. Motive is not going to be important with a crime that's obviously the work of a psychopath, Langweiser said. Those jurors aren't going to go back into their little room at the end of this and say, yeah, but what was his motive? They're going to say this guy is a sick fuck and... Her voice dropped to a whisper when the judge entered the courtroom through the door behind the bench. We're going to put him away. The judge called for the jury, and after a few minutes the prosecutors were putting on their last witnesses of the trial. The first four witnesses were film business people who'd attended the premiere party on the night of Jody Cremens' death. Each testified to having seen David Story at the film premiere and following party with a woman they identified from exhibit photos as Jody Cremens. The fourth witness, a screenwriter named Brent Wigan, testified that he'd left the premiere party a few minutes before midnight and that he waited at the valet stand for his car along with David's story and a woman he also identified as Jody Cremens. Why are you so sure it was just a few minutes before midnight, Mr. Wigan? Kretzler asked. It was, after all, a party. Were you watching the clock? One question at a time, Mr. Kretzler, the judge barked. Sorry, Your Honor. Why are you so sure it was a few minutes before midnight, Mr. Wigan? Because I was watching the clock, actually, Wigan said. My watch, that is. I do my writing at night. I'm most productive from midnight until six, so I was watching the clock, knowing I had to get back to my house at close to midnight or I'd fall behind in my work. Would that also mean you were not drinking alcoholic beverages at the premiere party? That is correct. I wasn't drinking because I didn't want to become tired or have my creativity dampened. People don't usually drink before they go to work at a bank or as a plane pilot. Well, I guess most of them don't. He paused until the titters of laughter subsided. The judge looked annoyed but didn't say anything. Wigan looked like he was enjoying his moment of attention. Bosch started feeling uneasy. I don't drink before I go on the job, Wigan finally continued. Writing is a craft, but it's also a job, and I treat it as such. So are you crystal clear in your memory and identification of who David's story was with at a few minutes before midnight? Absolutely. And David's story, you personally already knew him, correct? Yes, that's true. For several years. Have you ever worked for David's story on a film project? No, I haven't but not for lack of trying. Wigan smiled ruefully. 
This part of the testimony, right down to the self-deprecating comment, had been carefully planned by Kretzler earlier. He needed to limit the potential for damage to Wiggins' testimony by walking him through the weak spots on direct. What do you mean by that, Mr. Wiggins? Oh, I would say that in the last five years or so, I've pitched film projects to David directly or to people in his production company maybe six or seven times. He never bought any of them. He hiked his shoulders in a sheepish gesture. Would you say this created a sense of animosity between you two? No, not at all. At least not on my part. That's the way the Hollywood game is played. You keep pitching and pitching, and hopefully somebody eventually bites. It helps to have a thick skin, though. He smiled and nodded to the jury. He was giving Bosch a full set of the creeps. He wished Kretzler would end it before they lost the jury. Thank you, that's all, Mr. Wigan, Kretzler said, apparently getting the same vibes as Bosch. Wigan's face seemed to fall as he realized his moment was ending. But then folks, who had passed on cross-examining the first three witnesses of the day, stood up and went to the lectern. Good morning, Mr. Wigan. Good morning. Wigan raised his eyebrows in a what-do-we-have-here look. Just a few questions. Could you list for the jury the titles of films that you've written that have been produced? Well, so far, nothing's been made. I've got some options, and I think in a few... I understand. Would you be surprised to know that in the last four years you've pitched Mr. Story or submitted film treatments to him on a total of 29 occasions, all of which were rejected? Wigan's face flushed with embarrassment. Well, I, uh, I guess that could be true. I, I don't really know. I don't keep a record of my rejections, as Mr. Story apparently does. He delivered the last line in a snippish manner and Bosch almost winced. There was nothing worse than a witness on the stand who's caught in a lie and then gets defensive about it. Bosch glanced at the jury. Several of them were not looking at the witness, a sign that they were as uncomfortable as Bosch. Folks moved in for the kill. You were rejected by the defendant on twenty-nine occasions, and yet you say to the jury that you bear him no malice? Is that correct, sir? That's just business as usual in Hollywood. Ask anyone. Well, Mr. Wigan, I'm asking you. Are you telling this jury that you bear this man no ill will when he's the same man who has constantly and repeatedly said to you, your work is not good enough? Wigan almost mumbled his answer into the microphone. Yes, that's true. Well, you're a better man than me, Mr. Wigan, folks said. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further at this time. Bosch could feel a good bit of the air go out of the prosecution's balloon. With four questions in less than two minutes, folks had put Wiggins' entire credibility into question. And what was so absolutely perfect about the defense attorney's skillful surgery was that there was little Kretzler could do on redirect to resuscitate Wigan. The prosecutor at least knew better than to try and perhaps dig the hole deeper. He dismissed the witness, and the judge broke for the mid-morning break of fifteen minutes. After the jury was out and people started working their way out of the courtroom, Kretzler leaned across Langweiser to whisper to Bosch, We should have known that this guy was going to blow up, he said angrily. Bosch just looked around to make sure no reporters were within earshot. He leaned toward Kretzler. You're probably right, he said. But six weeks ago, you were the one who said he would do the vetting on Wigan. He was your responsibility, not mine. I'm going to get coffee. Bosch got up and left the two prosecutors sitting there. After the break, the prosecutors decided they needed to immediately come back strong after the disastrous cross-examination of Wigan. They dropped plans to have another witness testify about seeing Story and the victim together at the premiere party, and Langweiser called a home security technician named Jamal Hendricks to the stand. Bosch walked Hendricks in from the hallway. He was a black man wearing blue pants and a light blue uniform top, his first name embroidered over one pocket, 
and the lighthouse security emblem over the other. He was planning to go to work following his testimony. As they went through the first set of doors to the courtroom, Bosch asked Hendricks, in a whisper, if he was nervous. Nah, man, piece of cake, Hendricks replied. On the stand, Langweiser took Hendricks through his pedigree as a service technician for the home security company. She then moved specifically to his work on the security system at David Story's house. Hendricks said that eight months earlier he'd installed a deluxe Millennium 21 system in the house on Mulholland. Can you tell us what some of the features are on the deluxe Millennium 21 system? Well, it's top of the line. It's got everything. Remote sensing and operation, voice recognition command software, automatic sensor pulling, an innkeeper program. You name it, and Mr. Story got it. What is the innkeeper program? Essentially, it's operation recording software. It lets you know what doors or windows have been opened and when, when the system has been turned on and off, what personal codes were used and whatnot. It keeps track of the whole system. It's primarily used in commercial industrial applications, but Mr. Story wanted a commercial system and it came included. So he didn't specifically ask for the innkeeper program? I don't know about that. I didn't sell him the system. I only installed it. But he could have had this program and not known about it. Anything's possible, I guess. Now, did there come a time when Detective Bosch called Lighthouse Security and asked for a technician to meet him at Mr. Story's home? Yeah, he made the call, and it was given to me because I'd installed the system. I met him there at the house. This was after Mr. Story had been arrested and was in lockup. Mr. Story's lawyer was there, too. When was that, exactly? That was November 11th. What did Detective Bosch ask you to do? Well, first he showed me a search warrant. It allowed him to collect information from the system's chip. And did you help him with that? Yeah. I downloaded the innkeeper data file and printed it out for him. Langweiser first introduced the search warrant the third executed during the investigation, as an exhibit. Then she introduced the printout Hendricks had just testified about. Now, Detective Bosch was interested in the innkeeper records for the evening of October 12th going into the morning of October 13th. Is that correct, Mr. Hendricks? Right. Can you look at the printout and read the entries for that time period? Hendricks studied the printout for several seconds before speaking. Well. It says the interior door leading to the garage was opened and the alarm system was engaged by Mr. Story's voice print at 7.09 the night of the 12th. Then nothing happened until the next day, the 13th. At 12.12 12 a.m., the alarm system was disengaged by Mr. Story's voice print and the interior garage door was opened again. He then put the alarm back on once he was in the house. Hendricks studied the printout before continuing. The system remained at status until 3.19 when the alarm was shut off. The interior garage door was then opened and the alarm system was engaged once more by Mr. Story's voice print. Then 42 minutes later, at 4.01 a.m., the alarm was disengaged by Mr. Story's voice print, the garage door was opened, and the alarm system was engaged again. There was no other activity until 11 a.m. when the alarm was disengaged by the voice print of Batilda Lockett. Do you know who Batilda Lockett is? Yes. When I installed the system, I set up her voice acceptance program. She's Mr. Story's executive assistant. Langweiser asked permission to set up an easel with a board displaying the times and activities Hendricks had just testified to. It was approved over objection, and Bosch helped Langweiser set up the display. The poster board had two columns on it, showing the record of the house alarm's engagement and the usage of the door between the house and the garage. Alarm. October 12th, 7.09 p.m. Engaged by D. Story. Interior garage door. Opened. Closed. Alarm, 
October 13th, 1212 AM, disengaged by D. Story. Interior garage door, opened, closed. October 13th, 1212 AM, engaged by D. Story. October 13th, 319 AM, disengaged by D. Story. Interior garage door, open, closed. October 13th, 319 AM, engaged by D. Story. October 13th, 401 AM, disengaged by D. Story. Interior garage door, open, closed. October 13th, 401 AM, engaged by D. Story. Langweiser continued her questioning of Hendricks. Does this illustration accurately reflect your testimony about the alarm system in David Story's home on the evening of October 12, going into October 13? The technician looked at the poster carefully and then nodded. Is that a yes? It's a yes. Thank you. Now, because these activities were instigated with the system's recognition and approval of David Story's voice print, are you telling the jury that this is the record of David Story's comings and goings during the time period in question? Folks objected, saying the question assumed facts, not in evidence. Houghton agreed and told Langweiser to rephrase or ask another question. Her point made with the jury, she moved on. Mr. Hendricks, if I had a tape recording of David Story's voice, could I play it into the Millennium 21 station microphone and receive clearance to engage or disengage the alarm? No. There are two fail-safe mechanisms. You must use a password recognized by the computer, and you must say the date. So you need voice, password, correct date, or the system won't accept the command. What was David Story's password? I don't know. It's private. The system is set so that he can change his password as often as he likes. Langweiser looked at the poster on the easel. She went up and took a pointer off the easel's ledge. She used it to underline the entries for 319 and 401 in the morning. Can you tell from these entries whether someone with Mr. Story's voice left the house at 319 and returned at 401, or if it was the other way around? Someone came in at 319 and then left at 401? Yes, I can. How is that? The system also records which transmitter stations are used to engage and disengage the system. In this house, the stations are set on either side of three doors. You know, outside and inside the door. The three are the front door, the door to the garage, and one of the doors to the rear deck. The transmitters are on the outside and the inside of each door. Whatever one is used gets recorded in the innkeeper program. Can you look at the printout from Mr. Story's system that you looked at earlier and tell us what transmitters were used during the 319 and 401 entries? Hendricks studied his paperwork before answering. Ah, uh, yes. At 319, the exterior transmitter was used. That means somebody was in the garage when they turned the alarm on in the house. Then at 401, the same exterior transmitter was used to turn the alarm off. The door was then opened and closed. Then the alarm was turned back on from the inside. So someone came home at 401. Is that what you're saying? Yes, right and the system computer registered this someone as David Story, correct? It identified his voice, yes. And this person would have had to have used Mr. Story's password and given the correct date as well? Yes, that's right. Langweiser said she had no further questions. Folks told the judge he had a quick cross-examination. He bounded to the lectern and looked at Hendricks. Mr. Hendricks. How long have you worked for Lighthouse? Three years next month. So, you were employed by Lighthouse on January 1st a year ago. The so-called Y2K changeover. Yes. 
Hendricks said hesitantly. Can you tell us what happened to many of Lighthouse's clients on that day? Um, we had a few problems. A few problems, Mr. Hendricks? We had system failures. What system in particular? The Millennium Twos had a program malfunction, but it was minor. We were able to... How many clients with Millennium Twos were affected in the Los Angeles area? All of them. But we found the bug and... That's all, sir. Thank you. We got it fixed. Mr. Hendricks, the judge barked. That's enough. The jury will disregard the last statement. He looked at Langweiser. Redirect, Miss Langweiser? Langweiser said she had a few quick questions. Bosch had known about the Y2K problems and reported them to the prosecutors. Their hope had been that the defense would not learn of them or raise them. Mr. Hendricks, did Lighthouse fix the bug that infected the systems after Y2K? Yes, we did. It was fixed right away. Would it in any way have affected data gathered from the defendant's system a full ten months after Y2K? Not at all. The problem was resolved. The system was repaired. Langweiser said that was all she had for the witness and sat down. Folks then rose for recross. The bug that was fixed, Mr. Hendricks. That was the bug they knew about, correct? Hendricks made a confused look. Yeah. That was the one that caused the problem. So what you're saying is that you only know about these bugs when they cause a problem. Uh, usually. So there could be a program bug in Mr. Story's security system, and you wouldn't know about it until it creates a problem, correct? Hendricks shook his shoulders. Anything's possible. Folks sat down and the judge asked Langweiser if she had anything else. The prosecutor hesitated a moment, but then said she had nothing further. Hendricks was dismissed by Houghton, who then suggested an early break for lunch. Our next witness will be very brief, Your Honor. I'd like to get him in before the break. We plan to concentrate on one witness during the afternoon session. Very well, go on. We recall Detective Bosch. Bosch got up and went to the witness stand, carrying the murder book. This time he did not touch the microphone. He settled in and was reminded by the judge that he was still under oath. Detective Bosch, Langweiser began. At some point during your investigation of the murder of Jody Cremens, were you directed to drive from the defendant's home to the victim's home and then back again? Yes, I was, by you. And did you follow that direction? Yes. When? On November 16th at 3.19 a.m. Did you time your drive? Yes, I did, both ways. And can you tell us those times? You can refer to your notes, if you wish. Bosch opened the binder to a previously marked page. He took a moment to study the notations, even though he knew them by heart. From Mr. Story's house to Jody Kremen's house... It took eleven minutes and twenty-two seconds, driving within posted speed limits. Coming back, it took eleven minutes and forty-eight seconds. The round trip was twenty-three minutes, ten seconds. Thank you, Detective. That was it. Folks passed again on cross-examination, reserving the right to call Bosch back to the stand during the defense phase. Judge Houghton recessed the trial for lunch, and the crowded courtroom slowly drained into the outside hallway. Bosch was pushing and moving through the crowd of lawyers, spectators, and reporters in the hallway and looking for Annabelle Crow, when a hand strongly grabbed his upper arm from behind. He swung around and looked into the face of a black man he didn't recognize. Another man, this one white, came up to them. The two men had on almost identical gray suits. Bosch knew they were bureau men before the first man said his first word. Detective Bosch, I'm Special Agent Twilly with the FBI. This is Special Agent Friedman. Can we talk to you somewhere privately? Chapter 38 It took three hours to go carefully through the videotape. At the end of it, 
McCaleb had nothing to show for his time except a parking ticket. Teferro had appeared nowhere in the video of the post office on the day the money order was purchased. Neither had Harry Bosch, for that matter. The missing 48 minutes of video, which had been taped over before McCaleb and Winston got there, now haunted him. If they'd gone to the post office first and Hollywood Station second, they might have had the killer on tape. Those 48 minutes might be the difference in the case, the difference in being able to clear Bosch or convict him. McCaleb was thinking about what-if scenarios when he got to the Cherokee and found the parking ticket under the wiper. He cursed and pulled it off and looked at it. He'd been so absorbed in watching the tape he'd forgotten he'd parked in a 15-minute zone in front of the post office. The ticket would cost him $40, and that stung. With few fishing charters in the winter months, his family had been living mostly off Graciela's small paycheck and his monthly pension from the Bureau. There wasn't a lot of leeway with expenses for the two kids. This, coupled with Saturday's canceled charter, would hurt. He slipped the ticket back into place on the windshield and started walking down the sidewalk. He decided he wanted to go into Valentino Bonds, even if he knew Rudy Teferro would likely be up in Van Nuys in court. It was in keeping with his practice of viewing the target subject in comfortable surroundings. The target might not be there this time, but the surroundings where he felt safe would. As he walked, he took out his cell phone and called Jay Winston, but got her machine. He hung up without leaving a message and paged her. Four blocks later, when he was almost to Valentino Bonds, she called back. I got nothing, he reported. Nothing? No Teferro and no Bosch. Damn! It had to have been on that missing 48 minutes. We should have gone to the post office first. I know, my fault. The one thing I did get was a parking ticket. Sorry, Terry. Which at least gives me an idea. It was right before Christmas and crowded. If he was in a 15-minute zone, he might have gone over while waiting in line. The parking enforcement goons in this city are like Nazis. They wait in the shadows. There's always a chance there was a ticket. It should be checked. Son of Sam? Right. She was referring to the New York City serial killer who was tripped up in the 1970s by a parking ticket. I'll take a shot at it. See what I can do. What are you going to do? I'm about to check out Valentino Bonds. Is he there? He's probably up in court. I'm going to go up there next, see if I can talk to Bosch about all of this. Better be careful. Your colleagues from the Bureau said they were going up to see him at lunch. They might still be around when you get there. What? They're expecting Bosch to be so impressed by their suits that he confesses or something? I don't know. Something like that. They were going to brace him, get some stuff on the record, and then go find the contradictions. You know, routine word trap. Harry Bosch is not routine. They're wasting their time. I know. I told him. But you can't tell an FBI agent anything. You know that. He smiled. Hey, if this goes the other way and we take down to Pharaoh, I want the sheriff to pay for this ticket. Hey, you're not working for me. You're working for Bosch, remember? He pays parking tickets. The sheriff only pays for pancakes. All right, I'm going to go. Call me. He slid the phone into the pocket of his windbreaker and opened the glass door of Valentino Bonds. It was a small white room with a waiting couch and a counter. It reminded McCaleb of a motel office. There was a calendar on the wall depicting a beach scene from Puerto Vallarta. Behind the counter, a man sat with his head down, filling in a crossword puzzle. Behind him was a closed door to what was probably a rear office. McCaleb put a smile on his face and started walking with purpose around the counter before the man there even looked up. Rudy? Hey, Rudy, come on out of there. The man looked up as McCaleb passed him and opened the door. He stepped into an office that was more than twice the size of the front room. Rudy? The man from the counter came in right behind him. Hey, man, what are you doing? McCaleb turned, scanning the room. Looking for Rudy, where is he? He's not here. Now, if you would step... 
He told me he'd be here, that he didn't have to be in court until later. Scanning the office, he saw the rear wall was covered with framed photos. He took a step closer. Most of them were shots of Tefero with celebrities he'd either bailed out or worked with as security consultant. Some of the photos were clearly from his days working across the street at the cop shop. Excuse me, just who are you? McCaleb looked at the man as if insulted. He looked like he might be Tefero's younger brother, the same dark hair and eyes with rough good looks. I'm a friend, Terry. We used to work together when he was across the street. McCaleb pointed to a group photo that was on the wall. It showed several men in suits and a few women standing in front of the brick facade of the Hollywood Division Station. The Detective Squad McCaleb saw both Harry Bosch and Rudy Tefero in the back row. Bosch's face was turned slightly away from the camera. There was a cigarette in his mouth, and smoke rising from it partially obscured his face. The man turned and started looking at the photo. McCaleb's eyes took another swing around the office. The room was nicely appointed with a desk to the left and a sitting area to the right with two short couches and an oriental rug. He stepped closer to the desk to look at a file sitting at center on the blotter, but the file, though an inch thick with documents, had nothing written on the tab. What the fuck? You're not on here. Yes, I am, McCaleb said without turning from the desk. I was smoking. You can't see my face. There was a file tray to the right of the blotter that was stacked with folders. McCaleb leaned his head at an angle to check the tabs. He saw an assortment of names, some of them recognizable as entertainers or actors, but none of them correlating to his investigation. Bullshit, man, that ain't you. That's Harry Bosch. Really? You know Harry? The man didn't answer. McCaleb turned around. The man was looking at him with angry, suspicious eyes. For the first time, McCaleb saw that he held an old billy club down at his side. Let me see. He walked over and looked at the framed photo. You know, you're right. That's Harry. I must have been in the one they took the year before. I was working undercover when they took this one and couldn't be in the picture. McCaleb nonchalantly took a step toward the door. Inside, he was bracing to get hit with the bat. Just tell him I was here, okay? Tell him Terry stopped by. He made it to the door, but one last framed photo caught his eye. It showed to Pharaoh and another man side by side, jointly holding a polished wood plaque in their hands. The picture was old. To Pharaoh looked almost ten years younger. His eyes were brighter and his smile seemed genuine. The plaque itself was hanging on the wall next to the photo. McCaleb leaned closer and read the brass plate attached at the bottom. Rudy Tefero, Hollywood Boosters Detective of the Month, February 1995. He glanced back at the photo again and then moved through the door to the front room. Terry what? the man said as he passed. Caleb walked to the front door before turning back to him. Just tell him it was Terry, the undercover guy. He left the office and walked back up the street without looking back. McCaleb sat in his car in front of the post office. He felt uneasy, the way he always did when he knew the answer was within reach, but he just couldn't quite see it. His gut told him he was on the right track. To Faro, the P.I. who hid his upscale Hollywood practice behind a bail bond shack, was the key. McCaleb just couldn't find the door. He realized he was very hungry. He started the car and thought about a place to eat. He was a few blocks from Musso's, but had eaten there too recently. He wondered if they served food at Nat's, but figured if they did that, it would be dangerous to the stomach. Instead, he drove over to the In-N-Out on Sunset and ordered at the drive through While he was eating his hamburger over the to-go box in the Cherokee, his phone chirped. He put the burger down in the box, wiped his hands on a napkin, and opened the phone. You're a genius. It was Jay Winston. What? 
to Pharaoh got a ticket on his Mercedes, a black 430 CLK. He was in the 15-minute zone right in front of the post office. The ticket was written at 8.19 a.m. on the 22nd. He hasn't paid it yet. He has till 5 today, and then it's overdue. But Caleb was silent as he considered this. He felt nerve synapses firing like dominoes running up his backbone. The ticket was a hell of a break. It proved absolutely nothing, but it told him that he was absolutely following the correct path. And sometimes knowing you are on the right path was better than having the proof. His thoughts jumped to his visit to Tefero's office and the photographs he'd seen. Hey, Jay, did you get a chance to look up anything on the case with Bosch's old lieutenant? I didn't have to go looking. Twilly and Friedman already had a file on it with them today. Lieutenant Harvey Pound. Somebody beat him to death about four weeks after he had that altercation with Bosch over gun. Because of the bad blood, Bosch was a likely suspect, but he apparently was cleared, by the LAPD at least. The case is open but inactive. The Bureau kind of watched from afar and has kept an open file too. Twilly told me today that there are some people in the LAPD who think Bosch was cleared on it a little too quickly. Oh, and I bet Twilly loves that. He does. He already has Bosch down for it. He thinks Gunn is only the tip of the iceberg with Harry. The Caleb shook his head but immediately moved on. He couldn't dwell on other people's foibles and motivations. There was a lot to think about and plan for with the investigation at hand. By the way, do you have a copy of the parking ticket? He asked. Not yet. It was all phone work but it's being faxed. The thing is, you and I know what it means, but it's a long way off from being proof of anything. I know, but it will make a good prop when the time comes. When the time comes for what? To make our play. We'll use to Pharaoh to get to story. You know that's where this is heading. We? You've got it all planned out, don't you, Terry? Not quite, but I'm working on it. He didn't want to have an argument with her about his role in the investigation. Listen, my lunch is getting cold here, he said. Well, excuse me, go ahead and eat. Call me later. I'm going up to see Bosch later on. Anything from Twilly and Friedman on that? I think they're still up there with him. All right, check you later. He closed the phone, got out of the car, and carried the food box to a trash can. He then jumped back in and started the engine. On the way back to the post office on Wilcox, he opened all the windows to air the smell of greasy food out of the car. Chapter 39 Annabel Crow walked to the witness stand, drawing all eyes in the courtroom. She was stunningly attractive, but had an almost awkward quality about her movements. This mixture made her seem old and young at the same time, and even more attractive. Langweiser would do the questioning. She waited until Crow was seated before disturbing the room's vibe and getting up to go to the lectern. Bosch had barely noticed the entrance of the final witness for the prosecution. He sat at the prosecution table with his eyes down, deep in thought about his visit from the two FBI agents. He'd size them up quickly. They smelled blood in the water and knew if they bagged Bosch on the gun case that there would be no end to the media ride they'd get from it. He expected them to make their move at any moment. Langweiser quickly moved through a series of general questions with Crow, establishing that she was a neophyte actress with a few plays and commercials on her resume, as well as one line in a feature film that had yet to be released. Her story seemed to confirm the difficulties of making it in Hollywood, a knockdown beauty who was only one in a town full of them. She still lived on stipends sent from her parents in Albuquerque. Langweiser moved on to more salient testimony, keying in on the night of April 14th of the previous year when Annabel Crow went out on a date with David's story. After quickly drawing brief descriptions of the dinner and drinks the couple enjoyed at Dan Tana's in West Hollywood, Langweiser moved to the latter half of the evening when Annabelle accompanied Story to his home on Mulholland Drive. Crow testified that she and Story 
shared a whole pitcher of margaritas on the back deck of his house before they went to his bedroom. And did you go willingly, Miss Crow? Yes, I did. You engaged in sexual relations with the defendant? Yes, I did. And this was consensual sexual intercourse? Yes, it was. Did anything happen that was unusual once you began having sexual relations with the defendant? Yes. He started to choke me. He started to choke you. How did that occur? Well, I guess I closed my eyes at one point, and it felt like he was changing positions or moving. He was on top of me, and I felt his hand slide behind my neck, and he sort of lifted my head off the pillow. Then I felt him slide something down. She stopped and put her hand to her mouth as she appeared to fight to maintain her composure. Take your time, Miss Crow. The witness looked as though she was genuinely trying to hold back tears. She finally dropped her hand and picked up her cup of water. She sipped from it and then looked up at Langweiser, a new resolve in her eyes. I felt him slide something down over my head and around my neck. I opened my eyes and he was tightening a necktie around my neck. She stopped and took another sip of water. Can you describe this necktie? It had a pattern. It was blue diamonds on a field of purple. I remember it exactly. What happened when the defendant pulled the tie tightly around your neck? It was choking me! Crow replied shrilly, as if the question was stupid and the answer was obvious. He was choking me, and he kept moving in me, and I tried to fight him, but he was too strong for me. Did he say anything at this time? He just kept saying, I have to do this, I have to do this. And he was breathing really hard, and he kept on having sex with me. His teeth were clenched tight when he said it. I... She stopped again, and this time single tears slid down both her cheeks, one slightly behind the other. Langweiser went to the prosecution table and took a box of tissues from her spot. She held them up and said, Your Honor, may I? The judge allowed her to approach the witness with the tissues. Langweiser made the delivery and then went back to the lectern. The courtroom was silent save for the crying sounds of the witness. Langweiser broke the moment. Miss Crow, do you need a minute? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Did you pass out when the defendant choked you? Yes. What do you remember next? I woke up in his bed. Was he there? No, but I could hear the shower running in the bathroom next to the bedroom. What did you do? I got up to get dressed. I wanted to leave before he came out of the shower. Were your clothes where you'd left them? No. I found them in a bag, like a grocery bag, by the bedroom door. I put on my underwear. Did you have a purse with you that night? Yes, that was in the bag, too, but it was opened. I looked inside, and he had taken the keys out. I... Folks objected, saying the answer assumed facts not in evidence, and the judge sustained it. Did you see the defendant take your keys out of your purse? Langweiser asked. Well, no... But they had been inside my purse. I didn't take them out. Okay, then someone, someone you didn't see because you were unconscious on the bed, took your keys out, is that correct? Yes. Okay, where did you find your keys after you realized they were not in your purse? They were on his bureau next to his own keys. Did you finish getting dressed and leave? Actually... I was so scared I just grabbed my clothes and my keys and my purse and I ran out of there. I finished getting dressed when I got outside. I then ran down the street. How did you get home? I got tired of running. And so I walked on Mulholland for a long time until I came to a fire station with a payphone out front. I used it to call a cab, then I went home. Did you call the police when you got home? Um, I didn't. Why not, Miss Crow? Well, 
two things. When I got home, David was leaving a message on my machine and I picked up. He apologized and said he got carried away. He told me he thought the choking was going to increase my satisfaction while we had sex. Did you believe him? I don't know. I was confused. Did you ask him why he had put your clothes in a bag? Yes. He said he thought he was going to have to take me to the hospital if I didn't wake up by the time he was out of the shower. Did you ask him why he thought he should take a shower before taking an unconscious woman in his bed to the hospital? I didn't ask that. Did you ask him why he didn't call for paramedics? No, I didn't think of that. What was the other reason you did not call the police? The witness looked down at her hands, which were grasping each other in her lap. Well, I was embarrassed. After he called, I wasn't sure anymore what had happened. You know, whether he had tried to kill me or was trying to satisfy me more. I don't know. You always hear about Hollywood people and weird sex. I thought maybe I was, I don't know, just being uncool and square about it. She kept her eyes down, and two more tears went down the slopes of her cheeks. Bosch saw a drop hit the collar of her chiffon blouse and leave a wet mark. Langweiser continued in a very soft tone. When did you contact the police about what happened that night with you and the defendant? Annabelle Crow responded in a softer tone. When I read about him being arrested for killing Jody Cremens the same way. You talked to Detective Bosch, then? She nodded. Yes, and I knew that if I'd... I'd called the police that night that maybe she'd still... She didn't finish. She grabbed tissues out of the box and started a full-force cry. Langweiser told the judge she was finished with her examination. Folks said there would be a cross-examination, but suggested that it should follow a break, during which time the defendant could compose herself. Judge Houghton said that was a good idea and called a fifteen-minute break. Bosch stayed in the courtroom, watching over Annabelle Crow as she went through the box of tissues. When she was done, her face was no longer as beautiful. It was distorted and red, her eye sockets swollen. Bosch thought she had been convincing— but he knew she hadn't faced folks yet. How she fared during the cross would determine whether the jury believed anything she had said on direct. When Langweiser came back in, she told Bosch there was someone at the outer door of the courtroom who wanted to speak to him. Who is it? I didn't ask. I just overheard him talking to the deputies as I went in. They wouldn't let him in. Was he in a suit? A black guy? No, street clothes, a windbreaker. Keep an eye on Annabelle, and you better find another box of tissues. He got up and went to the courtroom doors, working his way past all of the people coming back in at the end of the break. At one point, he came face to face with Rudy Tefero. Bosch moved to his right to go around him, but Tefero moved to his left. They danced back and forth a couple times, and Tefero smiled broadly. Bosch finally stopped and didn't move until Tefero pushed by him. In the hall, he looked around but didn't see anyone he recognized. Then Terry McCaleb walked out of the men's room, and they nodded to each other. Bosch walked over to the railing in front of one of the floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out on the plaza below. McCaleb walked up. I've got about two minutes, then I've got to get back in there. I just want to know if we can talk after court today. Things are happening, and I need some time with you. I know things are happening. Two agents showed up here today. What did you tell them? To fuck off. It made them mad. Federal agents don't take that sort of language that well. You should know that, Bosch. Yeah, well, I'm a slow learner. What about after? I'll be around, unless folks creams this wit. Then I don't know. My team might have to retreat somewhere to lick our wounds. All right, then I'll hang out, watch it on TV. Later. Bosch went back into the courtroom, wondering what McCaleb had come up with so quickly. 
The jury was back and the judge was giving folks the go-ahead. The defense attorney waited politely as Bosch moved by him to get to the prosecution table. Then he began. Now, Ms. Crow, is acting your full-time occupation? Yes. Have you been acting here today? Langweiser immediately objected, angrily accusing folks of harassing the witness. Bosch thought her reaction was a bit extreme, but knew she was sending a message to folks that she was going to defend her witness tooth and nail. The judge overruled the objection, saying folks was within bounds in cross-examining a witness hostile to his client. No, I am not acting. Crow answered forcefully. Folks nodded. You testified that you have been in Hollywood three years. Yes. I counted five paying jobs you spoke of. Anything else? Not yet. Folks nodded. Good to be hopeful. It's very difficult to break in, isn't it? Yes, very difficult. Very discouraging. But you are on TV right now, aren't you? She hesitated a moment, the realization that she had walked into a trap showing on her face. And so are you, she said. Bosch almost smiled. It was the best answer she could have given. Let's talk about this event that allegedly took place between you and Mr. Story, folks said. This event is, in fact, something you concocted from newspaper stories following David Story's arrest, correct? No, not correct. He tried to kill me. So you say. Langweiser stood up to object, but before she did, the judge admonished folks to keep such editorial comments to himself. The defense lawyer moved on. Now, after Mr. Story supposedly choked you to the point of unconsciousness, did you develop bruises on your neck? Yes. I had a bruise for almost a week. I had to stay inside. I couldn't go to auditions or anything. And you took photographs of the bruise to document its existence, correct? No, I didn't. But you showed the bruise to your agent and friends, did you not? No. And why is that? Because I didn't think it would ever come to this, where I would have to try to prove what he did. I just wanted it to go away, and I didn't want anyone to know. So we only have your word for the bruise, is that correct? Yes. Just as we only have your word for the entire alleged incident, correct? He tried to kill me. And you testified that when you got home that evening, David's story happened at that very moment to be leaving a message on your phone machine, correct? Absolutely. And you picked that call up, a call from the man you say tried to kill you? Do I have that right? Folks gestured as if grabbing a telephone. He held his hand up until she answered. Yes. And you saved that message on that tape to document his words and what had happened to you, correct? No. I taped over it. By mistake. By mistake? You mean you left it in the machine and eventually taped over it? Yes. I didn't want to, but I forgot, and it got taped over. You mean you forgot that someone tried to kill you and taped over it? No, I didn't forget that he tried to kill me. I'll never forget that. So as far as this tape goes, we only have your word for it, correct? That's right. There was a measure of defiance in her voice, but in a way it seemed pitiful to Bosch. It was like yelling, fuck you, into a jet engine. He sensed that she was about to be thrown into that jet engine and torn apart. Now, you testified that you are supported in part by your parents and that you have earned some monies as an actress. Is there any other source of income you haven't told us about? Well, not really. My grandmother sends me money, but not too often. Anything else? Not that I can think of. Do you take money from men on occasion, Ms. Crow? There was an objection from Langweiser, and the judge called the lawyers to a sidebar. Bosch watched Annabel Crow the whole time the lawyers whispered. 
He studied her face. There was still a brush stroke of defiance, but it was being crowded by fear. She knew something was coming. Bosch decided that folks had something legitimate that he was going after. It was something that was going to hurt her, and thereby hurt the case. When the sidebar broke up, Kretzler and Langweiser returned to their seats at the prosecution table. Kretzler leaned over to Bosch. We're fucked, he whispered. He's got four men that will testify they paid her for sex. Why didn't we know about this? Bosch didn't answer. She had been assigned to him for vetting. He'd questioned her at length about her personal life and had run her prints for an arrest record. Her answers and the computer run were clean. If she'd never been popped for prostitution and she denied any criminal activities to Bosch, there wasn't much else he could have done. Back at the lectern, folks rephrased the question. Miss Crow, have you ever taken money from men in exchange for sex? No, absolutely not. That is a lie. Do you know a man named Andre Snow? Yes, I do. If he were to testify under oath that he paid you for sexual relations, would he be lying? Yes, he would. Folks named three other men, and they went through the same loop of Crow acknowledging that she knew them, but denying she had ever sold them sex. Then have you ever taken money from these men but not for sex? Folks asked in a false tone of exasperation. Yes, on occasion. But it had nothing to do with whether we had sex or not. Then what did it have to do with? Them wanting to help me. I considered them friends. Did you ever have sex with them? Annabel Crow looked down at her hands and shook her head. Are you saying no, Miss Crow? I'm saying that I didn't have sex with them every time they gave me money. They didn't give me money every time we had sex. One thing had nothing to do with the other. You're trying to make it look like something it's not. I'm just asking questions, Miss Crow, as it's my job to do, as it's your job to tell this jury the truth. After a long pause, Folks said he had no further questions. Bosch realized that he'd been gripping the arms of his chair so tightly that his knuckles were white and had gone numb. He rubbed his hands together and tried to relax, but he couldn't. He knew that Folks was a master, a cut-and-run artist. He was brief and to the point, and was as devastating as a stiletto. Bosch realized that his discomfort was not only for Annabel Crow's helpless position and public humiliation, but for his own position. He knew the stiletto would be pointed at him next. Chapter 40 They settled into a booth at Nat's after getting bottles of rolling rock from the bartender with the tattoo of the barbed wire-wrapped heart. While she'd pulled the bottles from the cold case and opened them, the woman hadn't said anything about McCaleb having come in the other night and asking questions about the man he'd now returned with. It was early and the place was empty except for groups of hardcores at the bar and crowded into the booth all the way to the rear. Bruce Springsteen was on the jukebox singing, There's a Darkness at the Edge of Town. McCaleb studied Bosch. He thought he looked preoccupied by something, probably the trial. The last witness had been a wash at best, good on direct, bad on cross, the kind of witness you don't use, if you have the choice. Looks like you guys got sandbagged there with your wit. Bosch nodded. My fault. I should have seen it coming. I looked at her and thought she was so beautiful she couldn't possibly... I just believed her. I know what you mean. Last time I trust a face. You guys still look like you're in good shape. What else you got coming? Bosch smirked. That's it. They were going to rest today, but decided to wait until the morning so folks wouldn't have the night to get ready. But we fired all the bullets in the gun. Starting tomorrow, we see what they've got. McCaleb watched Bosch take down almost half the bottle in one long pull. He decided he'd better get to the real questions while Bosch was still sharp. 
So tell me about Rudy Tefero. Bosch shook his shoulders in a gesture of ambivalence. What about him? I don't know. How well do you know him? How well did you know him? Well, I knew him when he was on our team. He worked Hollywood detectives about five years while I was there. Then he pulled the pin, got his 20-year pension, and moved across the street. Started working on getting people we put in the bucket out of the bucket. When you were both on the same team, both in Hollywood, were you close? I don't know what close means. We weren't friends. We weren't drinking buddies. He worked burglaries and I worked homicides. What are you asking so much about him for? What's he got to do with... He stopped and looked at McCaleb, the wheels obviously turning inside. Rod Stewart was now singing Twisting the Night Away. Are you fucking kidding me? Bosch finally asked. You're looking at... Let me just ask some questions, McCaleb interjected. Then you can ask yours. Bosch drained his bottle and held it up until the bartender noticed. No table service, guys, she called over. Sorry. Fuck that, Bosch said. He slid out of the booth and went to the bar. He came back with four more rocks, though McCaleb had barely begun to drink his first one. Ask away, Bosch said. Why weren't you too close? Bosch put both elbows on the table and held a fresh bottle with both hands. He looked out of the booth and then at McCaleb. Five, ten years ago, there were two groups in the Bureau, and to a large extent, it was this way in the department, too. It was like the saints and the sinners, two distinct groups, the born-agains and the born-againsts, something like that. McCaleb remembered. It had become well known in local law enforcement circles a decade earlier that a group within the LAPD known as the Born Agains had members in key positions and was holding sway over promotions and choice assignments. The group's numbers, several hundred officers of all ranks, were members of a church in the San Fernando Valley where the department's deputy chief in charge of operations was a lay preacher. Ambitious officers joined the church in droves in hopes of impressing the deputy chief and enhancing their career prospects. How much spirituality was involved was in question. But when the deputy chief delivered his sermon every Sunday at the eleven o'clock service, the church would be packed to standing room only with off-duty cops casting their eyes fervently on the pulpit. McCaleb had once heard a story about a car alarm going off in the parking lot during an eleven o'clock service. The hapless hype rummaging through the vehicle's glove compartment soon found himself surrounded by a hundred guns pointed by off-duty cops. I take it you were on the sinner's team, Harry. Bosch smiled and nodded. Of course. And Teferro was on the saints. Yeah. And so was our lieutenant at the time, a paper pusher named Harvey Pounds. He and Teferro had their little church thing going, and so they were tight. I think anybody who was tight with Pounds, whether because of church or not, wasn't somebody I was going to gravitate toward, if you know what I mean. And they weren't going to gravitate toward me. McCaleb nodded. He knew more than he was letting on to. Pounds was the guy who messed up the gun case, he said. The one you pushed through the window. He's the one. Bosch dropped his head and shook it in self-disgust. Was Teferro there that day? Teferro? I don't know. Probably. Well, wasn't there an IAD investigation with witness reports? Yeah, but I didn't look at it. I mean, I pushed the guy through a window in front of the squad. I wasn't going to deny it. And later, what, a month or so? Pounds ends up dead in the tunnel up in the hills. Griffith Park, yeah. And it's still open. Bosch nodded. Technically. You said that before. What does that mean? It means it's open, but nobody's working it. The LAPD has a special classification for cases like it, cases they don't want to touch. It's what's called closed by circumstances other than arrest. And you know those circumstances? 
Bosch finished his second bottle, slid it to the side, and pulled a fresh bottle in front of him. You're not drinking, he said. You're doing enough for both of us. Do you know those circumstances? Bosch leaned forward. Listen, I'm going to tell you something very few people know about, okay? McCaleb nodded. He knew better to ask a question now. He would just let Bosch tell it. Because of that window thing, I went on suspension. When I got tired of walking around my house, staring at the walls, I started investigating an old case. A cold case. A murder case. I went freelancing on it, and I ended up following a blind trail to some very powerful people. But at the time, I had no badge, no real standing. So a few times, when I made some calls, I used Pound's name. You know, I was trying to hide what I was doing. If the department found out you were working a case while on suspension, things would have gotten worse for you. Exactly. So I used his name when I made what I thought were some routine, innocuous calls. But then one night, somebody called Pounds up and told him that they had something for him, some urgent information. He went to the meet by himself. Then they found him later in that tunnel. He'd been beaten pretty bad, like they tortured him. Only he couldn't answer their questions because he was the wrong guy. I was the one who had used his name. I was the one they wanted. Bosch dropped his chin to his chest and was silent for a long moment. I got him killed, he said without looking up. The guy was a purebred asshole, but my actions got him killed. Bosch suddenly jerked his head up and drank from his bottle. McCaleb saw his eyes were dark and shiny. They looked weary. Is that what you want to know, Terry? Does that help you? McCaleb nodded. How much of this would Teferro have known? Nothing. Could he have thought you were the one who called Pounds out that night? Maybe. There were people who did and probably still do, but what does it mean? What's it got to do with gun? McCaleb took his first long drink of beer. It was cold, and he felt the chill in his chest. He put the bottle down and decided it was time to give something back to Bosch. I need to know about Teferro because I need to know about reasons, motives. I have no proof of anything yet, but I think Teferro killed Gunn. He did it for story. He set you in the frame. Jesus. Nice, perfect frame. The crime scene is connected to the painter, Hieronymus Bosch. The painter is connected to you as his namesake, and then you are connected to Gunn. And you know when Story probably got the idea for it? Bosch shook his head. He looked too stunned to talk. The day you tried to interview him in his office. You played the tape in court last week. You identified yourself on it by your full first name. I always do. I... He then connects with Teferro, and Teferro has the perfect victim to put in the frame. Gun. A man he knew walked away from you in a murder charge six years ago. Bosch lifted his bottle a couple inches off the table and brought it back down hard. I think the plan was twofold. If they got lucky, the connection would be made quickly, and you'd be fighting a murder charge before Story's trial even started. If that didn't happen, then plan B. They would still have it to crush you with at trial. Destroy you? They destroy the case. Folks already took out that woman today and pot shot at a few of the other wits. What does the case rest on? You, Harry. They knew it would come down to you. Bosch turned his head slightly, and his eyes seemed to go blank as he stared at the scarred tabletop while considering what McCaleb had said. I needed to know your background with Teferro, because that's a question. Why would he do this? Yes, 
There probably is money in it and a hook into story if he walks. But there had to be something more. And I think you just told me what it was. He's probably hated you for a long time. Bosch looked up from the table and directly at McCaleb. It's a payback. McCaleb nodded. For pounds. And unless we get the proof of it, it might just work. Bosch was silent. He stared down at the table. He looked tired and washed out to McCaleb. Still want to shake his hand? Bosch raised his eyes to McCaleb's. Sorry, Harry, that was a cheap shot. Bosch shook his head, shrugging it off. I deserve it. So tell me, what do you have? Not a lot, but you were right. I missed something. Teferro bailed Gunn out on New Year's Eve. I think the plan was to kill him that night, set the scene, and let things take their course. The Hieronymus Bosch connection would come to light, either through J. Winston or the Bureau Vicap Inquiry, and you'd become a natural target. But then Gunn went and got himself drunk in here. He raised his bottle and gestured to the bar. And then he got himself deuced while driving home. Teferro had to get him out so they could stay with the plan, so he could kill him. That bail slip is the one direct link we have. Bosch nodded. McCaleb could tell he was seeing the scheme. They leaked it to that reporter, Bosch said. Once it hit the media, they could jump on it and use it and act like it was news to them, like they were behind the curve when all along they were bending the goddamn curve. McCaleb nodded hesitantly. He didn't bring up Buddy Lockridge's admission because it threw a jam into the working theory. What? Bosch asked. Nothing. I'm just thinking. You've got nothing other than Teferro posting the bail? A traffic ticket. And that's it for now. In detail, McCaleb described his morning's visits to Valentino Bonds in the post office and how his being 48 minutes late at the post office might be the difference in being able to clear Bosch and take down Teferro. Bosch winced and picked up his bottle, but then put it down without drinking from it. The parking ticket puts him at the post office, McCaleb offered. It's nothing. He's got an office five blocks away. He could claim it was the only parking place he could find. He could say he lent his car to somebody. It's nothing. McCaleb didn't want to concentrate on what they didn't have. He wanted to fill in pieces. Listen, the morning watch sergeant told us you had a standing request to be notified every time gun was brought in. Would Teferro have known about it? Either from before when he was still in the squad or some other way? He could have. It wasn't a secret. I was working on gun. Someday I was going to break him. By the way, what did Pounds look like? Bosch gave him a confused look. Short, wide, and balding with a mustache? Bosch nodded and was about to ask a question when McCaleb answered it. His picture is on the wall in Teferro's office, Pounds giving him the Detective of the Month plaque. I bet you never got one of those, Harry. Not with Pounds making the pick. But Caleb looked up and saw that Jay Winston had entered the bar. She was carrying a briefcase. He nodded to her and she started toward the booth, walking with her shoulders up as though she were carefully stepping through a landfill. McCaleb moved over, and she slid into the booth next to him. Nice place. Harry, McCaleb said. I believe you know Jay Winston. Bosch and Winston looked at each other. First thing, Winston said. I'm sorry about the thing with Kiz. I hope we do what we have to do, Bosch said. You want a drink? They don't come to the table here. I'd be shocked if they did. Maker's Mark rocks if they have it. Terry, you cool? 
Cool. Bosch slid out to get the drink. Winston turned to look at McCaleb. How's it going? Little pieces here and there. How's he taking it? Not bad, I guess, for a guy who's been put into a pretty big box. How'd you do? She smiled in a way that McCaleb could tell meant she had come up with something. I got you the photo and a couple other interesting pieces. Bosch put Winston's drink down in front of her and slid back into the booth. She laughed when I said, Maker's Mark, he said. That's the house swill there. Wonderful. Thank you. Winston moved her glass to the side and brought her briefcase up onto the table. She opened it, removed a file, and then closed the briefcase and put it back on the floor next to the booth. McCaleb watched Bosch, watching her. There was an expectant look on his face. Winston opened the file and slid a five-by-eight photo of Rudy Tefero over to McCaleb. That's from his bonding license. It's eleven months old. She then referred to a page of typed notes. I went to county lockup and pulled everything on story. He was held there until they transferred him to Van Nuys Jail for the trial. During his stay in county, he had nineteen visits from Tefero. The first twelve visits coming during the first three weeks he was there. During that same period, folks only visited him four times. A lawyer in Folk's office visited an additional four times, and Story's executive assistant, a woman named Batilda Lockett, visited six times. That's it. He was meeting with his investigator more often than his lawyers. That's when they planned it, McCaleb said. She nodded and then smiled in that same way again. What? McCaleb asked. Just saving the best for last. She brought her briefcase back up and opened it. The jail keeps records of all property and possessions of inmates. Things that were brought in with them. Things approved and passed to them by visitors. There is a notation in Story's records that his assistant, Batilda Lockett, was allowed to give him a book during the second of her six visits. According to the property report, it was called The Art of Darkness. I went to the downtown library and checked it out. From her briefcase, she took a large, heavy book with a blue cloth cover. She started opening it on the table. There was a yellow post-it sticking out as a marker. It's a study of artists who use darkness as a vital part of the visual medium, according to the introduction. She looked up and smiled as she got to the post-it. It has a rather long chapter on Hieronymus Bosch, complete with illustrations. McCaleb lifted his empty bottle and clicked against her glass, which she still hadn't touched. He then leaned in, along with Bosch, to look at the pages. Beautiful, he said. Winston turned the pages. The book's illustrations of Bosch's work included all of the painting from which pieces of the crime scene could be traced. The stone operation, the seven deadly sins with the eye of God, the last judgment, and the garden of earthly delights. He planned the thing right there from his cell, McCaleb marveled. Looks like it, Winston said. They both looked at Bosch, who was nodding his head almost imperceptibly. Now your turn, Harry, McCaleb said. Bosch looked perplexed. My turn at what? At making good luck. McCaleb slid the picture of Tefero across the table and nodded toward the bartender. Bosch slid out and took the photo to the bar. We're still just dancing around the edges. Winston said as they both watched Bosch question the bartender about the photo. We've got little pieces, but that's it. I know, McCaleb said. He couldn't hear what was being said at the bar. The music was too loud. Van Morrison singing, The Wild Night is Coming.
Bosch nodded to the bartender and came back to the booth. She recognizes him. Drinks Kahlua and cream, of all things. She can't put him here with gun, though. McCaleb shrugged his shoulders in a no-big-deal gesture. It was worth the shot. You know where this is going, don't you? Bosch said, his eyes shifting from McCaleb's to Winston's and then back. You're going to have to make a play. It's going to be the only way. And it's got to be a damn good play because my ass is on the line. McCaleb nodded. We know, he said. When? I'm running out of time. McCaleb looked at Winston. It was her call. Soon, she said. Maybe tomorrow. I haven't gone into the office with this yet. I have to finesse my captain on it because last he knew, Terry here was banished and I was working with the Bureau on you. I also have to get a DA involved because when we make the move, we'll have to move fast. If it all works out, I say we take Teferro in tomorrow night and make the play to him. Bosch looked down at the table with a rueful smile. He slid an empty bottle back and forth between his hands. I met those guys today. The agents. I heard. You didn't exactly assure them of your innocence. They came back all hot and bothered. Bosch looked up. So what do you need from me on this? We need you to sit tight, Winston said. We'll let you know about tomorrow night. Bosch nodded. There's one thing, McCaleb said. The exhibits from the trial, do you have access to them? During court, yeah. Otherwise they stay with the clerk. Why? Because Story obviously had existing knowledge of the painter Hieronymus Bosch. He had to have recognized your name during that interview and known what he could do with it. So I'm thinking that book his assistant brought him in jail had to be his own. He told her to bring it to him. Bosch nodded. The picture of the bookcase. McCaleb nodded. You got it. I'll let you know. Bosch looked around the place. Are we done here? We're done, Winston said. We'll be in touch. She slid out of the booth followed by Bosch and McCaleb. They left two beers and a whiskey rocks untouched on the table. At the door, McCaleb glanced back and saw a couple of the hardcores moving in on the treasure. From the jukebox, John Fogarty was singing, There's a Bad Moon on the Rise. Chapter 41 the chill off the water worked its way into McCaleb's bones. He shoved his hands deep into the pockets of his windbreaker and turtled his neck as far down into the collar as he could as he carefully made his way down the ramp to the Cabrillo Marina docks. Though his chin was down, his eyes were alert in scanning the docks for unusual movement. Nothing caught his attention. He glanced at Buddy Lockridge's sailboat as he passed. Despite all of the junk, surfboards, bikes, gas grill, an ocean kayak, and other assorted equipment and debris, crowding the deck, he could see the cabin lights were on. He walked quietly on the wood planking. He decided that whether Buddy was awake or not, it was too late, and McCaleb was too tired and cold to deal with his supposed partner. Still, as he approached the following sea, he couldn't help but move his mind over the sharp-edged anomaly in his working theory on the case. Back at the bar, Bosch had been correct when he deduced that someone from the story camp had to have leaked the story of the gun investigation to the New Times. McCaleb knew that the only way the current case theory hung together was if Teferro, or maybe folks, or even story from jail, had been Jack McAvoy's source. The problem was that Buddy Lockridge had told McCaleb that he had leaked the investigation to the weekly tabloid. Now, the only way, at least as it appeared to McCaleb, 
that this could work would be if both Buddy and someone in Story's defense group leaked the same information to the same media source. And this, of course, was a coincidence that even a believer in coincidence would have a difficult time accepting. Michaela tried to put it out of his mind for the moment. He got to the boat, looked around again, and stepped down into the cockpit. He unlocked the slider and went in, turning on the lights. He decided that in the morning he would go over and question Buddy more carefully about what he had done and who he had talked to. He locked the door and put his keys and the videotape he'd been carrying down on the chart table. He immediately went to the galley and poured a large glass of orange juice. He then turned the upper deck lights off and took the juice with him down to the lower deck where he went into the head and quickly began his evening pill ritual. As he swallowed the pills and orange juice, he looked at himself in the small mirror over the sink. He thought about what Bosch had looked like. The weariness clearly set deep in his eyes. McCaleb wondered if he would get the same look in a few years, after a few more cases. When he was finished with his medicine routine, he stripped off his clothes and took a quick shower, the water feeling ice cold because the water heater hadn't been on since he had crossed in the boat the day before. Shivering, he went into the master cabin and put on a pair of boxer shorts and a sweatshirt. He was dead tired, but once he got into the bed, he decided he should write a few notes about his thoughts on how J. Winston should run the play with Teferro. He reached down to the nightstand's drawer, where he kept pens and scratch pads. When he opened it, he found a folded newspaper crammed into the small drawer space. He pulled it out, unfolded it, and found it was the previous week's issue of New Times. The pages had been folded backwards so that the rear advertising section was at the front. But Caleb was looking at a page full of matchbox-sized ads under a heading that said, Out Call Massage. But Caleb suddenly realized something. He got up quickly and went to his windbreaker which he had tossed onto a chair. He pulled the cell phone out of the pocket and went back to the bed with it. Though McCaleb had been carrying the phone with him in recent days, it usually stayed in its charger on the boat. It was paid for out of charter funds and was carried as a business expense. It was used by clients during the charter trips and by Buddy Lockridge while confirming reservations and running credit card authorizations. The phone had a small digital screen with a menu he scrolled through. He opened the call log program and began scrolling through the last 100 numbers the phone had been used to call. Most of the numbers he quickly identified and eliminated. But every time he didn't recognize a number, he compared it to the phone numbers at the bottom of the ads on the massage page. The fourth unrecognized number he compared to the ads was a match. The number was for a woman who advertised herself as an exotic Japanese-Hawaiian beauty named Leilani. Her ad said she specialized in full-service relaxation and was not associated with any massage agency. McCaleb closed the phone and got off the bed again. He started pulling on a pair of sweatpants as he tried to recall exactly what had been said when he'd accused Buddy Lockridge of leaking the case information to the New Times. By the time he was dressed, McCaleb realized he'd never specifically accused Buddy of leaking information to the newspaper. He'd only mentioned the New Times, and Buddy had immediately begun to apologize. McCaleb now understood that Buddy's apology and embarrassment could have been over his using the following sea the week before, when it was in the marina as a rendezvous point with the full-service massage woman. It explained why he had asked if McCaleb was going to tell Graciela what he had done. McCaleb looked at his watch. 
It was ten after eleven. He grabbed the newspaper and went topside. He didn't want to wait until the morning to confirm this. He guessed that Buddy had used the following sea to meet the woman because his own boat was so small and cramped and looked like a forbidding floating rat trap. There was no master cabin, just one open space that was as crowded with junk as the deck above. If Buddy had the following sea available to him, he would have used it. In the salon, he didn't bother turning on the lights. He leaned over the couch and looked out the window to the boat's left. Buddy's boat, the double down, was four slips away, and he could see the cabin lights were still on. Buddy was still awake, unless he'd passed out with the lights on. McCaleb went to the slider and unlocked it. He'd just pulled the door open and was stepping through when he was suddenly grabbed from behind. Before he understood what was happening, an arm came over his right shoulder and in front of him. It bent at the elbow and his neck was shoved into the V it formed by his attacker's other forearm. The triangle this created closed like a vice on both sides of his neck, compressing the carotid arteries that carried oxygenated blood to his brain. McCaleb had an almost clinical understanding of what was happening. He began to struggle. He brought his arms up and tried to dig his fingers under the forearm and biceps on either side of his neck, but it was no use. He was already weakening. He was dragged back away from the door and into the darkness of the salon. He reached his left hand back to the point where his attacker's right hand gripped his left forearm, the weak point of the triangle but he had no leverage and was losing power quickly. He tried to yell. Maybe Buddy would hear. But his voice was gone, and nothing came out. He remembered another defensive measure. He raised his right foot up and drove it down, heel first, toward his attacker's foot with the last strength he could muster. But he missed. His heel hit the floor ineffectively, and his attacker took another step backward, violently pulling McCaleb off balance and unable to attempt the kick release again. McCaleb was quickly losing consciousness. His vision of the marina lights through the salon door was being crowded by closing blackness with a reddish outline. His last thoughts were that he was in the grip of a classic chokehold the kind taught at police departments across the country until too many deaths resulted from its use. Soon even that thought drifted away, and he saw no lights. The darkness moved in and took him. Chapter 42 McCaleb came awake to tremendous muscular pain in his shoulders and upper legs. When he opened his eyes, he realized he was lying chest down across the master cabin's bed. His head was lying flat on the mattress, his left cheek down, and he was staring at the headboard. It took him a moment before he remembered that he had been on his way to visit Buddy Lockridge when he'd been attacked from behind. He became completely conscious and tried to relax his aching muscles, but realized he couldn't move. His wrists were bound behind his back, and his legs were bent backward at the knees and were being held in that position by someone's hand. He lifted his head off the mattress and tried to turn. He couldn't get the angle. He dropped back to the mattress and turned his head to the left. He lifted up once again and turned to see Rudy Taffero, standing next to the bed, smiling at him. With one gloved hand, he was holding McCaleb's feet, which were bound at the ankles and folded back toward his thighs. Comprehension rushed over him. McCaleb realized he was naked and that he was bound and held in the same posture as he had seen the body of Edward Gunn. The reverse fetal pose from the painting by Hieronymus Bosch. A cold chill of terror exploded in his chest. He instinctively flexed his leg muscles. Teferro was ready for it. His feet barely moved. 
but he heard three clicks behind his head and became aware of the ligature around his neck. Easy, Teferro said. Easy now, not yet. McCaleb stopped his movement. Teferro continued to press his ankles down toward the back of his thighs. You've seen the setup before, Teferro said matter-of-factly. This one's a little different. I strung together a bunch of snap cuffs, like every L.A. cop carries around in the trunk of his car. McCaleb understood the message. The plastic strips first invented to bundle cables together, but found to be useful by police agencies faced with occasional social unrest and the need to make mass arrests. A cop can carry one set of handcuffs, but hundreds of snap cuffs. String them around the wrists, slide the end through the lock. Tiny grooves in the plastic strip click and lock as the tie gets tighter. The only way to remove it is to cut it off. McCaleb realized that the clicking sound he'd just heard had been a snap cuff tightening around his neck. So you be careful now. To Pharaoh said, hold real steady. McCaleb put his face down into the mattress. His mind was racing, looking for the way out. He thought if he could engage to Pharaoh, he might buy some time. But time for what? How'd you find me? He spoke into the mattress. Easy enough. My little brother followed you from my shop and got your plate. You should look around more often. Make sure you aren't being followed. I remember that. He understood the plan. It would look like Gunn's killer had gotten McCaleb when he had gotten too close. He turned his head again so he could see Teferro. It's not going to work, Teferro, he said. People know. They're not going to buy that it was Bosch. Teferro smiled down at him. You mean Jay Winston? Don't worry about her. I'm going to go pay her a visit when I'm done here with you. 8801 Willoughby, apartment 6, West Hollywood. She was easy to find, too. He raised his free hand and waved the fingers as though he were playing the piano or typing. Let your fingers do the walking through the voter's registration. I've got it on a CD-ROM. She's a registered Democrat, if you can believe it. A homicide cop who votes Democrat. Wonders never cease. There are others. The FBI's on this. You... They're on Bosch, not me. I saw them today at the courthouse. He reached down and ticked one of the snap cuffs strung from McCaleb's legs to his neck. And these, I'm sure, will help bring them directly to Detective Bosch. He smiled at the genius of his own plan, and McCaleb knew his thinking was sound. Twilly and Friedman would go after Bosch like a pair of dogs chasing either side of a car. Hold steady now. DeFerro let go of his feet and moved out of his sight. McCaleb strained to keep his legs from unfolding. Almost immediately he felt the muscles in his legs start to burn. He knew he didn't have the strength to hold them for long. Please! Teferro returned to view. He was holding a plastic owl in both hands, a delighted smile on his face. Took this one off one of the boats down the dock. A little weathered, but it'll work out nice. Gonna get another one for Winston. He looked around the room as if looking for a place for the owl. He settled on a shelf above the built-in bureau. He placed the owl there, looked back at McCaleb once, and then adjusted it so the plastic bird's gaze was upon him. Perfect, he said. McCaleb closed his eyes. He could feel his muscles vibrating with the strain. An image of his daughter appeared in his mind. She was in his arms. Her eyes were watching him over the bottle.
and telling him not to worry or be afraid. It soothed him. He concentrated on her face and somehow thought he could even smell her hair. He felt tears going down his face and his legs started to give way. He heard the clicking of the cuffs and... Teferro grabbed his legs and held them. Not yet. Something hard banged off McCaleb's head and thudded on the mattress next to him. He turned his face and opened his eyes and saw it was the videotape he had gone back to borrow from Lucas, the post office security officer. He looked at the post office emblem of the flying eagle on the sticker Lucas had put on the tape for him. I hope you don't mind. But while you were sleeping off the chokehold, I took a look at the tape on your VCR. I couldn't find anything on it. It's blank. Why is that? McCaleb felt a pang of hope. He realized that the only reason he wasn't already dead was because of the tape. Teferro had found it, and it raised too many questions. It was a break. McCaleb tried to think of a way to turn it further to his advantage. The tape was supposed to be blank. They were going to use it as a prop when they brought Teferro in and tried to play him. It would have been part of a bluff. They would hold it up and tell him they had him on tape sending the money order. But they actually wouldn't play it. Now McCaleb thought he might be able to still use it. But in reverse. Teferro shoved down hard on his ankles, so hard they came close to touching McCaleb's buttocks. McCaleb groaned from the stress on his muscles. Teferro eased back. I asked you a question, motherfucker. Now you fucking answer it. It's nothing. It's supposed to be blank. Bullshit. The label says December 22nd. It says Wilcox Surveillance. Why is it blank? He increased the pressure on McCaleb's legs, but not to the point of a few moments before. Okay, I'll tell you the truth. I'll tell you. McCaleb took a deep breath and tried to relax. In the moment his body was still, when the air was held in his lungs, he thought he detected a movement of the boat that was out of rhythm with the gentle rise and fall cycle of the marina's wake. Somebody had stepped onto the boat. He could only think of Buddy Lockridge. And if it was him, then he was most likely walking into his own doom. McCaleb started to speak quickly and loudly, hoping his voice would warn Lockridge off. It's just a prop, that's all. We were going to bluff you, tell you we had you on tape buying the money order that bought the owl. The plan, the plan was to get you to turn on story. We know it was his plan from the jail. You just followed orders. They want story more than they want you. I was going to... All right, shut up. McCaleb was quiet. He wondered if Teferro had felt the boat move unusually or if he had heard something. But then McCaleb watched as the tape was lifted off the bed. He realized he had Teferro thinking. After a long moment of silence, Teferro finally spoke. I think you're full of shit, McCaleb. I think this tape is out of one of those multiplex surveillance systems they use. It won't read on a regular VCR. If it didn't seem that every muscle in his body was screaming in pain, McCaleb might have smiled. He had to Pharaoh. He was helplessly hogtied on the bed, but he was playing his captor. To Pharaoh was second-guessing his own plan. Who else has copies? To Pharaoh asked. McCaleb didn't answer. He started thinking that he'd been wrong about the boat's movement. Too much time had gone by. There was no one else on board. Teferro wrapped the tape hard on the back of McCaleb's head. I said, who else has copies? 
There was a new note in the tone of his voice. One part confidence had been removed and replaced with one equal part fear that there was a flaw in his perfect plan. Fuck you, McCaleb said. You do what you have to do with me. Either way, you'll be finding out who's got copies soon enough. Teferro pushed down on his legs and leaned over him. McCaleb could feel his breath close to his ear. Listen to me, you fucking... There was a sudden loud crash from behind McCaleb. Don't fucking move! A voice called. In the same instant, Teferro stood up and let go of McCaleb's legs. The sudden release of pressure, coupled with the jarring noise, made McCaleb startle and involuntarily flex his muscles at once. He heard the zipping sound of snap cuffs clicking in several places of his bindings. In chain reaction, the cuff around his neck pulled tight and locked. He tried to raise his legs, but it was too late. The cuff was set. It was biting into his neck. He had no air. He opened his mouth, but not a sound came out. Chapter 43 Harry Bosch stood in the doorway of the boat's downstairs cabin and pointed his gun at Rudy Teferro. His eyes widened as he took in the whole room. Terry McCaleb was naked on the bed, his arms and legs bound behind him. Bosch saw that several snap cuffs had been linked together and used to bind his wrists and ankles, while a leader ran from his ankles and under his wrists to a loop around his neck. He couldn't see McCaleb's face, but saw the plastic was digging tightly into his neck and the skin was a dark rouge. He was strangling. Turn around, he yelled at Teferro. Get back against the wall. He needs help, Bosh. You... I said get back against the fucking wall now. He raised the gun to Teferro's chest level to drive home the order. Teferro raised his hands and started turning to the wall. Okay, okay, I'm turning around. As soon as Teferro had turned, Bosch moved quickly into the room and shoved the big man up against the wall. He glanced at McCaleb. He could see his face now. It was getting redder. His eyes were opened and bugged. His mouth was opened in a desperate but fruitless bid for air. Bosch pushed the barrel of his gun into Teferro's back and reached his other hand around him to check for a weapon. He pulled a handgun out of his belt and then stepped back. He looked at McCaleb again and knew he didn't have any time. The problem was controlling Teferro and getting to McCaleb to cut him free. He suddenly knew what needed to be done. He stepped back and brought his hands together so that the guns were side by side. He raised them over his head and brought the butts of both guns down violently into the back of Teferro's head. The big man pitched forward, going face first into the wood-paneled wall, and then dropping to the floor motionless. Bosch turned and dropped both guns onto the bed and quickly pulled out his keys. Hold on, hold on, hold on. His fingers scrabbling, he pulled the blade out of the penknife attached to the keychain. He reached to the plastic cuff embedded around McCaleb's neck, but couldn't get his fingers underneath it. He shoved McCaleb onto his side and quickly worked his fingers under the cuff at the front of his neck. He slipped the blade in and sliced through the cuff, the point of the knife just nicking the skin beneath it. A horrible sound came from McCaleb's throat as he gulped air into his lungs and tried to speak at the same time. The words were unintelligible, lost in the instinctive urgency for oxygen intake. Shut up and breathe, Bosch yelled. Just breathe. There came an interior rattling sound with each breath McCaleb took. Bosch saw a vibrant red line running the circumference of his neck. 
He gently touched McCaleb's neck, wanting to feel for possible damage to the trachea or larynx or the arteries. McCaleb roughly turned his head on the mattress and tried to move away. Just cut me loose! The words made him cough violently into the mattress, his whole body shaking from the trauma. Bosch used the knife to cut his hands free and then his ankles. He saw red ligature marks on both sets of limbs. He pulled all the snap cuffs away and threw them on the floor. He looked around and saw the sweatpants and shirt on the floor. He picked them up and threw them onto the bed. McCaleb was slowly turning back to face him, his face still as red as a new potato. You... you... saved. Don't talk. There was a groan from the floor, and Bosch saw Teferro start moving as he began to regain consciousness. Bosch stepped over and stood straddling him. He took his handcuffs off his belt, bent down, and then violently pulled Teferro's arms behind his back to cuff him. While he worked, he talked to McCaleb. Hey, you want to take this guy out? Tie him to the anchor and drop him over the side. It'd be fine by me. I wouldn't even blink about it. McCaleb didn't respond. He was pulling himself into a sitting position. Finished with the cuffing process, Bosch straightened up and looked down at Teferro, who'd now opened his eyes. Stay still, shithead, and get used to those cuffs. You're under arrest for murder, attempted murder, and general conspiracy to be an asshole. I think you know your rights, but do yourself a favor and don't say a word until I get the card out and read it to you. The moment he was done speaking, Bosch became aware of a creaking sound coming from the hallway. In that second, he realized someone had used his words as cover to get close to the doorway. Things seemed to drop into a slow-motion sense of clarity. Bosch instinctively brought his left hand up to his hip, but realized his gun was not there. He'd left it on the bed. He started to turn to the bed, but saw McCaleb sitting up, still naked, and already pointing one of the guns at the doorway. Bosch's eyes followed the aim of the gun to the door. A man was swinging into the opening in a crouched position, two hands on a pistol. He was taking aim at Bosch. There was a shot and wood splintered from the door jamb. The gunman flinched and squinted his eyes. He recovered and started to level the aim of his gun. There was another shot, and another, and then another. The noise was deafening in the confines of the wood-paneled room. Bosch watched one bullet hit the wall, and two hit the gunman in the chest, throwing him backward into the hallway wall. He sank to the floor, but was still visible from the bedroom. No! Teferro shouted from the floor. Jesse, no! The wounded gunman was still moving, but having difficulty with motor controls. With one hand, he awkwardly raised the gun again and made a pathetic attempt to aim it once more at Bosch. There was another shot, and Bosch saw the gunman's cheek explode with blood. His head snapped back against the wall behind him, and he became still. No! Teferro cried out again. And then there was silence. Bosch looked at the bed. McCaleb still held the gun aimed at the door. A cloud of blue gunpowder smoke was rising into the center of the room. The air smelled acrid and burned. Bosch picked his gun up off the bed and went out to the hallway. He squatted down next to the gunman but didn't need to touch him to know he was dead. During the shooting, he thought he recognized him as Teferro's younger brother who worked in the bail bonds office. Now most of his face was gone. Bosch got up and went into the head to grab a tissue. He then used it to take the gun out of the dead man's grip. He carried it back into the master cabin and put it down on the nightstand. The gun McCaleb had used was now lying on the bed. McCaleb stood on the other side of the bed. He had the sweatpants on and was pulling the shirt over his head. 
Once his head came through, he looked at Bosch. Bosch nodded. Looks like we're even, he said. Teferro worked his way up into a sitting position against the wall. Blood had run out of his nose and down around both sides of his mouth. It looked like a grotesque Fu Manchu. Bosch guessed that his nose had been broken when he'd gone face first into the wall. He sat slumped against the wall, his eyes staring in horror through the doorway to the body in the hallway. Bosch used the tissue to pick the gun up off the bed and put it next to the other one on the nightstand. He then took a cell phone out of his pocket and punched in a number. While he waited for the call to connect, he looked at Teferro. You got your little brother killed, Rudy, he said. That's too bad. Teferro lowered his eyes and started crying. Bosch's call was answered at Central Dispatch. He gave the address of the marina and said he was going to need a homicide team from the officer-involved shooting unit. He would need a coroner's crew and techs from Scientific Investigation Division to respond as well. He told the dispatcher to make all notifications by landline. He didn't want the media to get wind of the incident off a police scanner until the time was right. He closed the phone and held it up for McCaleb to see. You want an ambulance? You should get checked out. I'm fine. Your neck looks like it could... I said I'm fine. Bosch nodded. Suit yourself. He came around the bed and stood in front of Teferro. I'm going to get him out of here, put him in the car. He dragged Teferro to his feet and pushed him to the door. As he passed his brother's body in the hallway, Teferro let out a loud, animal-like wail, a kind of sound Bosch was surprised to hear coming from such a big man. Yeah, it's too bad, Bosch said without a note of sympathy in his voice. The kid had a bright future helping you kill people and getting people out of jail. He shoved Teferro toward the steps up to the salon. On the way up the gangway to the parking lot, Bosch saw a man standing on the deck of a sailboat cluttered with rafts and surfboards and other junk. The man looked at Bosch, and then to Faro, and then back to Bosch. His eyes were wide, and it was clear he recognized them, probably from the trial coverage on TV. Hey, I heard shots. Is Terry okay? He's going to be fine. Can I go talk to him? Better not. The cops are coming. Let them handle it. Hey, you're Bosch, aren't you? From the trial? Yeah, I'm Bosch. The men said nothing else. Bosch kept moving with Teferro. When Bosch came back onto the boat a few minutes later, McCaleb was in the galley drinking a glass of orange juice. Behind him and down the steps, the splayed legs of a dead man were visible. A neighbor of yours out there asked about you. McCaleb nodded. Buddy. That's all he said. Bosch looked out the window and back up at the parking lot. He thought he could hear sirens in the distance, but thought it might just be the wind playing sound games. They're going to be here any minute, he said. How's the throat? I hope you can talk, because we're going to have a lot of explaining to do. That's fine. Why were you here, Harry? Bosch put his car keys down on the countertop. He didn't answer for a long moment. I just sort of guessed you might be drawing a bead, that's all. How so? You busting in on his brother at the office this morning? I figured that if he followed you, he might have gotten a plate or something they could trace to you here. McCaleb looked pointedly at him. And what? You were hanging out in the marina and saw Rudy, but not little brother? Nah, I just drove down and cruised around a little. I saw Rudy's old Lincoln parked up there in the lot and figured something was going on. I never saw the little brother. He must have been hiding somewhere and watching. 
I'm thinking he was on the docks, looking for an owl he could take off a boat to use at Winston's. They were improvising tonight. Bosch nodded. Anyway, I was looking around and saw the door open on your boat and decided to check it out. I thought it was too cold a night and you were too careful a guy to sleep with the door open like that. McCaleb nodded. Bosch now heard the unmistakable sound of approaching sirens and looked out the window and across the docks to the parking lot. He saw two patrol cars glide in and stop near his slick back where Teferro was locked in the back. They killed the sirens but left the blue lights flashing. I'd better go meet the boys in blue, he said. Chapter 44 For most of the night they were separated and questioned, and then questioned again. Then the interrogators switched rooms, and they heard the same questions once more from different mouths. Five hours after the shooting on the following sea, the doors were opened, and McCaleb and Bosch stepped out into a hallway at Parker Center. Bosch came up to him then. You okay? Tired, yeah. McCaleb watched him put a cigarette in his mouth, but not light it. I'm heading out to the sheriff's, Bosch said. I want to be there. McCaleb nodded. I'll see you there. They stood side by side behind the one-way glass, squeezed in next to the videographer. McCaleb was close enough to smell Bosch's menthol cigarette breath, and the glove-box cologne he had seen him put on in his car while driving behind him out to Whittier. He could see the faint reflection of Bosch's face in the glass, and he realized he was looking through it into what was happening in the next room. On the other side of the glass was a conference table with Rudy Teferro, seated next to a public defender named Arnold Prince. Teferro had white tape spread across his nose and cotton in both nostrils. He had six stitches in the crown of his head, which couldn't be seen because of his full head of hair. Paramedics had treated him for a broken nose and a head laceration at Cabrillo Marina. Across from Teferro sat Jay Winston. To her right was Alice Short from the DA's office. To her left was Deputy Chief Irvin Irving of the LAPD and Donald Twilley of the FBI. The early morning hours had been spent with all law enforcement agencies remotely involved in the investigation, jockeying for the best position to take advantage of what all players knew to be a major case. It was now 6.30 in the morning, and time to question the suspect. It had been decided that Winston would handle the questioning, it being her case from the beginning, while the other three looked on and were available to her for advice. She began the interview by stating the date, time, and identities of those in the room. She then read to Pharaoh his constitutional rights and had him sign an acknowledgment form. His attorney then said that to Pharaoh would not be making a statement at the present time. That's fine, Winston said, her eyes on to Pharaoh. I don't need him to talk to me. I want to talk to him. I want to give him an idea of what he's facing here. I don't want there to be any regrets down the line over miscommunications or his passing up the one opportunity to cooperate that he'll be given. She looked down at the file in front of her and opened it. McCaleb recognized the top sheet as a DA's office complaint form. Mr. Teferro, Winston began, I want you to know that this morning we are charging you with the first-degree murder of Edward Gunn on January 1st of this year, the attempted murder of Terrell McCaleb on this date, and the murder of Jesse Teferro, also on this date. I know you know the law, but I am compelled to explain the last charge. Your brother's death occurred during the commission of a felony. Therefore, under California law, you as his co-conspirator are held responsible for his death. She waited a beat, staring into Teferro's seemingly dead eyes. She went back to reading the complaint. Further, you should know that the district attorney's office has agreed to file a count of special circumstances in regard to the murder of Edward Gunn. To wit, murder for hire. The addition of special circumstances will make it a death penalty case. Alice? Short leaned forward. She was an attractive but petite woman in her late thirties with big, engaging eyes. 
She was the deputy chief in charge of major trials. It was a lot of power in such a small body, especially when contrasted with the size of the man across the table from her. Mr. Teferro, you were a policeman for twenty years, she said. You, more than most, know the gravity of your actions. There is not a case I can think of that cries out more for the death penalty. We will ask a jury for it, and I have no doubt we will get it. Her rehearsed part of the play finished. Short leaned back in her chair and deferred to Winston. There was a long silence while Winston stared at Teferro and waited for him to look back at her. Eventually, his eyes came up and held on hers. Mr. Teferro, you've been around, and you've even been in the opposite position in rooms just like this before. I don't think we could play a game on you if we had a year to work it out. So no game. Just the offer. A one-time offer that will be rescinded permanently when we walk out of this room. It comes down to this. The focus of Teferro's eyes had dropped to the table again. Winston leaned forward and looked up into them. Do you want to live, or do you want to take your chances with the jury? It's as simple as that. And before you answer, there are a few things to consider. Number one, the jurors are going to see photographic evidence of what you did to Edward Gunn. Two, they're going to hear Terry McCaleb describe what it was like to be so helpless and to feel his own life being choked away by your design. You know, I don't usually bet on such things, but I'd give it less than an hour. My bet is that it will be one of the quickest death verdicts ever returned to the state of California. Winston pulled back and closed the file in front of her. McCaleb found himself nodding. She was doing very well. We want your employer, Winston said. We want physical evidence that will link him to the gun case. I have a feeling that someone like you would take precautions before carrying out such a scheme. Whatever it is. We want what you have. She looked at Short, and the prosecutor nodded, her way of saying well done. Almost half a minute went by. Finally, Teferro turned to his attorney and was about to whisper a question. Then he turned back to Winston. Fuck it, I'll ask myself. Without acknowledging a fucking thing here, what if you drop the special circumstances? What am I facing? Winston immediately burst out laughing and shook her head. McCaleb smiled. Are you kidding? Winston asked. What am I facing? Man, you are going to be buried in concrete and steel. That's what you are facing. You are never, ever going to see the light of day again. Deal? No deal. That is a given and non-negotiable. Teferro's attorney cleared his throat. Ms. Winston! This is hardly a professional manner in which I don't give a shit about my manner. This man is a killer. He's no different from a hitman except... No, he's worse. He used to carry a badge and that makes it all the more despicable. So this is what we'll do for your client, Mr. Prince. We'll take guilty pleas to the murder of Edward Gunn and the attempted on Terry McCaleb. Life without on both counts. Non-negotiable. We'll no-bill the charge on his brother. Maybe it will help him live with it better if he doesn't carry the charge. I don't really care. What I care about is that he understands that his life, as he knows it, is over. He's gone. And he can either go to death row or supermax. But he's going to one of them and not coming back. She looked at her watch. You've got about five minutes, and then we're out of here. You don't want the deal? Fine. We'll take both of them to trial. Story might be a long shot, but there's no question about Mr. Teferro here. Alice is going to have prosecutors knocking down her door, sending her flowers and chocolates. Every day is going to be Valentine's Day, or Valentino's Day, as the case may be. This one's a ticket to prosecutor of the year. Prince brought a slim briefcase up onto the table and slid his legal pad into it. He hadn't written a word on it. Thank you for your time, he said. I think what we'll do is proceed to a bail hearing and go from there with discovery and other matters. He pushed his chair back and stood up. Teferro slowly raised his head and looked at Winston, his eyes badly bloodshot from the hemorrhaging of his nose. 
It was his idea to make it look like a painting, he said. David Story's idea. There was a moment of stunned silence, and then the defense attorney sat down heavily and closed his eyes in pain. Mr. Taffero, Prince said, I am strongly advising. Shut up, Taffero barked. You little pissant, you're not the one facing the needle. He looked back at Winston. I'll take the deal, as long as I don't get charged with my brother. Winston nodded. Taffero turned to Short and pointed his finger and waited. She nodded. Deal, she said. One thing, Winston said quickly. We're not going into this with your word against his. What else have you got? Taffero looked at her, and a thin, dead smile cracked across his face. In the viewing room, Bosch stepped closer to the glass. McCaleb saw his reflection more clearly on the glass. His eyes stared unblinking. I've got pictures, Taffero said. Winston hooked her hair behind her ear and narrowed her eyes. She leaned across the table. Pictures? What do you mean? Photographs? Photographs of what? Taffero shook his head. No. Pictures. He drew pictures for me while we were in the attorney visiting room in jail, drawings of what he wanted the scene to look like, so it would look like the painting. McCaleb gripped his hands into fists at his sides. Where are the drawings? Winston said. Taffero smiled again. Safe deposit box, City National Bank, Sunset and Doheny. The keys on the ring that was in my pocket. Bosch brought his hands up and slapped them together. Bang! he exclaimed, loud enough that Taffero turned and looked toward the glass. Please, the videographer whispered, we're taping. Bosch went to the door of the little room and stepped out. McCaleb followed. Bosch turned and looked at him. He nodded. Story goes down, he said. The monster goes back into the darkness from which it came. They looked at each other silently for a moment, and then Bosch broke it away. I gotta go, he said. Where? Get ready for court. He turned and started walking through the deserted bullpen of the sheriff's department homicide squad. McCaleb saw him bang a fist on a desk and then punch it into the air above him. McCaleb went back into the viewing room and watched the interview continue. Taffero was telling the assemblage in the interview room that David Story had demanded that the killing of Edward Gunn take place on the first morning of the new year. McCaleb listened for a while and then thought of something. He stepped out of the observation room and into the bullpen. Detectives were now filtering in to start the day of work. He went to an empty desk and tore a page off of a notepad on top. He wrote, Ask about the Lincoln on it. He folded it and took it to the door to the interview room. He knocked, and after a moment, Alice Short opened the door. He handed her the folded note. Give this to Jay before the interview is over, he whispered. She nodded and closed the door. McCaleb went back into the observation room to watch. Chapter 45 Freshly showered and shaved, Bosch stepped off the elevator and headed toward the doors to the Division N courtroom. He walked with purpose. He felt like he was a true prince of the city. He'd taken only a few strides when he was accosted by McAvoy, who stepped out of an alcove like a coyote that had been waiting in a cave for his unsuspecting prey. But nothing could dent Bosch's demeanor. He smiled as the reporter fell into stride with him. Detective Bosch, have you thought any more about what we talked about? I've got to start writing my story today. Bosch didn't slow his pace. He knew that once he got into the courtroom, he wouldn't have a lot of time. Rudy Taffero, he said. Excuse me? He was your source. Rudy Taffero, I figured it out this morning. Detective, I told you that I can't reveal... Yeah, I know. But see, I'm the one who's revealing it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Why not? Bosch suddenly stopped. McAvoy walked a few steps past and then came back. 
Why not? He asked again. Today's your lucky day, Jack. I've got two good tips for you. Okay. What? McAvoy started pulling a notebook from his back pocket. Bosch put his hand on his arm to stop him. Don't take that out. The other reporters see that. They'll think I'm telling you something. He gestured up the hall to the open door of the media room, where a handful of reporters were loitering and waiting for the day's court session to begin. Then they'll come over, and I'll have to tell them. McAvoy left the notebook in place. Okay. What are the tips? First of all, you're full of shit in that story. In fact, your source was arrested this morning for the murder of Edward Gunn, as well as the attempted murder of Terry McCaleb. What? He got... Wait. Let me talk. I don't have a lot of time. He waited, and McAvoy nodded. Yeah, Rudy got popped. He killed Gunn. The plan was to put it on me and spring it on the world during the defense case. Are you saying that story was a part of... Exactly. Which brings me to tip number two. And that is, if I were you, I would be in that courtroom today long before the judge comes in and starts things. You see those guys standing down there? They're going to miss it, Jack. You don't want to be like them. Bosch left him there. He nodded to the deputy on the courtroom door and was allowed in. Two deputies were walking David Storey to his place at the defense table as Bosch came into the courtroom. Folks was already there, and Langweiser and Kretzler were seated at the prosecution table. Bosch looked at his watch as he came through the gate. He had about fifteen minutes before the judge would take the bench and call for the jury. He went to the prosecution table but remained standing. He leaned down and put both palms on the table and looked at the two prosecutors. Harry, you ready? Langweiser began. Today's the day. Today's the day. But not because of what you think. You too would take a plea on this, wouldn't you? If he copped to Jody Kremen's and Alicia Lopez. You wouldn't go for the needle, right? They both looked at him with blank stares of confusion. Come on, we don't have a lot of time before the judge comes out. What if I could go over there and in five minutes get you two murder ones? Alicia Lopez's family would love you for it. You told them you didn't have a case. Harry, what are you talking about? Langweiser said. We floated a plea. Twice. Folks shot it down both times. And we don't have the evidence on Lopez, Kretzler added. You know that. The grand jury passed. Nobody. No, listen. You want the plea or not? I think I can go over there and get it. I arrested Rudy Teferro for murder this morning. It was a setup orchestrated by Story to get to me. It backfired, and Teferro's taking a deal. He's talking. Jesus Christ, Kretzler said. He said it too loud. Bosch turned and looked over at the defense table. Both folks and Story were looking at them. Just past the defense table, he saw McAvoy take a seat in the media gallery that was closest to the defense table. No other reporters had come in and sat down yet. Harry, what are you talking about? Langweiser said. What murder? Bosch ignored the questions. Let me go over there. Bosch said. I want to look in Story's eyes when I tell him. Kretzler and Langweiser looked at each other. Langweiser shook her shoulders and waved her hands in exasperation. Worth a try. We were only holding death as an ace in the hole. Okay, then. Bosch said. See if you can get the clerk to buy me some time with the judge. Bosch stepped around the defense table and stood in front of it, so he could look equally at Folks and Story. Folks was writing something on a legal pad. Bosch cleared his throat, and after a few moments, the defense attorney slowly looked up. Yes, detective? Shouldn't you be at your table preparing for... Where's Rudy Teferro? Bosch looked at Story as he asked it. Folks looked behind him to the seat against the rail where Teferro normally sat during court sessions. 
I'm sure he's on his way, he said. We have a few minutes. Bosch smiled. On his way? Yeah, he's on his way. Up to Supermax at Corcoran. Maybe Pelican Cove, if he's lucky. I really wouldn't want to be a former cop doing my time in Corcoran. Folks seemed unimpressed. Detective, I don't know what you're talking about. I am trying to prepare a, a defense strategy here because I think the prosecution is going to fold its tent today, so if you don't mind. Bosch looked at Story when he responded. There is no strategy. There is no defense. Rudy Teferro was arrested this morning. He's been charged with murder and attempted murder. I'm sure your client can tell you all about it, Counselor. That is, if you didn't know already. Folks stood up abruptly, as though he were making an objection. Sir, it is highly irregular for you to come to the defense table and— He cut a deal about two hours ago. He's laying it all out. Again, Bosch ignored folks and looked at Story. So here's the deal. You've got about five minutes to go over there to Langweiser and Kretzler and agree to plead to murder one on Kremens and Lopez. This is preposterous. I'm going to complain to the judge about this. Bosch now looked at folks. You do that, but it doesn't change things. Five minutes. Bosch stepped away but went to the clerk's desk in front of the judge's bench. The exhibits were lying stacked on a side table. Bosch looked through them until he found the poster he wanted. He slid it out and carried it with him back to the defense table. Folks were still standing, but bending down so Story could whisper in his ear. Bosch dropped the poster, containing the blow-up photo of the bookcase in Story's house on the table. He tapped his finger on two of the books on an upper shelf. The titles on the spines were clearly readable. One title was The Art of Darkness, and the other book was merely titled Bosch. There's your prior knowledge right there. He left the exhibit on the defense table and started to walk back to the prosecution table. But after two steps, he came back and put his palms down flat on the defense table. He looked directly at Story. He spoke in a voice that he knew would be loud enough for McAvoy to hear in the media gallery. You know what your big mistake was, David? No, Story said, a sneer in his voice. Why don't you tell me? Folks immediately grabbed his client's arm in a silencing gesture. Drawing out the scene for Teferro, Bosch said. What he did was he went and put those pretty pictures you made right into his safe deposit box at City National. He knew they might come in handy, and they sure did. He used them this morning to buy his way out of a death sentence. What are you going to use? Bosch saw the falter in Story's eyes, the tell. For just a moment, his eyes blinked without really blinking. But in that moment, Bosch knew it was over, because Story knew it was over. Bosch straightened up and casually looked at his watch, then at Folks. About three minutes now, Mr. Folks. Your client's life is on the line. He returned to the defense table and sat down. Kretzler and Langweiser leaned toward him and urgently whispered questions, but Bosch ignored them. Let's just see what happens. Over the next five minutes, he never once looked over at the defense table. He could hear muffled words and whispers, but couldn't make out any of it. The courtroom filled with spectators and members of the media. Nothing came from the defense table. At precisely 9 a.m., the door behind the bench opened and Judge Houghton bounded up the steps to his spot. He took his seat and glanced at both the prosecution and defense tables. Ladies and gentlemen, are we ready for the jury? Yes, Your Honor, Kretzler said. Nothing came from the defense table. Houghton looked over, a curious smile on his face. Mr. Folks, can I bring in our jury? Now Bosch leaned back so he could look past Langweiser and Kretzler at the defense table. Folks sat slouched in his chair, a posture he'd never exhibited in the courtroom before. He had an elbow on the arm of the chair and his hand up. He was wagging a pen in his fingers and seemed to be lost in a deep, depressing thought. 
His client sat rigid next to him, face forward. Mr. Folks, I'm waiting for an answer. Folks finally looked up at the judge. Very slowly, he rose from the seat and went to the lectern. Your Honor, may we approach at sidebar for a moment? The judge looked both curious and annoyed. It had been the routine of the trial to submit all non-public conference requests by 8.30 a.m. so that they could be considered and argued in chambers without cutting into court time. This can't be handled in open court, Mr. Folks. No, Your Honor, not at this time. Very well, come on up. Houghton signaled the lawyers forward with both hands as though he was giving signals to a truck backing up. The attorneys approached the side of the bench and huddled with the judge. From his angle, Bosch could see all of their faces, and he didn't need to hear what was being whispered. Folks looked ashen, and after a few words, Kretzler and Langweiser seemed to grow in stature. Langweiser even glanced over at Bosch, and he could read the victory message in her eyes. He turned and looked over at the defendant. He waited, and David's story slowly turned, and their eyes locked one final time. Bosch didn't smile. He didn't blink. He didn't do anything but hold the stare. Eventually it was Story who looked away and down at his hands lying in his lap. Bosch felt a trilling sensation move over his scalp. He'd felt it before, times when he had glimpsed the normally hidden face of the monster. The sidebar conference broke up, and the two prosecutors came back quickly to the table, excitement clearly showing in their strides and on their faces. By contrast, Jay Reason folks moved slowly to the defense table. That's all, folks, Bosch said under his breath. Langweiser grabbed Bosch by the shoulder as she sat down. He's going to plead, she whispered excitedly. Cremens and Lopez, when you went over there, did you say consecutive or concurrent sentencing? I didn't say either. Okay. We just agreed on concurrent, but we're going into chambers to work it out. We need to formally charge Story with Lopez first. You want to come in and make the arrest? Whatever, if you want me to. Bosch knew it was just a legal formality. Story was already in custody. You deserve it, Harry. We want you to be there. Fine. The judge tapped his gavel once and drew the courtroom's attention. The reporters in the media gallery were all leaning forward in their seats. They knew something big was going on. We'll stand in recess until ten o'clock, the judge announced. I'll see all parties in chambers now. He stood up and quickly went down the three stairs to the rear door before the deputy had time to call, All rise! Chapter 46 McCaleb stayed away from the following sea, even after the last detective and forensic technician had finished with it. From early afternoon until dark, the boat was staked out by reporters and television news crews. The coupling of the shooting aboard the boat, plus the arrest of Teferro and abrupt guilty pleas from David's story, had turned the boat into the central image of a story that had developed quickly through the day. Every local channel, plus the networks, shot their stand-up reports from the marina the following sea serving as a backdrop with its yellow police tape strung across the salon door. McCaleb hid out for most of the afternoon in Buddy Lockridge's boat, staying below decks and donning one of Buddy's floppy fishing hats if he poked his head up through the hatch to see what was going on outside. The two were talking again. Soon after leaving the sheriff's department and getting to the marina ahead of the media, McCaleb had sought out Buddy and apologized for assuming that his charter partner had leaked the story. Buddy, in turn, apologized for using the following C and McCaleb's cabin as a rendezvous point for encounters with erotic masseuses. McCaleb agreed to tell Graciella he'd been wrong about Buddy being the leak. He also agreed not to tell her about the masseuses. Buddy had explained that he didn't want Graciella thinking less of him than she probably already did. While they hid out in the boat, they watched Buddy's little 12-inch TV and remained up to the minute with the day's developments. Channel 9, which had been carrying the story trial live, remained most current, 
staying on live and continuously reporting from the Van Nuys Courthouse and the Sheriff's Star Center. McCaleb was left stunned and in awe by the day's events. David Story abruptly filed guilty pleas in Van Nuys to two murders, as he was simultaneously charged in the downtown Los Angeles courthouse as a conspirator in the gun case. The movie director had avoided the death penalty in the first cases, but still would face it in the gun case if he didn't make another plea arrangement with prosecutors. A televised news conference at the Star Center had featured Jay Winston prominently. She answered questions from reporters after the sheriff, flanked by LAPD and FBI brass, read a statement announcing the day's events from an investigative standpoint. McCaleb's name was mentioned numerous times in the discussion of the investigation and subsequent shooting aboard the following sea. Winston also mentioned it at the end of the news conference when she expressed her thanks to him, saying it was his volunteer work on the case that broke it open. Bosch was also prominently mentioned, but took no part in any press conferences. After Story's guilty verdicts were entered in Van Nuys Court, Bosch and the lawyers involved in the case were mobbed outside the doors to the courtroom. But McCaleb had seen video on one channel of Bosch pushing his way through the reporters and cameras and refusing to comment as he moved to a fire escape and disappeared down the stairs. The only reporter who got to McCaleb was Jack McAvoy, who still had his cell phone number. McCaleb talked to him briefly, but declined to comment on what had happened in the master cabin of the following sea and how close he'd come to death. His thoughts about that were too personal, and he would never share them with any reporter. McCaleb also talked to Graciela, calling her and filling her in on the events before she saw them on the news. He told her he probably wouldn't get home until the next day, because he was sure the media pack would be watching the boat until well after dark. She said she was glad it was over, and that he'd be coming home. He sensed there was still a high level of stress in her voice, and knew it was something he would have to address when he got back to the island. Late in the day, McCaleb was able to slip out of Buddy's boat unnoticed, when the media pack was distracted by activity in the marina parking lot. The LAPD was towing off the old Lincoln Continental that the Teferro brothers had been using the night before when they had come to the marina to kill McCaleb. While the news crews filmed and watched the mundane task of a car being hooked up and towed away, McCaleb was able to get to his Cherokee without being spotted. He started the car and drove out of the lot ahead of the tow truck. Not a single reporter followed. It was fully dark by the time he got to Bosch's house. The front door was open, as it had been the time before, the screen door in place. McCaleb rapped on the wooden frame and peered through the mesh into the darkness of the house. There was a single light, a reading light, on in the living room. He could hear music and thought it was the same Art Pepper CD that had been playing during his last visit. But he didn't see Bosch. McCaleb looked away from the door to check the street, and when he looked back, Bosch was standing at the screen, and it startled him. Bosch unhooked a latch and opened the screen. He was wearing the same suit McCaleb had seen him in on the news. He was holding a bottle of anchor steam down at his side. Terry, come on in. I thought maybe you were a reporter. Bugs the hell out of me when they come to your house. Seems like... There should be one place they can't go. Yeah, I know what you mean. They're all over the boat. I had to get away. McCaleb passed by him in the entrance hallway and stepped into the living room. So, reporters aside, how's it going, Harry? Never better. A good day for our side. How's your neck doing? Sore as hell, but I'm alive. Yeah, that's what's important. Want a beer? Ah, uh, that would be good. While Bosch got the beer, McCaleb went out to the rear deck. Bosch had the deck lights off, making the lights of the city more brilliant in the distance. McCaleb could hear the ever-present sound of the freeway at the bottom of the pass. Searchlights cut across the sky from three different locations on the valley floor. Bosch came out and handed him a beer. No glass, right? No glass. 
They looked out into the night and drank their beers silently for a little while. McCaleb thought about how he should say what he wanted to say. He was still working on it. The last thing they were doing before I left was hooking up to Pharaoh's car, he said after some time. Bosch nodded. What about the boat? They finished with it? Yeah, they're done. Is it a mess? They always leave things a mess. Probably. I haven't been inside. I'll worry about it tomorrow. Bosch nodded. McCaleb took a long draw in his beer and put the bottle down on the railing. He had taken too much. It backed up in his throat and burned his sinuses. Okay? Bosch asked. Yeah, fine. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Harry? I came up to tell you I'm not going to be your friend anymore. Bosch started to laugh, but then stopped. What? McCaleb looked at him. Bosch's eyes were still piercing in the darkness. They'd caught a speck of reflected light from somewhere, and McCaleb could see the two pinpoints holding on him. You should have hung around a little longer this morning while Jay interviewed Teferro. I didn't have the time. She asked him about the Lincoln, and he said it was his undercover car. He said he used it on jobs when he didn't want there to be any chance of a trace. It has stolen plates on it, and the registration's phony. Makes sense, a guy like that having a car for the wet work. You don't get it, do you? Bosch had finished his beer. He was leaning with his elbows on the railing. He was peeling the label off the bottle and dropping the little pieces into the darkness below. No, I don't get it, Terry. Why don't you tell me what you're talking about? Michaela picked up his beer, but then put it back down without drinking any more. His real car, the one he used every day, is a Mercedes 430 CLK. That was the one he caught the ticket with, for parking at the post office when he sent the money order. Okay, the guy had two cars, his secret car and his show car. What does it mean? It means you knew something you shouldn't have known. What are you talking about? Knew what? Last night I asked you why you came onto my boat. You said you saw Teferro's Lincoln and knew there was something wrong. How did you know that Lincoln was his? Bosch was silent for a long moment. He looked out into the night and nodded. I saved your life, he said. I saved yours. I said we were even. Leave it at that, Terry. McCaleb shook his head. It felt like there was a fist in his stomach pushing up into his chest, trying to get to his new heart. I think you knew that, Lincoln, and knew it meant trouble for me because you had watched to Pharaoh before. Maybe on a night he was using the Lincoln. Maybe on a night he was watching Gun and setting up the hit. Maybe on the night he made the hit. You saved my life because you knew something, Harry. McCaleb was quiet for a moment giving Bosch an opportunity to say something in his defense. That's a lot of maybes, Terry. Yeah, a lot of maybes and one guess. My guess is that somehow you knew, or you figured out back when Teferro hooked up with Story, that they would have to come after you in court. So you watched Teferro, and you saw him draw the bead on gun. You knew what was going to happen, and you let it happen. McCaleb took another long drink of beer and put the bottle back down on the railing. A dangerous game, Harry. They almost pulled it off. But I guess if I hadn't come along, you would have figured out some way of pointing it back at them. Bosch continued to stare out into the darkness and say nothing. The one thing I hope is that you weren't the one who tipped to Pharaoh that gun was in the tank that night. Tell me you didn't make that call, Harry. Tell me you didn't help get him out so they could kill him like that. Again, Bosch said nothing. McCaleb nodded. You want to shake somebody's hand, Harry? Shake your own. Bosch dropped his gaze and looked down into the darkness below the deck. McCaleb watched him closely and saw him slowly shake his head. 
We do what we have to do. Bosch said quietly, Sometimes you have choices. Sometimes there's no choice, only necessity. You see things happening, and you know they're wrong, but somehow they're also right. He was silent for a long moment, and McCaleb waited. I didn't make that call, Bosch said. He turned and looked at McCaleb. Again, McCaleb could see the shining points of light in the blackness of his eyes. Three people, three monsters, are gone. But not that way. We don't do it that way. Bosch nodded. What about your play, Terry? Pushing past the little brother into the office? Like you didn't think that would start some shit? You push the action with that little move and you know it. McCaleb felt his face growing hot under Bosch's stare. He didn't answer. He didn't know what to say. You had your own plan, Terry. So what's the difference? The difference? If you don't see it, then you've completely fallen. You are lost. Yeah, well, maybe I'm lost. And maybe I've been found. I'll have to think about it. Meantime, why don't you just go home now? Go back to your little island and your little girl. Hide behind what you think you see in her eyes. Pretend the world is not what you know it to be. McCaleb nodded. He'd said what he wanted to say. He stepped away from the railing, leaving his beer, and walked toward the door to the house. But Bosch hit him with more words as he entered the house. You think naming her after a girl nobody cared about or loved can make up for that lost girl? Well, you're wrong, man. Just go home and keep dreaming. McCaleb hesitated in the doorway and looked back. Goodbye, Harry. Yeah. Goodbye. McCaleb walked through the house. When he passed the reading chair where the light was on, he saw the printout of his profile of Bosch sitting on the arm of the chair. He kept going. When he got to the front door, he pulled it closed behind him. Chapter 47 Bosch stood with his arms folded on the deck railing and his head down. He thought about McCaleb's words, both spoken and printed. They were pieces of hot shrapnel ripping through him. He felt a deep tearing of his interior lining. It felt as though something within had seized him and was pulling him into a black hole, that he was imploding into nothingness. What did I do? He whispered. What did I do? He straightened up and saw the bottle on the railing, its label gone. He grabbed it and threw it as far as he could out into the darkness. He watched its trajectory. He could follow its flight because of moonlight reflecting on the brown glass. He heard the glass explode when the bottle impacted in the brush on the rocky hillside below. He saw McCaleb's half-finished beer and grabbed it. He pulled his arm back, wanting to throw this one all the way to the freeway. Then he stopped. He put the bottle back on the railing and went inside. He grabbed the printed profile off the arm of the chair and started ripping the two pages apart. He went to the kitchen, turned the water on, and put the pieces into the sink. He flicked on the garbage disposal and pushed the pieces of paper into the drain. He waited until he could tell by the sound that the paper had been chewed into nothing and was gone. He turned off the disposal and just watched the water running into the drain. Slowly, his eyes came up, and he looked through the kitchen window and out through the Cahuenga Pass. The lights of Hollywood glimmered in the cut a mirror reflection of the stars of all galaxies everywhere. He thought about all that was bad out there, a city with more things wrong than right, a place where the earth could open up beneath you and suck you into the blackness, a city of lost light, his city. It was all of that, and still, always still, a place to begin again, his city, the city of the second chance. Bosch nodded and bent down. He closed his eyes, put his hands under the water and brought them up to his face. 
The water was cold and bracing, as he thought any baptism, the start of any second chance, should be. Chapter 48 He could still smell burned gunpowder. McCaleb stood in the master cabin and looked around. There were rubber gloves and other debris scattered on the floor. Black fingerprint dust was everywhere, on everything. The door to the room was gone, and so was the door jamb, cut right out of the wall. In the hallway, an entire panel of walling had been removed as well. McCaleb walked over and looked down at the floor, where the little brother had died from the bullets he had fired. The blood had dried brown, and would permanently stain the alternating light and dark wood stripping in the floor. It would always be there to remind him. Staring at the blood, he replayed the shots he had fired at the man, the images in his mind moving much slower than real time. He thought about what Bosch had said to him out on the deck, about letting the little brother follow him. He considered his own culpability. Could his guilt be any less than Bosch's? They had both set things in motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. You don't go into the darkness without the darkness going into you. We do what we have to do, he said out loud. He went up into the salon and looked out the door at the parking lot. The reporters were still up there with their vans. He had snuck in, parked at the far end of the marina, and then borrowed a skiff off of somebody's boat to get to the following sea. He then climbed aboard and slipped in without anyone seeing him. He noticed that the vans had their microwave towers cranked up, and each crew was getting ready for the eleven o'clock report, the camera angle set so that the following sea would once more be in all the shots. McCaleb smiled and opened his phone. He hit a number on speed dial, and Buddy Lockridge answered. Buddy, it's me. Listen, I'm on the boat, and I gotta go home. I want you to do me a favor. You gotta go tonight? Are you sure? Yeah. This is what I want you to do. When you hear me turn the pentas over, you come over and untie me. Do it fast. I'll do the rest. You want me to go with you? No, I'll be fine. Catch an express over on Friday. We've got the charter on Saturday morning. All right, Terra. I heard on the radio it's pretty flat out there tonight and no fog, but be careful. McCaleb closed the phone and went to the salon door. Most of the reporters and their crews were preoccupied and not looking at the boat, because they'd already assured themselves it was empty. He slid open the door and stepped out. He shut the door and then quickly climbed the ladder to the bridge. He unzipped the plastic curtain that enclosed the bridge and slipped in, quickly made sure both throttles were in neutral, engaged the choke, and slid his key into the ignition. He turned the key, and the starters began to whine loudly. He looked back through the plastic curtain and saw the reporters had all turned to the boat. The engines finally turned over, and he worked the throttles, revving the engines into a quick start warm-up. He glanced back again and saw Buddy coming down the dock to the boat's stern. A couple of the reporters were hurrying down the gangway to the dock behind him. Buddy quickly uncleated the two stern lines and threw them into the cockpit. He then moved down the side pier to get the bow line. McCaleb lost sight of him, but then heard his call. Clear! McCaleb took the throttles out of neutral and moved the boat out of the slip. As he made the turn into the fairway, he looked back and saw Buddy standing on the side pier and the reporters behind him on the dock. Once he was away from the cameras, he unzipped the curtains and took them down. The cool air swept into the bridge and braced him. He sighted the flashing red lights of the channel markers and put the boat on course. He looked ahead, past the markers, into the darkness, but saw nothing. He turned on the Loren and saw that which he could not see ahead. The island was there on the radar screen. Ten minutes later, after he'd cleared the harbor brake line, McCaleb pulled the phone out of his jacket and speed-dialed home. He knew it was too late to call and that he was risking waking the children. Graciela answered in a whispered urgency. Sorry, it's just me. Terry, are you all right? I am now. I'm coming home. You're crossing in the dark? 
Caleb thought a moment about the question. I'll be all right. I can see in the dark. Graciela didn't say anything. She had an ability to know when he was saying one thing and talking about something else. Put the porch light on, he said. I'll look for it when I get close. He closed the phone and pushed the throttles up. The bow started to rise and then leveled off. He passed the last channel marker twenty yards to his left. He was right on course. A three-quarter moon was high in the sky ahead and laying down a shimmering path of liquid silver for him to follow home. He held on tightly to the wheel and thought about the moment when he had truly thought he was going to die. He remembered the image of his daughter that had come to him and had comforted him. Tears started to roll down his cheeks. Soon the wind off the water dried them on his face. This has been a Time Warner Audiobooks production of A Darkness More Than Night, written by Michael Connolly and read by Richard M. Davidson. A Darkness More Than Night is also available in hardcover from Little Brown and Company. This book is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, events or locales is entirely coincidental. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Time Warner Audiobooks presents A Darkness More Than Night by Michael Connolly. Narrated by Richard M. Davidson.